The guys I film with. <laughs> Should I wear my glasses so we match? Uh, only if you can't see. I can see without them. Let's see what they happens look more here. Let's see if anyone even notices smarter. we're doing this. <laughs> Matter of fact, I should just start it with just it being you. <laughs> yeah. You're like, am I on the wrong channel? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, they've changed my comments thing now. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Now you got all comments and favorite comments. I've never seen that before. Ooh, interesting. We'll have to see yeah, if I can... this even worked. Oh, there's a thumbs up. Someone's here. Hi, Lynn. All oh, right. Hello, hello. And there's Andrea. See? see, we have two people. We can do a live stream now. Perfect. Hey, Tom, we're going to wait until we said hello to every single person. <laughs> <laughs> we got them all. Don't worry, we got this. Martin, what's going on? Big buff bubbles. Excellent. There's a Donald Duck. I like that. Hmm. Even said quack. <laughs> Can you do a Donald Duck impression? No, I cannot. Can no? you? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I got to hear him for a sec. Yeah, let me see. It's something like. <laughs> I'm just pulling out a quick YouTube clip so I can hear it. Okay, great. Hey guys, uh, we are here doing a live stream. It's been 12 weeks to the day since the last one I did with my co host. And Devin said he would help ease my pain by coming on the show with me today. So that is exactly gotcha. why you see a second person. Devin runs Reef Dudes, and Reef Dudes is a great channel, and I go to it often when I need to learn how to install something <laughs> because <laughs> he you. does such amazing detail, and he puts the screenshot of the phone so you can see how he did the app, and he shows the code, and he shows the wires, and how he splits. The oh, my God. I love the way he does his videos, and uh, I mean, I'm, it's not me just blowing smoke. <laughs> I literally go watch his, and I, okay, now I can work on my Versa pump, or you know, whatever it is. He, he does such a nice job. I wish I could do videos that well. My Thank stuff you. is more about just filming it and narrating, and you know, moving on with my life. But Devin can tell you which screws they used. It's amazing. It's hey, not someone quite gave that us hardcore, a thumbs down. You. Devin, you should not get a thumbs down. What'd you do wrong? Rough, rough. I don't know. I, I get you two. You didn't do the Donald like, two Duck or three. sound. You need zero. <laughs> I can't do it right now. I got to hear it first. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got um, a lot of stuff going on today. Uh, we've had a lot of stuff going on for the last 12 weeks. Um, and so today's topic specifically is about work, keeping your reef tank alive during construction. And while I shared quite a bit what was going on in my life here for the last couple of months on, YouTube, on Facebook, I didn't share it to YouTube because it was things that the channel isn't about. You know, it was things with the house. So, I mean, <laughs> there has been things done from the top to the bottom of the house, literally. The roof has been replaced. The foundation has been jacked up. The trees have been cut. The house now, is, is this all painted. because you have a reef tank? <laughs> yes. It, it, all these things had to happen. Is your too big? <laughs> Actually, okay. uh, the credit goes to a lot of this is to Caitlin. And so what she had done was, when she moved in, our goal together was to make this house a home. And I mean, it was crazy, but 100% true. I always thought of this place as a house. Even though I've lived here so long, it just never felt like home to me. It just was like the place I live. And I own it, I'm paying for it, right? I mean, it, you'd think I'd care, like I, my truck, but it's just sort of like it was a house. And when she moved in and started doing her thing, which I told her to do, I said, whatever you want, we'll do it. I wanted her to feel welcome and everything. And she, um, would make me buy things that I would never buy. And uh, I would put those in the house and the house felt like home. It just, it felt more and more love and warmth and, and it just was amazing. And now that, um, well, since her passing, I am continuing to do those things we discussed. <sighs> Basically in her honor, I guess you could say, I don't know, it's kind of a weird thing with grief. You just kind of go through this really strange. Jack continues to, uh, put up with everything going on with the house. When they were jackhammering the living room <laughs> to break through the slab concrete to lift the house up, I had to protect the tank behind me. And that is, so that's what I'm talking about, the construction, you know, doing, keeping a reef tank alive during construction, it's a big deal. When they're up on the roof, mm -hmm. it doesn't really affect anything as long as you continue to power. You know, if they came crashing through the ceiling, that's a whole other battle. But yep. fortunately, I, I, that didn't happen. They did a great job. But, but, uh, but still, jacking up the floor of your Yeah, house. a real physical jackhammer. <laughs> jackhammer yeah. is bust, 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 and they do it a lot. 
And when they're yeah. hitting a spot, like in the bathroom, you can feel it in front of the aquarium vibrating. It's just, it's insane mm -hmm. how the vibration comes through the concrete. So they had to do all their damage. They did it over here. Matter of fact, they wanted to do it. The engineer that came in wanted me to put a pier under the corner of the aquarium. Let me switch this camera here for one second. So right here, in this spot there, they wanted a pier. And I told them, you want to break out concrete and dirt under 5,500 pounds of weight? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, that's insane. That's a corner of my tank. I, I just can't do it. So I, um, let me put you back there, Devin. I was very nervous about that. I just thought that was a terrible decision. You know, the house has, you know, this much concrete underneath the entire property but to remove all the soil so you could put a jack down there and then they take these concrete cylinders that are 12 inches tall and six inches round and they set it on the clay and they use a machine that pushes that piston that that uh concrete cylinder into the mud yeah. and then they put another one and they do that and as they're doing it they're using huh. the foundation as leverage so the piston's yeah. pushing up, shoving the clay down. That's lifting the corner of the tank if they did this one exact spot. And I was not, <laughs> I was very nervous about that whole concept. I thought they were crazy. I don't care what they're mm -hmm. doing outside the house. I don't care what they're doing around the perimeter or by the cake? doors, but not the aquarium. And the aquarium, interestingly enough, I mean, it is kind of the center of the house, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That was actually considered ground zero. That was the zero yeah. point. And then they went and measured every other direction away from the tank for what was up and what was lower. And mm -hmm. the other end of the house is up almost two inches. No, inch yeah. and a, I think it was an inch and a quarter up at that end of the house, which was the other end. And then the area behind me, all the way through the end of the kitchen, the utility room, was like down two, two and a quarter. So there's like a difference of three inches in my house. And then we can say, well, what happened? Did your tank do it? I'm like, no, this house has been shifting for a long, long time. And I was tolerating it. Mm -hmm. So when the guy said, well, we're going to have a lot of dust. I said, what do you mean dust? And he says, well, we got to break through the concrete. concrete dust and we're going to do it nasty. there. And we're going to do it there. We're going to do it there. We're going to do it there. We're going to do it in the hallway. We want to do it in the kitchen. I was like, nope, you're not touching the kitchen. I said, I'm letting you destroy everything. You're not going to destroy my kitchen floor too. And they're like, well, we could tunnel. And I said, tunneling sounds great. And he said it costs more. And I said, tunneling sounds great. So they had a couple of guys crawling under my house and scooping out uh, the, the clay and the rock and the dirt so they could put two piers under the kitchen wall that basically is the difference between the kitchen and the garage and lift those mm -hmm. two parts of the kitchen up. And That's when crazy. they would lift, and like I was talking about, these, these cylinders they, of concrete they shove into the ground, mm -hmm. they would, the house would be lifted up as they're pushing, right? Because it, you know, it just pushes and pushes and then it starts to get resistance. Yeah. It lifts the mm -hmm. house and when they let off, the house goes wham. So my whole tank <laughs> is like, okay, what was that? So it's very <laughs> nerve wracking. And the other thing no I kidding. did is I went to Home Depot and I bought tarps, lots of mm -hmm. tarps um, and a staple gun because I couldn't find my old one. I do that all the time. I buy a staple gun and those staples and then when I need to do a job, I can't find it. I go buy a new staple gun and staples. And, uh, so you have to whatever. what, six, seven now? <laughs> I think I've got three actually. So I stapled up plastic all around the tanks and put a tarp up between the living space and the kitchen, hoping to not have the kitchen covered in silt, uh, hoping yeah. there would be no silt in the sump or anything. And uh, I mean, this whole thing went to, to the, the doorway that goes into the fish room. That was also tarped off. And then they would tape what they could, but you could mm -hmm. see while they're working all the, the nice thing is the weather was perfect. The weather was in the mm -hmm. 60s, it was a light breeze. They had the front and back doors wide open and the, uh, the air would move through the house so it didn't have to have air conditioning or heating or anything that was great. You could yep. see the tarps were like moving toward the tank or toward the kitchen, which meant that some of the air was blowing into those areas somehow, which means some mm -hmm. dust did get over in there. Yep. But I kept the skimmer running the whole time the reef itself mm -hmm. did not have any effect. Oh, I left the lights off. I didn't want to run the metal mm -hmm. halides and, and warm up the tank oh, with, with all that overrated. plastic. Yeah, it just seemed like that was a bad yeah. idea. I let the, I think I even, I may have turned off the radion on the anemone cube as well and just let the XHOs run, just a little bit of light. 
but uh, they were here for days and they did yeah. a lot of work outside they did work inside for a couple of days and then as soon as they were done um they left they came on a monday and they left on a thursday and when they left as soon as they were gone i was immediately putting down the padding because i had carpet guys coming in to re-put the carpet back down in the living room because the living room's where i do my work and I yeah. couldn't have another day. I mean, I needed, and so they came in. And then that night I cleaned and cleaned and cleaned and <laughs> took shower after shower because I felt dirty. And uh, you know, the tank itself actually didn't have any negative effect. And the best part is the, how, the tank is not a level at all. With all the changes, the tank is still dead straight. And if you, it's kind of hard to, let me show my video again one more time. If you look at the water line behind me, I know it's blurry. But there's like a black line right there. And that mm -hmm. black line is consistent all the way across. That is actually how I can tell if the tank is level by how much of the black shows on either side. And uh, right well, now, okay. that's a seven foot run. And it's almost exactly right. It's a little bit thicker on this side than it is on this one. But we're talking about like a quarter of an inch difference over a seven feet span. So what was it before though? Like what was it pre-leveling your house? <clears throat> um, like I said, the tank was kind of the center point, so it didn't really have anything mm -hmm. to do. But I was worried that with the changes they made, it would affect things. Just um, any tweaking. I, I feel like... I think this end over here lifts up during part mm -hmm. of the year and then comes back down. So in it's theory, seasonal. that should not happen anymore. <laughs> oh, and by the way, the guy that did the actual work completely agreed with me and said, we are not doing it under the corner of the tank. And I was so Bless. happy to hear that. So he said we're doing it under the corner of the the doorway I walk into to go into the fish room. We chose mm -hmm. that spot. I'll show you guys. Yeah. So yeah, right there, you can see my tiles. See how there's so there's no tile there. Um, they broke through there, and then they put a jack and they lifted up that wall. Yeah. So huh. the nice thing is they actually um, closed a lot of gaps in the ceilings. That was a big concern of mine. That was probably mm -hmm. my biggest complaint. There was a couple of doors in the house that if I did not remember to leave them slightly open and the house shifted, I could not open them ever again. It's like like when I was traveling, really? I couldn't get to my suitcase yeah. because I couldn't get the closet door open. <laughs> and, you know, the ceiling was doing this thing and it was a real yeah. thing. And they resolved all of that, which makes me very, very happy because mm -hmm. um, there was areas where the ceiling touches the wall and it had lifted and the, the sheetrock tape had bent. It was like curled. Oh. And that's back together at a 90. So oh, that's nice. Yeah, I mean, almost everything is perfect except for the fish room. Because of all the changes, the fish mm -hmm. room and the slab that the fish room is on, or basically because I built the fish room in a crooked house, now that the house yeah. is straight, my walls are like slightly off and down. And <laughs> I'm looking at it, I said, well, you need, you need to go in the garage and into the workshop and you need to put a pier down there too and lift that corner up so they did that as well which made it mm -hmm. a little bit better but there's an actual section yeah. that's messed up and mm -hmm. uh it's they couldn't change it anymore they couldn't do any more lifting there was a lot of lifting done um i think they told me i think they told me the house is now sitting at i know this sounds weird but i think they said the pressure on the piers that they installed and they put 25 piers under the house was 60 p 60,000 psi so it would take more than 60,000 to actually make something Move happen it. i guess i don't know so do they they put in big concrete posts randomly under your house is, it, is that what they did to like it's not random <laughs> well <laughs> it's very systematic I, I, engineered and calculated but <laughs> yeah no it actually was engineered and you had to have it every six mm -hmm. feet or whatever and once they drove down all those into the into the clay then mm -hmm. they had this block that looks like a v that they sit on mm -hmm. top of the one that's right at the dirt surface. And then they put two more cylinders and then there's a gap like this high, or maybe less between the cylinder and the slab. And they beat mm -hmm. these metal plates in there to be metal shims, steel shims. Yeah. And then they fill in all the mud and all the clay and they don't put any of the rock back in, which I thought was weird. Huh. I mean, you took rocks out, wouldn't you want to use those? And they said, we don't put those in for two reasons. Number one, it doesn't do anything. And number yeah. two, if we ever have to go in there again, we don't want those rocks in our way again. I was like, oh, Fair that point. makes sense. Yeah. I kind of thought they would jack it up and just like pump in some concrete to fill the big void then. Yeah, just load it up and just forever. Yeah. One block of concrete. I know, I kind of thought the same thing, but no. And they said, what do you want us to do with all the extra dirt? And I said, what extra dirt? 
and they said, you know, when we take it out, it never goes back in the way it came out, huh. which sounds like aquascaping, right? You take a rock yeah, out, you can never put it back the way it was. So I, uh, I said, I don't know, dig a bigger hole and put it in there. <laughs> 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 so they spread out quite a bit of the clay dirt out in my yard in different areas. And mm -hmm. we had a lot of rain around that time too. And so every time Jack went out, she'd come back with these paws covered in clay, like thing. <laughs> Like she wanted to fight and i'm like oh my god so i had to i tried a couple times in the shower cleaning her paws and she didn't really enjoy that so i ended up mm -hmm. grabbing one of my buckets put some water in the bucket this deep and i put each one of her legs in the bucket of water and shook it off and wiped it up so that way she wouldn't track up the house with clay and she <laughs> nice. i mean she's not fighting me she actually waits when she comes in the door she it's like she's waiting for an inspection like how do my paws look am i okay can i go in and then you yeah. know i was like yeah you're here, fine. please yeah <laughs> It's trained well it's now. Really That's good. No, okay, it's been, so um, I, I've done concrete dust before, like doing flooring or mm -hmm. like changing a window, and that stuff is nasty and it yeah. gets everywhere. Yeah. So, how much did you actually protect your tank with tarp and plastic? And did you drape it over? You stapled to the roof? Like, what did you do to keep that pounds of ultra fine <laughs> dust out? I stapled it all along the walls. I just went right into the sheetrock and just every few, you know, I don't know. Every foot, I put a staple mm -hmm. and had all this plastic mm -hmm. hanging that went straight down to the floor, and it just curtained everything off. I do have a picture somewhere. Oh, I wonder if I can pull that up now. That would be nice. You should do something entertaining while I'm searching. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. No problem. Yeah. Well, yeah, what do you got? I might yeah, have shared it I, on I just, Instagram. Okay. Oh, here's okay. Just, here we go. This will go. Uh, let's see how I can switch this. You yeah. are late, Battle of Sierra. Better late than ever, though. What's going on? So that was yeah, my that's living a lot room. of chaos. <laughs> and you can see the three areas. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but you can see the three areas where the concrete was patched in the living room floor. You can see the yeah. ancient tile. This house is 50 years old. And you can see my plastic hanging up everywhere. I covered so your the television. Was hmm? So the tile was underneath you and you had carpet on top? Yeah. Yeah, that's some ancient yeah. VCT okay. tile. And, uh, okay. and then they put the padding and then the carpet. And I had them roll the carpet back. Uh, to that point, rather than having to take everything else out of the room, we ended up only having to take outside a few things. Uh, most everything else I could shove into other bedrooms or a few things went in the backyard. But the uh, plastic kept, I'd say, 95%, 96% of the dust out of the reef itself. And mm -hmm. the top rim of the sump had a little light dusting. The top of the top off container was dusting. You know, anything horizontal had a little layer which yeah. I just wiped up, and when I looked at the bucket of water I'd use for rinsing, it was a little tan. So, mm -hmm. all right, let's go back. That's not that's going. not too bad considering. I just remember when I was cutting concrete stuff, there was dust everywhere. It took like months to finally clean it all up and get rid of it. Yeah. So. No, I agree with you. the um, The whole point of keeping the dust out of your tank shouldn't be, uh, you know, understated. It's really important that we maintain. Mm -hmm. Uh, good flow in the tank, good oxygen levels in the tank, uh, keep mm -hmm. any kind of foreign elements out of the tank itself. The reef itself was completely unfazed. There was no skip in power with everything they did. Fortunately, they did not destroy my uh, gigabyte ethernet or my uh, my internet coming in. All right. Yep. Devin, entertain them. I have to go sign a piece of thing three times. You mean the, the air conditioner <laughs> guy or whatever yeah. he doesn't want to be on YouTube? <laughs> Sorry. All right, yes. so yes. Pop Reef is asking, do you have any day. extra pillars on the floor under your tank, or was it strong enough? Um, so on my tank, I have it on the second floor, 200 gallons above a stairwell, and I put in four 2 by 6s so uh, that way there was only about a, I don't know, 15-foot span or whatever it was from the stairwell to the wall, outside wall, so that part was supported, but around the top of the stairs was kind of like a double header, I guess, wrapping around it. So that was the part that worried me a little bit. So I have an engineer friend that came over and checked it all out and basically told me what to, what to worry about or what not to. So then I used four two by sixes, which is probably overkill. But I did that just to make vertical support on the stair side of my tank. And that's worked pretty well. It hasn't budged. The tank's still there. It's good. Um, and I have this little tiny ledge that I use now. I can stand on it to clean the glass or reach in the top of that side of the tank. And it does work pretty well. Uh, buy an Austin air filter, pressure the room. The other pre-pressurizing the room would actually work pretty well. 
the other thing when I was doing concrete that I did is just have like all your fans blowing outside the window so that it kind of creates that suction and gets rid of as much dust as possible but I was still honestly amazed that it took like ages to get the dust just every little spot you could think of that's crazy welcome back form signed your official I, yep I signed everything he wants me to install a UV on my AC so I um huh. Well, you know, I have a lot of water in this house, and apparently it makes mold grow where it shouldn't grow. So he wants, he, you know, they always have an upsell, but I, um, I think I'll just do it this time, because the choices of having them like remove the unit to sanitize and bring it back in versus putting in a bulb that just cooks anything that's in the chamber Mm. seems like the lesser of two evils. Uh, I was listening to what you were saying while he was talking to me, and you were talking about the negative pressure (laughs) and trying to bring in pressure. That was excellent. All good points, and it is good if you can do that. Mm-hmm. I have a question. Mm-hmm. With your house, what is the humidity level inside of your house? It depends. Uh, Texas Average. is a very humid state, and our mm-hmm. winters are actually very low. I don't have to even run the dehumidifier, mm-hmm. and if I do run it, it cycles on and off, and the uh, I could probably go a week or two without having to empty it. But then once we hit yeah. spring, we head into summer, that thing will fill up in 12 hours. And I have, and mm-hmm. it turns itself off. And so I would run it every single night while I'm sleeping. So I don't have to listen to the darn thing. And then during the day, yeah. just, you know, the AC is doing its job. It's pulling moisture out of the air. But I yeah. could probably run a dehumidifier 24 hours a day. Now, what the humidity is in my house specifically, it varies. It can be as much as 70%. Um, the dehumidifier mm-hmm. usually turns it off when it's down to about 55. Yeah, okay. In the chat, big puff bubbles. Mark, I'm actually a water damage restoration tech specializing in mold. Listen to your AC tech. He's right. <laughs> yeah, he's right. Well, $700 will fix anything. <laughs> yep. Money no. solves everything. It's true. Well, I know. Yeah, he was like, well, we have this thing called, what did he say, tier two, phase two, something like that. And that one, they mm-hmm. run brushes and stuff up through all your ducts, and it was 2200 And I said, like, what if you don't do that? And he's like, well, tier one or phase one was like, 1050 and then he says or oh, we can do the uv thing which is like 700 bucks and i was like just <sighs> just take a reef tank one out of the housing and just <laughs> pop an event and call it a day <laughs> i know right no i think it will do it i did see the mold i saw what he was talking about and yeah. about two years ago something like that i actually had them replace all the ducts in the entire attic they pulled out the entire octopus mm-hmm. the plenum and everything ripped it all out put a brand new one in and this guy even said normally he stabs his thermometer through the plenum, which is the box above the unit, the blower, mm-hmm. to measure. And because it's all metal and it's new, he can't do it. He's like, I can't, I can't oh. get through it. And I was like, well, there's a hole up there. And he was like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that I did replace that. So in theory, other than new mold finding its way into my new tubes, it should be clean. But I know they didn't mm-hmm. replace the actual part that the air blows out. You know, there's the cover and there's like this yep. scoop thing, whatever that's called, that yep. directional elbow. And that thing, those are gross in my house. I mean, they just are. And I will literally have to pull out my tarps again and go up there and just clean them and put the covers back mm-hmm. on. And that way I've killed off some stuff that's trying to kill me. So <laughs> Now, here's, I don't know how well this would work in Texas because of your super humid there at times. Mm-hmm. But ever considered doing like an air exchanger to like swap inside and outside air? But oh, if it's more no humid way. outside, it probably doesn't work. But I never want outside air in my house. I love rebreathing the same air. I'm like a submarine commander. We use the same <laughs> air forever. We filter our farts, right? <laughs> no, I'm really lovely. not big on fresh air. I, I never have been. Like right now, today, it's 84 degrees outside. 84. Yeah. And so, I like my house 71. So if I was sucking in air right now, it would be humid and 84 into my house even if it's just for a duration, then you have to have the AC kind of bring it back down again. One of the advantages of them is they remove moisture from the air, though. That was just one of the things, right? Because it would help Hmm. get rid of humidity or tone it down. How does that? Uh, uh, Like the one that I have sitting there waiting to be installed (laughs) is called an HRV, so it's a heat recovery. Basically, it has like a car rate, like a radiator inside of it, and Mm -hmm. it uses the inside air to kind of pre-treat the outside air coming in so it brings it up to you know to 85 percent or whatever the heck of the same temperature yeah. that way you're not losing a bunch of ac or losing a bunch of heat or whatever so it kind of does it but it's kind of a cool way so but that's brings a ton of fresh air in your house and helps shave yeah. off a ton of the humidity out of it so consideration well my ph probe always says my ph is great in my tank so i assume the air i have is good enough 
But I do see what you're saying. Yeah. I didn't know you could pre-treat the air other than, you know, trap yeah. pollen from getting in. But I didn't know it could, like, take mm -hmm. humidity out of the air it's about to put in your house. That I've never heard of. So Yeah, I don't fully know how well it works both ways because I don't have quite as humid where I live, so I haven't worried yeah. about it, but yeah. no. Yeah, I, I see a big puff bubbles is saying more stuff. He says, yeah. I've been to residential mold damages that required up to 300000 or $500,000. Yeah, you know, yes, Oof. insurance will solve it. But you know how they solve it. They tell you, get out of the house, go live in a hotel for a while, and we're going to tent the whole place off and you know, rip out sheetrock and all kinds of fun stuff. And mm -hmm. the reef tank can't go to the hotel with me. So if the reef is well, here, I'm here. That's how it's going to be. It, it's probably possible, but it wouldn't be easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm going to try this UV thing. I mean, whatever. And that way, mm -hmm. I just hate spending money because I've been spending so much money. I mean, I, You've been I'm not even going to list on this major. channel what I've spent in the last couple of months, but it's a lot. And there's still more yeah. spending to go. So, <laughs> so I believe it. it. It is what it is. Um, so I told you guys to replace the roof, replace the foundation. Then I had them go through and trim all the trees around the property. And they trimmed the heck out of my trees. And, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of shade. And I told these guys, I said, look, don't take my shade. Just trim out what you got to trim out. And like, oh, yeah, no problem. We got it. We've been doing this 17 years. And they trimmed the heck out of my trees. <laughs> the whole your, canopy's your been lifted <laughs> like 8 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet higher than it was. I'm just like, so much sunlight. Oh, my God. But that's okay. And then they've... Uh, the outside's being prepped for paint and mm -hmm. the yard's being prepped for a new sod where the grass has not been growing for years and now this uv thing so <laughs> it's just like too many things but uh the reason right. i'm hiring all these people to do these things is to make the house a home so i can enjoy it like caitlin had suggested and recommended and desired mm -hmm. and if i'm doing that if i'm doing those things myself i am not working so I have decided to just let these people just do their jobs, get it done in a couple of weeks, you know, suffer through the misery, pay the bills, and that way I can actually work and build things for my customers because I've had some very patient customers over the past couple of months. They have hung in there through everything. I mean, when this all happened, I, I sent an email to every single customer and said, look, if you need a refund, just, I'll write you a check today. And everyone, I mean, like, as, like it was crazy. It's like they all talk unanimously to each other. Everyone just said, nope. We'll take take as long as you need, you know, and uh, you know, whenever you get to it, which was very kind yep. of them. But patience only goes so far, and I have been whittling mm -hmm. away as much as I can, and it's been hard. And then on top of everything else going on, my neck has decided to start killing me again. And all last week, it was so bad; it was just like migraine days after days after days yeah. after days, and I couldn't get anything done, even if I wanted to. Like even if I was motivated to work, this pain threshold was so high. I was popping pills left and right, trying to just make it through the day. And my desire to do anything plummeted to zero. I just didn't want to do anything. I mean, literally, I had friends say, hey, we're going to, you know, you want to get together for that? I'm like, nope, I'm doing nothing today. And they're like, well, what if we came to you? I said, I don't care if you come here. I'm doing nothing. And they're like, well, we'll pick up Chinese. Like, that's fine. I'm doing nothing. And they're like, okay, <laughs> we get it. You're going to do you know, so. But then I did clean the bathroom before they got here because there was that dust. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get that. I finally had to clean that bathroom. But, so how uh, are you now? Are you, are you back nice. to normal-ish? Well, no. I mean, I'm up and down. You know, I talk with her mm -hmm. her mom quite often, um, at yeah. least every week. And uh, mm -hmm. we're basically trying to encourage each other as best yep. we can through a horrible situation. And uh, we still, I mean, the, the other thing is we still don't know what happened. That report yeah. has still it, not it, been released, which yeah, it's hard, they said but... 12 weeks. So Monday would be 12 weeks. So maybe Monday we mm -hmm. finally get told from the medical examiner what happened. Um, in the meantime, uh, we just wonder, you know. Yep, and, I know. Uh, and think about the nice times as best we can, which is really hard to do because you keep dwelling yeah. on the, the worst part. So, uh, in reef news, in my tank, uh, you guys knew I was having problems with some corals dying, and that has continued. Um, right here, in that spot. That right there is a dead coral that I haven't pulled out because I didn't care. That was the Drew's Acro. The whole thing went up in smoke. I broke off one branch, uh. and I set it down on the sand, and that piece on the sand is alive. 
which is weird because it's not much flow and not much light. Um, and then the Milka coral, I'll switch the lens to the full camera again for a second here. Yep. Uh, the Milka coral is this big one right here. It's purple in color and normal lighting, but for the mm -hmm. webcam, it never looks right. I lost a single branch that is right there. It's white right there. And just that part there just died. Okay, it just went whoosh. But all the rest of it lived. And then behind the Milka was a huge blue tort. That whole thing's gone. And something else next to it went up in smoke. And then some Montipora went up in smoke. But the, the funny thing is, in the front it died, in the back it died, but the middle where the Milka is, it did not die Ooh. other than one single branch going up the center. So um, I will at some point have to go in here and cut and remove the dead because if you leave dead corals in your tank, typically you end up with algae growing on them. That has not been yep. the case. Um, I've and still lost some hammer coral polyps, some hammer polyps. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's been I a mess. I randomly lost a few heads of torch like over the past few weeks. Um, my big dragon soul, whatever, there was like one head kind of started to go down. Also, like the whole branch, I fragged it off, but it's depressing. And then I had another torch for one, one or two. Is I have no idea why, but it's just like ah. Yeah. But the other night I fragged off a couple done dead heads, and it just makes your tank look better. Not seeing the the skeletons in there, so it's worth it to oh, get in there. Oh, you're you're completely and frag right. It over. Yeah. No, you're completely right. And to go ahead and uh, clean that out, number one, you increase mm -hmm. flow. You have an empty spot to put something. I have an yep. entire. Uh, it's a weird term, but I have an entire graveyard of living corals on the back of my reef on the sand that I could take mm -hmm. this and take that and take that and I could put them up in those empty spots and boom, my reef is full again. <laughs> it's, yeah. Those corals were a frag that I just never picked up and they mm -hmm. sat and they grew into little tiny colonies and I could move them up. And I've got Montipore growing on the glass that, you know, puddled out and now it's, and I know what that, I, I know that's never a good thing because then when you try and scrape it off, there's like this weird, calcium carbonate on the glass that never comes off and that's along the back and that's happening in multiple spots because those corals have been growing so mm -hmm. even the, and that was a funny thing i did some par measurements recently and i have a lot of intense par down at the back where all that stuff that graveyard is really um, yeah where you would think you know your pars at the top but no the way my lumen uh, lumen bright reflectors work they shot it all down to the bottom and that's why all that stuff was living down there so mm -hmm. i'm gonna have to move some of those things off and I need to I need to do a water change, and I did one already. I did like a 150, 170 gallon water change. Oh, big one! And then I refilled the uh, container to make more salt water, and the pump mm -hmm. stopped. So now I've got to figure ah. out what's wrong with that pump, so I can make more salt water because I have a barrel of salt to go pick up at uh, the fish store. He got mm -hmm. it a week ago for me. It's uh, another giant barrel of salinity. That one barrel makes a thousand twenty six gallons of water, salt water. Dude, so where did you get these magical barrels? I, uh, I tell the fish store I need it, box. and they said no yeah. problem, and they get me one in. I usually buy one from them every Ooh. couple of years, and nice. uh, because you know I don't do a lot of water changes, but I'm trying to be better about it. I mm. sent an ICP test during the last twelve weeks, trying to figure out what's going on, yep. why I'm losing corals, and I sent it to ICP analysis. I sent it to Triton. I sent in the mm -hmm. Triton N doc, which is their new test for nitrate and. Uh, some of the other nutrients and the uh icp analysis came back with everything's pretty much normal yep. then triton came back with we recommend you dose this 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 and this for mm -hmm. one day <laughs> <laughs> so that means i was just off a hair of this and a dot of this and a crumb of that mm -hmm. and when i told it to a friend he says oh so basically they're telling you to do a water change because it was such a small <laughs> amount. And yeah, if I bought those five bottles and did 15 milliliters of this and 10 milliliters of that and mm -hmm. 80 milliliters of this, I'd supposedly have those magic numbers. In other words, my, my water tested great on both. However, mm -hmm. NDOC took a long time to get a response, a very mm -hmm. long time. And when I finally got that report back, it was so bad that they don't even tell you how to fix it. They say, please call us so we can help you. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, That's wow. That's another level. Well, that just tells Oof. me my nitrates are sky high like they always are. And I had bought yeah. a new nitrate test kit from Frank, uh, Frank's Tanks. And because mm -hmm. uh, mine was, been, I'd been using it for over a year and it was done. And I got this new kit and I measured the water and I was like, oh, they're down to 10. Woohoo! Which meant the kit was completely wrong. 
And uh, I verified that by taking out my ELOS test kit, which only measures 0 to 25, and 0 is clear, and 25 mm -hmm. is fuchsia, and my yep. thing was fuchsia. So I knew it had blown <laughs> away the, you know, so that one test kit I bought was bogus. Um, ah, and I guess. So I did the big water change. I didn't bother testing because which kit am I going to not believe? <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah, at this point. Hard. I just have to you do small water one. changes. Yeah, well, I'll take back that kit decider. and get a replacement because, you know, mm -hmm. right out of the box, it just told me the lies. It told me lies. I can't be lies. lied to. Unacceptable. That's fair. Yeah. You Devin, your tank behind Gosh. you, that's a, a video of your tank. You're not sitting in front of your tank because no. that would be amazing. But I want to ask you, how is your water quality doing in your reef? Well, I could tell you exactly how it's doing. What would you like to know? Everything. <laughs> Here, I'm putting okay. you on full screen. Let, let me pull up my auto tester results. The test yesterday on Friday. The Alcatronic? I'm not going to lie. And the Mastertronic. Beautiful Oh, yeah, thing. both. Nice. Yes. Oh, yeah. All right. Elk, 8.59. pH, 8.04. This is from the tester. It's still not mm -hmm. live, but as of yesterday, Friday morning at like 3 a.m. Uh, <laughs> PO4, 0 0.109. NO3, 18.21. Calcium 460, mag 1559. Yeah, not too wow, bad. I mean, up there. Yeah, Hun's always up there. I threw a bunch yeah. of the mag rocks in my reactor. Mm -hmm. And then the other tank, the frag tank, elk is 8.17, pH 8.1. Waiting for it to load the rest of the results. <laughs> but this one's usually a bit lower. I, I've been slowly battling phosphates and nitrates, trying to get it down the last little while. Mm -hmm. So it's it's almost there. Phosphates are going to get a bit lower. Nitrates is under 20, so I'm happy now. And it isn't loading my results yet. It's taking a sweet time. But yeah, no, overall, pretty good. Minus losing my couple heads of torch. I'd say the tank's pretty darn happy. And... Tank behind you, is that about a year old? Yeah, it's a little over a year now. Yeah. So it's it's starting to get in its groove and things are starting yeah. to thrive, which is nice. Um, nice. really starting, thank you, really starting to get that point where stuff actually starts to, you just really see growing more branches and stuff really starts to grow with it. Yeah. So uh, I'm happy it's there. No, so another six good. months, I think it will be in a pretty happy place. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So how's your water? Have you tested it? Well, you don't know. Uh, your test, not today. But... It is water test Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to remind you guys. And I hope that every week for the last 12 weeks, you've been testing your water anyway. I have. Um, despite my rotten mood, I have uh, been testing and staying on top of alkalinity and phosphate, and I knew nitrate was up, but mm -hmm. uh, calcium and, and uh, magnesium and all that was pretty much in where I expected it to be. I had to top off my calcium reactor. I guess we can talk about that briefly. Mm. Uh, Reborn is a, uh, is a product that's been out for years, and it kind of vanished for a while, and it became hard to get, and then it came out briefly, and then it was hard to get again, and I ordered in more batches of Reborn to sell, and I buy these bags yep. that are four kilos and they uh they look completely different now they look like little nuggets so ah, i uh, changed. posted some pictures mm -hmm. and i didn't ask julian sprung specifically why it's different but someone else did and then they sent me a screenshot of what he wrote and basically he's saying that what they brought in i mean he, he wouldn't sell it if it wouldn't work because he only sells products at work but he mm -hmm. what they're bringing in now is different than what they got in the past but it's also 100% um, legit, <laughs> where mm -hmm. there's no chance of getting in trouble with customs. Where I guess the yeah. other stuff, if anything was even just a little bit too big, it got into, a, I, I guess, an illegal area with uh, fish and wildlife or really? something, you know? Hmm. Where, you know, <sighs> there's a lot of legalities when you're, bring, when you're importing yeah. things from other countries. And, you know, there's always the risk of getting in trouble. And I'm sure... He did not want to ever take a chance of getting in trouble for creating media for a calcium reactor. So yeah, exactly. he uh, brought in this stuff. It looks smaller. There's pictures of it on my website where you can actually see it up close. I shared a couple on Instagram as well. And uh, it's smaller, but it's not like uh, crushed coral. It's not the little tiny stuff that we used to always use back in the day. Um, I miss the larger bone-like stuff that we were using. Mm. It was whiter. The stuff's in the brown area. But it's in my calcium reactor, and my calcium reactor is continuing to provide my alkaline and calcium in the tank. So I have huh, It is much smaller. Probably... I'm just looking at your website. Yeah. Oh, speaking of my website, did you guys know I have a new website? 
The uh, website was finally transitioned to the new version, I'd say about two weeks ago. And that has been a work in progress for the last, oh, I'd say 15 months. And you know, I remember when I hired the company, I said, you know, it's time to update my website. Let's do it right now before we're at that point where we have a deadline where some kind of software is deprecated and they're like, you know, you have, you know, you have until the 13th to get off the server or whatever, you know, that stuff happens. It's crazy. You would think a website's forever, but no, there's certain things with the software and you got to stay on top of it. And so about every three or four years, my website gets a big update and it's a monster task. Well, last year when I hired them to do this, it was January. And mm -hmm. I think March was when COVID really hit us. And within weeks, his um, employees that were based out of Mexico were uh, told to stay home and they don't have internet at home. <laughs> so they couldn't oh, continue no. to work on the website. They had oh. to you know, wait until they come back to the offices. So the whole thing got put on hold. And then mm -hmm. I believe it was like June or July, the software that I use, that I've been using for a long time now, they rolled out a new version of the shopping cart that was incorporated instead of being a third party plugin. And mm -hmm. when they did that, we had to redo all their hard work from the first couple of months of the year oh. to make the new commerce. So Dang. all that had to be completely rebuilt and figured out. And they were trying to apply all these really cool features that the website can do with brand new software that's just been rolled out by the parent company. Basically, we made things happen that weren't written to happen yet. And we're like, we, we want this, we want that. <laughs> and so like now when you are searching for something in the shop, Mm -hmm. In the search box, you get little pictures of the products next to what it Ooh. is versus just some words or a list. Oh, that's cool. And one of the my favorite parts of the shop that I love, and I'm so glad we finally got it, you can now shop by brand. So you can actually click a brand on the right side of the screen, and it'll show you everything from that brand on, this, on two, whatever it is, multiple pages or oh, all nice. on one page if it's not that many pieces. But that way, if somebody's looking for something from Neptune Systems, they can pull up everything I sell from Neptune, and they'll know if I have it or don't instead of having to like just kind of work your way through the dry goods pages trying to hopefully find an optical sensor, for example. So, and your site's pretty snappy too, which is nice. I appreciate yeah. that. Very mobile friendly, iPad friendly, tablet friendly. Uh, still works with desktops, of course. Matter of fact, there's things on the desktop that you won't see on the phone. Um, mm -hmm. it's, there's like more environment for desktop users, but uh, like the cool. subcategories are all there on the screen that show you to jump to sections, but on a phone that became super long to scroll through. I was like, get rid of that. <laughs> Just get to the point. And so we removed that from the cell phone version. Also, Creature yes. ID has been completely revamped from what it was. That was always called Critter ID. We renamed mm -hmm. it Creature ID because there's so many creatures on there. It's not just critters, there's fish, there's invertebrates, there's all that. Mm -hmm. And now there's information about acclimation, there's information about uh, water quality. And that's a, a big work in progress. There's still a lot to do on that. but. That one works really well. And if you have the Reef Trace app, Creature ID looks even prettier. It's amazing. <laughs> it looks nice. great in the app. And those two are tied together now. My web, because Reef Trace is a partner of mine. You know, we work together. And so my Creature ID became a part of their app. And so everything that's being updated in the app automatically web, uh, updates on the website as well. Nice. So the idea is looks that these great. things will happen and you'll be able to see what's a conflict. You'll be able to see uh, the idea is that users will be able to submit their own pictures um, mm -hmm. or even recommendations of creatures we need to add. So if there's something lacking, you can suggest it, we verify it or whatever, and we'll do something and it'll appear on there, and which would be really nice. It'll become like a, a community project, sort of like a wiki, I guess, yeah. in that regard. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, there's a lot going on there. And there's still quite a bit of little tinkering I'm doing. Also, another big change to the website, and I'm very happy about it, is we finally have dropship prices on there. Um, so now there are things where you pick some small little thing like Live Rock Enhance, and the flat rate price is right there. It's not gonna compute the FedEx for $18 anymore. It'll just do mm -hmm. the flat rate $6, where I can just ship you those two or three small items for $6. And I don't have to send nice. you a refund, which was something I've been nice. doing for the last couple of years. I've been doing lots and lots of little tiny refunds because I never felt mm -hmm. like you should pay too much in shipping. And my customers tend to come from YouTube, so a lot of them knew that even though it charged a lot, they're gonna get a lot of it back or a piece of it back and you know, they understood. Mm -hmm. um, also, yep. there's certain things on the website now that are um, free shipping. 
Um, nice. I just built the price of shipping into the product, basically. Yeah. Have to do nice. something because nothing's free in this world. But at least it won't be another thing on top of something. And that will help as, as well. So mm -hmm. there's been some nice changes. Um, and, you know, when I come across little things that aren't working, and if you see something on the website that doesn't work, feel free to let me know. I've been reporting those issues. I still have access to the old website where I can pull... Like, I was missing an entire article. I was like, oh! So I went and found the article, and then I pasted it into the new site. I was like, how dare you guys not get this? And they spent a long time moving content page by page. It wasn't mm -hmm. just an easy export database, import database, like yep. you'd imagine it should be. No, it's never that easy, especially if it's a new platform. It's not going to happen. Right. What I'm planning for the future is to leave this website alone as is and the only thing we'll update is the commerce i want the articles and the blogs and you know the creature id and all that kind of stuff just i never want to touch that ever again you know <laughs> you're never going to add another creature what no i'm saying i don't want to ever have to like change the core software yeah. again i would like to just leave that layer there and then we work on the shop mm -hmm. because now people are paying with bitcoin or, or something like that oh do you, do you accept you can... Bitcoin? <laughs> no, but I accept... Thank you for that beautiful segue. I now have something on the website called Affirm, which is something new and exciting. One person specifically added, asked me to add it. I uh, went to my web developer and said, can we add Affirm to the website? And he was like, yes, we can. And of course, I paid a small fortune for that to be incorporated. And now, if people want to buy something expensive, they can buy it with Affirm and make monthly payments instead of having to pay all of it up front. So if you're buying, you know, nice. an Apex, you can pay four monthly payments instead of, um, you know, $800 one, at one time. One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, that's, so that's, that's kind sweet. of a neat feature. And it, it was funny. We launched the website. We released a firm once it was approved. And I, I think it was like the next day somebody used a firm to buy something. And oh, nice. I didn't like, even know how it worked. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take a while to break even. But, uh, <laughs> but I was just like, well, when do I get paid? Because I saw the transaction, and I know a firm <laughs> got some money, but where's mm -hmm. my money? And it took a few days to go through, but I got my very first yep. paycheck from a firm, so that's nice. Nice. That's and, cool. And uh, the customer got their order shipped out, and that made them happy as well. Nice. So that's some yeah. big changes in my life that have been happening. Some good, some bad, you know, but... Uh, yeah. Well, the website looks amazing, and you took it to a whole new level of fancy, so it looks awesome. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad. I'm, I hope... Jose hears you say that later because he'll be really happy because it was mm -hmm. a monster task. And, uh, you know, I was really thinking because they did the last website. I was sure mm -hmm. they'd have some tools to transition everything over and just kind of tweak things like tell the pictures directories in a new spot or something. That's it. No, no, no. It's never that easy. They had to it basically insert every single blog for. And that website has been a labor of love for 18 years. You know, it's it's been around a long time, and we keep updating it to the newer software so that it'll work on cell phones and tablets and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So that was a really neat thing. Um, I finally bought myself the iPad Pro. Mm -hmm. They announced it last week. Ooh, I plan to use fancy. that for business purposes specifically. Um, because when I pack orders, I have to keep walking back and forth to the computer to make sure everything's in mm -hmm. the box. And now I can yep. take that tablet to the room, or nice. when I build a building in the backyard that I'm hoping to build, that's still on the wish list um, mm -hmm. while I'm working on the house, but that will be the new workshop for packing orders and building more products and to expand Milo's Reef to make it a little bit bigger and hopefully bring on an employee. And that way I will have that portability to do orders from that other building through the iPad Pro. And mm -hmm. uh, I've been wanting one. My last iPad was the 2, which I got in 2011. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, it finally gets to the point it doesn't work at all. It does nothing. <laughs> so I've been like looking at orders on my phone. I'm like opening up spreadsheets and on a <laughs> screen this big. It's insane. And no, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to get it. But it's going to be 6 to 8 weeks till the iPad shows up. But I did pay for it. So nice. that is exciting, and that will be nice. And I'm hoping to use it with the live streams. Because I was going to say live stream camera. It could be a yes. tank monitor when, yes. when you're not doing orders. I mean, there's tons of uses for reef tank related. So that's awesome. Well, something that has been promoted that I know nothing about, uh, the Apple environment has something called Sidecar. And apparently mm -hmm. it gives you like two screens. And for me to have a second screen for the live stream would be fantastic mm -hmm. because I have so much mm -hmm. stuff on my screen when I do the show. 
and I'm trying yep. to follow the chat and I'm trying to pull something up and I'm trying to keep track of you know, the guest or whatever I'm doing. And when I look at anyone else that does a live stream, they have like five monitors, they've got a whole series of buttons and they've got, you know, <laughs> all this gear. And I'm like, I'm doing it with one desktop. So to have I only have on one the screen too. Nice. Do you really just do one big one? screen? Yeah, I have like a big ultra wide. Yeah, like curved. Yeah. <laughs> like a gamer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. See, I just have a flat 27 inch monitor. Nice. But no, I, I would love to have that secondary screen. I think I'll be able to use it when I'm moving orders in and stuff. I, I can see mm -hmm. things because everything's on top of each other all the time. That's been yeah. a real, that's been tough, you know, just, I need to make things easier in my life because it's been really hard. And uh, yeah. oh, I, I do want to say, I don't really have a speech, but I do want to say that the thousand of you that reached out during these times to encourage me to let me know you're thinking about me or whatever, it really does help. And I can't even imagine going through what I went through and not have the thousand of you saying the things you said. You know, because there's pe I joined a grief group on Facebook looking for some kind of solace. And everyone in there is talking about someone that just died. Every single person. My daughter died. My father died. My boyfriend died. All these people. And I'm like, well, how am I going to get any solace from this? Every person is just saying someone died. And there, you know, I read some people's posts, you know, hoping maybe something would resonate with me. And nothing helped, you know. But... When I would have someone say, hey, Mark, you know, I, I'm calling you up. I want to see how you're doing or whatever, or, you know, what's going on. It, it really made a difference and it, it did help. And I didn't always have the right thing to say. Sometimes it made my mood even worse, you know, because it made me think more. But uh, a lot of times it, it was encouraging and it was helpful. And uh, it was, this was my way of dealing with grief. And I'm sure someone else would have handled it completely differently. I did a stream uh, three weeks after Caitlin died where I talked to everyone and told them, what I could for about 10 minutes. And then I switched to what happened with the ice storm and how it, mm -hmm. how it affected the tank and if the tank would survive, you know, went to all that. And uh, then a couple of days later, I just took it down. And uh, I had a couple people say, where is it, where is it? <laughs> like, well, if you know where it was, then you've seen it, so you don't need to see it twice. You know, it's not like you have to rerun it. So I, um, at some point I'll probably put it back up, um, but for now it, it's not necessary. 9,000 people saw it and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not a sideshow. It was it was some raw emotion. It was really hard to do that one, but I felt like it had to be. I had things I had to say at that time, and uh, you know, even now, I mean, I I think about her all the time. You know, I mean, that's just that. I don't see that stopping anytime soon. No, it doesn't. Um, you know, <laughs> talk about making yep. the stream sad. I'm sorry, guys. It's just this is my reality. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you've been. High, highly motivated to carry all those motions forward and keep on with the projects, which is awesome too, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like a lot of things that we'd planned to do together. I'm doing now. I wish she was mm -hmm. here to enjoy them with me. I know people say things like, well, she's, she sees it. She's happy. I'm like, eh, I hope so. You know, I mean, I don't know when nobody yeah. knows, no one knows. That's the worst part. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, you can just hope and you know, I mean, yep. just this week, just this week I was thinking, I can't go somewhere to visit her grave or something. That doesn't exist yet. You mm -hmm. know, that's not an option. And that's mm -hmm. just, it's weird. You know, it's like, you know. Yeah. Okay, let's change Still topics. <laughs> let's uh, so, do something sp else. Speaking of chaos and power outages and generators mm -hmm. and battery backups, how is your DIY battery backup been working for you? Still waiting. Um, the batteries What are you waiting for? <laughs> for some sexy way to connect those wires. Um, other than that, and we can talk about that. Um, I moved mm -hmm. all the batteries out of the fish room into the mm -hmm. workshop, which is the other side of the wall, on top of um, the a shelf under my workbench. It's a perfect spot. The batteries are not sitting mm -hmm. on concrete, even though according to everyone I've spoken to, that is a myth, and that batteries sitting on concrete does not drain the batteries. So. I could have had them on concrete, but I chose to put them on the shelf because I won't kick them. I won't have to do anything. They'll just be there. And I've got the trickle charger mounted and it's plugged in and all four char batteries are charged. Mm -hmm. And I even did the thing where I did positive on one battery and negative on the far battery. So it has Good to man. feed through all of them. Good man. Then I bought an extension cord, just a green yep. uh, outdoor extension cord that mm, is green, probably 16 gauge or something. I don't know, 18 gauge. Yep. 
and my plan is to cut off the ends and mm -hmm. run a hole through the sheetrock and push that wire through. Actually, I'm going to push two wires through. One's going to go to the frag tank to run the Vectra. Mm -hmm. yep. And then the other wire is going to come across the floor through one of those rubber things like you see in offices where you don't step on the, the core. Yeah, it's like things. a little half yeah. turned black thing or gray. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put that on the floor, run the wire there, and that's going to run all the vortex mm -hmm. and the, the Vectra pump there. I'm not going to worry about the circulation pump and the saltwater vat. That doesn't matter if there's a power outage, there's a power yeah. outage. But the thing is, I wanted something to connect all those little wires to that reminds me of the breakout box from Apex. And yep. I have not found any such gizmo where you have the, Look at the positive and negative coming in and then you can go underneath. And I talked with you and you suggested with a horrible drawing, it just do this. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's not sexy enough. What, you enough. didn't like my, my cell phone <laughs> edit drawing? Oh, it's terrible. I thought of something good for you. Um, okay. Car stereo distribution blocks for doing like car stereo amps and stuff. Okay. Perfect. So you All have right. one in, and they usually have a bunch of little screws you can attach other wires to. That would be Correct. good. And they'll look And fancy. it can do positive and negative on that? Well, you just get two of them and put them side by side or a little block. Or, oh, I but look see. At, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, good. Because I want to do something, and I'm going to put them in closed boxes where they stay dry. I'll, I'd yep. love to, like, take the box and, like, glue a magnet to it and then just to mm -hmm. the steel stand. And that way it's up off the floor, can't get wet, can't get splashed. Yep. And that way all these things have power because... Yep. That's important. Also, the, yeah, go ahead. Is? Oh, um, the other part about it was a lot of the car stereo ones, they already have little acrylic covers and stuff, so wires don't get oh. short, so it already has that built in. It'll look good, it'll be cheap. Oh, nice. Trust me, but that's right. your solution. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, I need that. I really want it hooked up, because like the other day, the day after I moved all the batteries in the workshop, that night, the power went out. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and everything was like, <laughs> and I was like, oh. Yep. So I went outside and turned on the generator again, you know, and got the t the reef going. And, you know, that's fine. But I like having the pumps running at least, you know, 45 minutes or an hour before I make the decision to turn on the generator. And that's what mm -hmm. I was about to tell you. My other news is back in, uh, I think it was March, after the big ice storm that hit Texas, uh, I went to Costco probably mm -hmm. a week after that thing happened. And they had this beautiful, fantastic, ginormous generator for $800 mm -hmm. that takes gasoline, natural gas, or propane. You have three choices. It's like, that is amazing. Anything. And it puts out 50 amps, which is amazing too, because nice. I, right now, I think the one I have now is like a 30 amp, maybe less, maybe a 25, I don't know, something smaller. And having a 50 amp would let me run the reef, plug mm -hmm. in the fridge, anything else I wanted. <laughs> I could- Anything. And, uh, yeah, exactly. So I have had that sitting in my trailer in the driveway for two months. And it was yesterday, I think, or two days ago, I hoisted that thing out of the trailer by myself, which was no no small feat. That thing was freaking heavy. It took two people to get in the trailer. I kind of yep. pulled it toward me and let it fall, you know, and kind of did the whole teeter-totter thing to get it out of the... Yeah. Um, took, it, you know, took it out of the package, put in the oil, hooked up the wires. It has an electric start. You just push a button and it Ooh, starts. You don't have to pull see. a cord. Um, nice. It has that connection that I'm just going to save probably in some kind of a bag to keep from getting damaged from any kind of environmental stress. The connection for mm -hmm. the propane tank. So it's like this yep. regulator thing with a hose. And I just want to protect that in something for the day I'm going to actually use a propane bottle to run the generator. But mm -hmm. I don't have natural gas here, so I always use gasoline. And I read the manual, and I got to tell you guys, that was one of the recent questions Oof. someone was asking in Club Meals Reef. They said, when you get a generator, you know, what's the rule of thumb? How long should you run it? And there was all these opinions. Well, the book that came with the generator I just bought said you should run it for 30 minutes every month. Hmm. And they had all kinds of crazy suggestions of things you should never do that I've been doing forever. Like, <laughs> like when what? the generator's <laughs> running and you know it needs more fuel, I unscrew the cap and pour in more gas while it's running. And apparently you're supposed to turn it off and disconnect the power cord <laughs> that's going to your stuff and then pour it in. And I guess it makes sense because you got this engine, this combustible engine, and you you're wanna... pouring liquid gas into the top Lammable of this vibrating machine. On top of this yeah, exactly. high temperature overheating yeah. device. <laughs> it also oh. said not to run it indoors, which I knew, but I have an outside mm -hmm. shed and I keep it in that shed where it's protected from the elements, but it can run. And it said, do not do that. 
and uh, it said you should be like, and it was funny, everything's in meters. You'd love it. Uh, <laughs> it needs to be this many meters from your house. I um, was like, okay, so how many feet is that? Because <laughs> I'm American. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually recommend you don't have it in, uh, inside that shed, even though it's a shed and it's not connected to the house. It's not, no air from the shed can get into the home. So it's not a factor. But they recommend having it outside the shed. And it said, do not worry about the weather. So it can actually sit out there in a hailstorm and it can, you know, just run. <laughs> and I don't have to worry about protecting it from geysers Twist. of water slamming down against it, apparently. Well, I'm sure you don't want to be using a trenchal downpour underwater. But is your shed vented? No, I don't. Yes, like, is there, a there are vents yeah, on it. And then one of the things that uh, you could do, mm -hmm. you could actually hook up some kind of a vent fan like in the shed mm -hmm. and plug it in one of the 15 outlets it has on there. And yeah. that way it's actually sucking the air out of the building if yeah. you had it closed up to protect it from the elements. And one of the reasons I wanted it in the shed was to keep the sound down too, because they're very loud. Mm. And yep. when there's a power outage, everything's quiet. And then you're the loudest guy in town. Yeah. And well, you being the loudest guy in town draws attention to you. And, you know, there's people out there that are criminals. And there's like, I could steal that. I could pawn that. I get this. I get that. So, yeah. you know, I, I kind of. <laughs> or I just need, I need his power. Yeah. So yeah. I kind of like it in there. But, you know, in the meantime, it did say that. And I looked at how it was built and where the handle is to roll it around and where the exhaust is. Mm -hmm. And. The way it is, I actually can't really easily run it inside that shed anymore. I'm gonna have to mm. like pull it out to start it, and I guess it'll be out, and then when I'm done and it's cooled off, I can put it back. And a cool thing Don't. that I didn't expect to find in the package, it even came with a cool cover like you have for your barbecue grill to keep it clean. Mm. Nice. So that was kind of nice. I have a question though. If you just have to push a button to start it, why do you gotta pull it out to start it? Um, the Well, you gotta put fuel in it, and I, got to put a power cord into it. You got to see where the switches are. All that stuff's inside the shed and okay. I'd have to crawl in with a flashlight to find mm. things. But yeah, you're right. right. Technically, I'd probably be able to do it and just maybe leave the do the door off where the access point is you just, and it could you just could vent use out. A, you use look. a dryer vent off the exhaust yeah. to like pipe it right outside your shed. I want no to, there's actually tubing they make. It's not dryer vent. It's actually made for an exhaust to run mm -hmm. it. And I remember a friend did that and he sh he had the thing running in his basement in the middle of the, <laughs> the storm and he had that tube going all the way out and all i kept thinking was that is some hot air coming out and mm -hmm. normally there's a spark arrestor on the back of a generator that looks like a screen and mm -hmm. you have to usually remove that to put your piece on so now the mm -hmm. sparks are going out the tube right and i kept saying are there any yeah. leaves near that tube you know but the tube was long i mean it was probably 15 mm -hmm. 25 feet or something like that and he ran it all the way out there to outside and it just yeah. was on bricks but I kept thinking, what if it starts a fire? You know, it's just those yeah. little what ifs that always go in my head. I'm always worried about logistics of what could go wrong in a situation. So I mm -hmm. haven't used it yet. I haven't tested it. Um, it's well, brand new, came with a three year warranty, um, but it's ready. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm informed because I read the manual. And I'm very proud of myself for reading the manual because most guys don't. We just kind of like. Yeah, I'm proud of you too. You did good. <laughs> but now you have a big battery backup. So will you even need your generator now? You're ready for yes. anything. Yeah, um, the battery backup will keep the Vortex running and the Vectors running, but it won't run the Abyss. Now, if mm. Abyss ever comes out with some cool connector, that'd be amazing. I do have a power inverter thing that was given to me, gifted to me, that mm -hmm. you could hook up to batteries, but I and it changes your battery into 110, which then yeah. goes into the Abyss, which converts it back to DC, which only it uses works, like 165 watts, which is nothing. But I think the 165 watts I need, I think it would mm -hmm. suck the batteries dry really fast just to keep the return pump going because of the inversion yeah. process, not the pump. The pump's pulling so mm -hmm. little. That's a heater and a half for most people. You know, 165 watts yeah. is nothing. Um, <laughs> still, it's still a pretty good chunk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. For longevity of the batteries, so. Right. So anyway, I do mm -hmm. like the batteries just to keep things spinning. To keep oh, and then one more thing I just bought. <laughs> I have a here on my tank. Let me switch the screen one more time. Here we go. Solo. Oh, you can't even see it. Let me turn this side. Right. So that right there is an MP60. There's two of them on the tank. Ooh, and they uh -huh. are 10 years old. And they've been running nice. every single day for 10 years. And I decided Impressive. what I wanted to do was go ahead and 
Oh, I'm on the wrong side. Let me switch that. There, I feel better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can't switch in the middle of the show. <laughs> Confuse everyone. They'll think I'm Reef Dudes. Um, I ordered myself two new MP60s because they've been mm -hmm. running nonstop for 10 solid years. And I just felt yep. like those motors have been through it all and it's time to just get some fresh gear on the tank. And so I, when I was placing my order, because I sell Ecotech gear, I went ahead and I yep. just said, put in two MP60s for me, which they did. Now, question, is, are those the new ones? Well, these will be. Those are, st I mean, they just arrived. You, you just told me that your mixing pump died on your saltwater bin. You know what a perfect use is for your old MP60? Put it on there instead of my, well, I, I need my M2 to work because it pushes the water. It mixes okay. and it, but I, you know what, it's funny you mentioned that. It's just a slightly similar situation. I was looking at the poly tank and it was looking a little dirty in yep. certain spots. And I was thinking, God, you know, I hate it. And it's so hard to clean that thing because it's so tall. And then it occurred to me, I could take a cleaning magnet, like a mag float, and I go, and I could clean yeah, the walls of my vat. And I've never thought of that. I've never heard anyone ever doing it. But it occurred to me, I could do it with my own tank and I can actually keep that thing clean and get rid of these weird brown spots that are appearing on my vat. Mm -hmm. But no, it's an M2 and mm -hmm. it's been running flawlessly for a year. And after my last water change, you know, I, I did what I do and mm -hmm. it was running at 100% which is what yep. I do. And then when I don't use it, I switch it all the way back down to 10%. So it barely pulls anything, it just moves yep. the water quietly. And mm -hmm. it was blinking red flashing lights. and like, oh. mm. so I unplugged it to reset it and it, it, it is on, but no water's moving. Mm. So now I have mm. to go disconnect my unions and let some water drain on the ground and find out why my pump isn't working. And it's like, rah. Well, I guess. But, oh, that's kind of a nice idea about the MP60 being used for something. Yeah. So that's what I did. I used one of my old MP40s, and I mm -hmm. got like the rectangular kind of poly bin for my water. Yeah. And I have the old MP40 down on the backside of it, so you don't see any pumps or wires, right. but it mixes up my water. That's and then when nice. I add in salt, I have a little 24-hour mode in Mobius. I hit mix salt, and then it just runs at 100% for 24 hours and drops down to 10% when it's done. Nice. No, that's really cool. But then there's no holes in the bottom of my tank, right? So right, there's yeah. no chance of a leak yeah. or anything like that. So that's kind of why I did that rope. Yeah, mine's round, and I don't know what an MP60 would do on it. I might have to have you 3D yes. print me something creative that can handle the curve. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. And then if the darn thing separated, <laughs> I'll never get it again. It'll be at the bottom. That container is seven <laughs> feet tall. It would be a nightmare. I mean, I could try lining it up with a magnet or something. Oh, God. Uh, but anyway, uh, I am very happy to put new pumps on the tank. I, I love that I've had mine for 10 years. They're still running. They're still fine. I just yep. was like, they're old. I'm going to replace them with new ones and nice. uh, get another 10 years out of them because they're such well-built pumps. And it's, yep. it's just funny to me when I see equipment that I've been taking care of and has been taking care of my reef for so long. Mm -hmm. And then you read posts and like, oh, they make crap. It's overpriced. And you, you just hear those stuff. And they're like, I, I'm like, what exactly did you buy and when and why are you having all these problems and why isn't no one else having the same complaint you are? And invariably, did you, did I feel you like they- your gear? Do you clean it? Yeah. Do you maintain I just yourself? feel like they bought it used and then they're complaining it's not good enough. You know, you, you got it yeah. from somebody that got out of the hobby or flooded it or dropped it into water or whatever and it was already on its last leg and then you spend a couple of hundred bucks and they're all mad that you've been ripped off by the man when that's not the case at all. This was, you know, if you'd bought a brand new one in the box, I think you'll be fine. And I'm sure there'll be seven people that'll see this video and say, I bought a brand new one in nine months, blah, blah, blah. All I know is I've got MP40s and MP60s and MP10s that ran for five years minimum before they got replaced yep. with new ones. Or I replaced the, I have, you know, the wet side or something, you know? I have four MP40s and two 60s, and I've had them mm -hmm. for years. I've only ever had to replace one wet side because I don't know if I dropped yeah. it or the vinegar or whatever, but one of them, the magnet was starting to bulge and it was rubbing, so. Yeah. But not bad for considering how many. I don't mind buying extra wet sides. As a matter of fact, I ordered more uh, just because I like to have them on the shelf. Sometimes customers want them, sometimes I want them. And uh, that cleaning. way, <laughs> yeah, Done. you Swap. just put a clean one on there, put the old one in some vinegar water or not vinegar because, oh my goodness, you can use citric acid or muriatic acid. I don't care what you guys use, but you know, you can clean yep. the, that one and then put that clean one in the tank and take the next one and soak it and go through rotation. Yep. And in like a day or two, you've done all the pumps and they're all nice and clean and your tank never skipped a beat. So yep. I, I do like having those wet sides and I do like taking them apart and looking to make sure everything's fine and not just wait until the magnet has split open. Um, 
which does happen. You know, from time to time, something fails. <laughs> MP60. Yep, I have, I have two two extra dry sides for each model for the 40s and the 60s, and I clean them. Wet boop, sides. Boop, boop. Yeah. Wet side. Sorry, wet sides. You said dry sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's dry I've in your hand, but yeah. No, the dry yeah, side's the motor. Dry. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, it's just, it's so easy to clean it because I got four on the one tank, so I just pop out two, pop them yeah. in citric acid, vinegar, whatever, and same with the other one, then right. super easy. Swap them, do the next two. Yeah. Easy peasy maintenance. Yeah. And that's key. The key to things working long term, right? Just it maintain really your stuff. How often do you actually clean your return pump? Um, Our heads are I... more often, return pumps are. I do return pumps maybe every year and a half. Um, yeah. I don't do it more frequently. I, I tend to clean skimmer pumps more frequently. Usually about every mm -hmm. six months I'm attacking the skimmer because I feel that needs to be nice and tidy. But like the last mm -hmm. time I took the Abyss pump apart, um, I took it all the way down to what I could take it down to and cleaned it and it was just normal filth. You know, it wasn't, there was no surprises, yeah. there was nothing weird in it and uh, all was well. I had a hard time removing the impeller. I didn't know how. And when I was at Macna, um, whatever that was, almost two years ago, I said, can you show me, you know, in person how to do this? And so they explained, take two screwdrivers and go like this. I'm like, <laughs> I never would have known to do that. I mean, it's a monster magnet inside their pumps. And they mm -hmm. showed it to me. I was like, okay, got it. So uh, that's interesting. So you and, got the uh, dual screwdriver method down? Well, once. And, you know, it'll happen when it's time to do it again. I'll like, how did I do that again? <laughs> And I'll go to Reef Dude's channel. He'll have a video that explains <laughs> it with metric tools. <laughs> metric tools. That only counts for sockets and wrenches. Oh, you don't have that for screwdrivers? I figured you'd say, these are 19 millimeters wide. <laughs> yeah. Pull out your 40 millimeter flathead and give it a big <laughs> twist. That's kind of a monster. Oh, my God. You guys and oh your God. metrics. It's so crazy. Oh, I don't get it. Although I do prefer millimeters instead of, like, fractions, but... Depends what it is. Okay, Odell, can you use your own dead corals in your calcium reactor? You absolutely can. I never have, but you can. Do you, Mark? Do you use, throw your old stuff in there? Circle I've done it a couple times. I don't like it. It's uh, yeah. It just it, you have to really break it up to be uniform. And if you're mm -hmm. throwing in sticks and, and branches and twigs and stuff like that, and even flat plate, you know, from Montefiore or whatever, you end up with all these weird pockets and the water's flowing through. It's not going through it evenly. And it just seems to be a mess. And it seems to also mm -hmm. melt, kind of break down into mush more rapidly than the actual media. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm not a big proponent of that. I know those guys out there just love doing that. They'd... And plus, there's the other part. You took the coral out of your tank, and then you have to destroy it with a hammer. And that goes against everything. I just went years to grow into something pretty. So I have like a big colony of Drew Zacro still in the workshop, totally in my way, that mm -hmm. is intact, that I have. I, I need to get rid of. It's just in the way. But to pulverize it, and throw in the reactor just isn't on my game plan. Is it physically cool looking structure? Yeah, it's a table. It's a nice big aqua. Okay. Yeah. You should paint it and make like a cool little art thing. I did that. I had a whole slew of like skeletons for, I've collected mm -hmm. over the last like six, seven years. And then yeah. I acquired them from all my buddies and I like airbrushed them and made like mm. a little table, coffee table artwork with like painted coral. Neat. It looks really cool. Yeah. You know, it's cool. And I, I have done stuff in the past where I saved certain corals. And I, in the beginning, I was saving a coral if it died. And I can't remember who coined the phrase. I'm sure it was not me, but they said something about their wall of shame. And then I was like, <laughs> oh, man. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm not going to keep saving the <laughs> Because then you start thinking about what, you know, you start thinking about what you lost. Um, that, it's not even the money. It's the coral. Skeleton. That was another yeah. one, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's wow. not even and the money. It's just it was such a beautiful coral. Now it's gone. So I don't want to do that. Yeah. No, that's fair. Yeah. But if you turn it into some pretty art, then it could be some cool... Reef yeah. themed artwork for your house and you give it new life and purpose. No, it's true. There was a um, a guy at Aquashella that made all this glow in the dark stuff. I never remember their names. And it was so pretty, I bought something while I was there. And they had all this other stuff I wanted to buy, but I kept saying, I'm not going to spend that kind of money. You know, but it was really nice. You know, it was like mm -hmm. glowing scolies under like black yeah. lights. And they were just amazing. I was like, oh man. And it looked so pretty. And plus, their whole booth, everything looked amazing. You just want to have one mm -hmm. of everything. And I yeah. just don't have that kind of money. <laughs> Plus, I don't really have a spot in my house for that either. Uh, I did take yeah. the one coral that um, they made, and it's hanging by the reef tanks. And when I walk in the fish room, it's glowing this teardrop glass thing. It's really pretty. Hmm. Very cool. So, yeah. So that's actually another good little sidebar. Like, do you have much reef art outside of the tank? Like, do you have artistic y reef related things around the house? Yeah, there's a few things here and there. Um, I've. 
I recently acquired a shark that hangs on mm -hmm. the wall. That uh, mm -hmm. it was believe it or not, it was a Facebook ad. I'm just scrolling through yeah. Facebook, and this shark came up and was like, "I'm going to need this." <laughs> and I was thinking how funny it was because this is the kind of thing Caitlin would see, find, and say, "We need this," and we'd buy it. You know, she'd find something. I, I don't, it was our joke: add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. We added so much stuff yep. to cart. I mean, I didn't always pull the trigger, but it was in the cart. And I saw that shark. I was like, "Oh my god, I need this." And I went to the website, and I'm reading the specs, I'm reading everything, I was like, I think I really want this thing. And so I bought it, and it arrived, you know, it wasn't long, you know, a couple weeks or something like that, and it showed up. And I had it on the walk board here in front of the tank for a while, just sitting there. But it's designed to hang on the wall, and mm -hmm. you guys are going to see my mess because my house is under construction. But if you can look way over there, see oh, it's out of focus. Cool. Yep. Hang on, let me tilt that a little bit. So the shark is right there, and it's not actually mm -hmm. on the wall. It's funny, I'm pointing like a totally different direction, but my finger was the right spot. Yeah. Um, it's sticking off the wall this far, like that much. Huh. There's a metal pipe, kind of so it's hovering next to that painting floating. or that photograph yeah. of the of coral the reef, which is really neat. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then over here, I've got these. Oh, you can't see because of the reflection. Let me see if I can move the wire here. So there's the Spock uh, yes. cutout that was made by Jason That's Langer. Cool. And then he sent me that beautiful um, lemon peel that was Caitlin's favorite fish, and so now they are together forever. And then the urchins we found at Target, and we put some more urchins over the top wall of the kitchen, and nice. we have this beautiful barnacle thing that we got that's for the coffee table, and yeah, there's actually quite a few things in my house that are reef-related. Uh, matter of fact, she found this cute little thing at CVS of all places. It's this bag that looks like a purse, and it's heavy, mm -hmm. and it's got a yeah. coral painted on the side, and it's designed to be a doorstop. So oh. just put this thing oh, on the crazy. So when we handed yeah. it to the cashier to ring it up, she like, what the? put her hand <laughs> out expecting it to be like a, a cloth bag purse thing. And it was yeah. so heavy, her hand kind of dropped. She goes, wow, I did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yep. that is so neat. And Caitlin was so excited. She goes, I know. And of course, you know, add to cart. We just bought it and brought it home. And it helps keep a door open when I need it open, which is really nice. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nice. What about you? What kind of reef art have you stuck in your house? Uh, Besides the reef. <laughs> yeah, no, I got the real reefs. I got one of those little, like, coral poster things that I somewhere acquired. Um, that and just the ones I painted my little coffee table reef. I probably have, have more things. Like, do you have Ikea there in Canada? Yeah. All right. I got this at Ikea. I keep moving my camera around for you guys. If you look I got a really cool ceiling, octopus thing. <laughs> there are three little fish. Oh, they're fish. They're ah, fish. Nice. And it's really cute. It's, it's meant cool. for like a kid's room, and that's by my front door. And mm -hmm. those, uh, they have regular like halogen lights. I want to swap those out for like LEDs because it pulls no yep. power. But uh, they need to be cleaned. They're dusty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything horizontal is dusty. Covered in, in concrete. Right <laughs> yeah. And you know, you talked about, by the fact, I wanted to talk about dust again because we talked about all this stuff, you know, from what they jackhammered and, and uh, you know, all the breaking out. I mean, it was crazy watching guys with wheelbarrows rolling through my house. <laughs> wheelbarrow yes not one like three wheelbarrows Where'd all a jackhammer <laughs> thing and they would haul this dirt out they'd had planks of wood that they'd roll across mm -hmm. and i'm like this was a carpeted living room with furniture <laughs> and to see a wheelbarrow in your living room is so weird <laughs> oh yeah it was, and then these guys would dig down deep right and to where they were to their necks in the slab foundation you know the, the really? rest of the body was there. yeah oh you're Really deep, deep holes, yeah. And you know, it's not as deep as it seems. It looks crazy deep, and I think it's an optical illusion because you're standing. I'm five nine and a half, and when <laughs> <laughs> and when you look down at the hole at your feet, then mm -hmm. the hole goes down from your feet. Yeah. And I'd look down that hole, and it looks like a six foot hole. I'm mean, like, geez, that is so deep. And it's three. It's three feet. It's thirty six inches. You know, you can take a tape measure. But when they'd get down there, they would dig down, and it looked like a shelf to put their butt on, and then they'd dig down, and that's where their feet go. <laughs> yeah. And they'd sit, put the cylinder, and do the thing. Anyway, so lots of dust, lots of cleaning, and all that kind of stuff happened. But the thing I want to talk about dust again is because now that the house has been fixed, and it's mm -hmm. stable, and it, in theory should not budge again, right? I have to wait six weeks minimum, probably eight weeks, to let the house do anything it might want to do to yep. be officially in its Settle. spot, then mm -hmm. I'm going to hire a sheet rocker to go through this house and fix anything that's wrong in every room. 
and she rock dust, as you know, gaps. is the worst. Anything. Oh, yeah. I don't care if it's a little piece of tape or there's a hole or there's a spackle. I want everything to look new. I just, I mm. am so tired of putting up with there's a crack, there's a seam, there's a thing, there's a that. I mm. want that person to go through and just find every flaw, fix every flaw. Sky's the limit, I'll pay whatever it costs, I don't care. I just want it right. That's not really true, it's dangerous. but I, I want it to be affordable. <laughs> but I want yeah. them to go through and find every problem, fix it, mm -hmm. and then when they're done, then I have to paint you know, everything yeah, that's been mended, fun. you know. So there's still a lot of work to be done inside. And then, of course, where they broke through the tile, I've got to fix the bathroom, I've got to fix the front door here. Um, there's a few spots that need some, some new some flooring, you know. Yeah, some love. Sure. That's right. I was going to say you got giant concrete fill holes in your floor, but I guess that's all under carpet, so you'll never see it. Yeah, that's all been basically hidden. And mm -hmm. if I ever do anything again, I will probably do carpet again because mm -hmm. I love carpet. I, for one thing, it gets rid of echoes in a room. Number two, yeah. I love carpet. I have always loved it. My best friend was like, just get like this beautiful hardwood floating floor. You'll love it. I'm like, no, that's your thing. I hate that stuff. I hate it. I want, har I want carpet everywhere. I love my vacuum cleaner. I love to just <laughs> walk around barefoot in nice, soft, I mean, it's even the soft. guy. Even the guy that was doing the carpet, he goes, man, this is some really nice carpet. I don't go cheap on carpet. I want mm -hmm. thick, comfortable, Fleshy. bouncy carpet. Yeah. And I, I love it. And she says, well, it's so dated. It's so old. Everyone does, you know, hard surfaces. And, I'm like, and then you put an area rug. I'm like, nope. <laughs> I, I live here. This is where I live. I'm not trying to sell the house. If I want to sell Did the house... Like I could rip out the carpet and put it in hardwood and then sell the house because you have a brand new floor. Maybe that would be a seller. Yeah. Oh. Selling feature. But. I don't know. Do what you like. You gotta enjoy it. But I, I agree. I find on like a hard floor, like if you're walking around over a field, your feet are sore after a while, right? You're on carpet yeah. and plushy. It's just like nice. Yeah. And you know, I've and got that, a dog and she mm -hmm. tears up everything. And she can't tear up the carpet, which is amazing. She would lay on mm -hmm. her shoulder and take her claws and do this to the carpet. You know, like just shred it <laughs> and the carpet doesn't even care. It's amazing. Yeah. If I had hardwood floor, she would put grooves in it. She sharpens her nails like razors and goes at it. And I mean, there's no way. <laughs> so Jack gets to enjoy carpet everywhere. I have carpet where there's tile, there's <laughs> tile. And you know, there's yeah. lawn, there's lawn. And she gets it and it, it works out mm -hmm. just fine for the two of us. And, but Perfect. no, I, I'm gonna, matter of fact, a friend of mine posted a picture. They got this dog. I don't even know what it is. It's half wolf. It's black, mm -hmm. very furry. And they had a picture of this dog in the living room, and the entire living room was carpet. And the carpet mm -hmm. was almost white. It was amazing. And I was like, man, I yeah. love your carpet. And he said, <laughs> my wife wants to replace it with hardwood floor. I was like, no, white carpet. That is amazing. <laughs> no one has I the guts the to have white carpet. I'm in the exact same boat. It's Mine's like beige. I'm in the exact same boat. Wife wants white the colors floors. look like, amazing, like the but it, you do have to keep it clean. I mean, that's important. And yep. that had this black dog, black fur everywhere, I'm sure. But man, that was some gorgeous looking carpet. I'd put that in my house in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Ah, that's awesome. Yeah, it is soft and cozy. And Echoes, if you're doing any video work, hard flooring is yep. terrible for anything because it just yeah. bounces. Like, I, I have a big carrier rug thing in my office because yep. it was so echoey in here before it was yep. crazy the difference your audio that's like why you whisper on your live streams like hey guys we're gonna do the show today we're gonna talk about plumbing because you don't want to <laughs> echo <laughs> hey in the beginning it was that bad i had to yeah i believe you yeah yeah, but, but no, yeah i'm a big so. fan of it and you know you can hang carpet on the wall if you want you can do you know some guys put boards hanging down from the ceiling with carpet mm -hmm. underneath to absorb the echoes and it's so it's so funny it's like then why have all this hard... Plus, you know what? I clean floors for a long time, professionally. So to have hard floors anywhere makes me think I have to clean it. Where with <laughs> carpet, I just need to vacuum it. I don't know. There's just a whole... I've, I'll vacuum the carpet 20 times before I break out a mop to mop the kitchen, which is hard yeah. floor. You know, it's like, ugh, <laughs> floors. No, oh, bad. <laughs> floors. I would yep. like to replace this area I'm standing in right now in front of the reef tank. Mm -hmm. Like, I have to fix the front door anyway. I have to. It's broken mm -hmm. out. The tile's gone, right? There's a slab, yeah. there's concrete, there's broken, sh jagged tile, right? And then there's this carpet, and then there's tile. And yeah. I thought, well, if I just did straight all the way to that tile with whatever, then if I drip anything in the tank, it hits that instead of dripping on yeah. carpet. Mm -hmm. But my friend so pointed out that now you'll have one type of floor there, one type of floor there, and carpet. You have three different things happening in one room. 
And I was like, I know, it sounds amazing, doesn't it? And she was like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh. So in the meantime, I've done nothing. Um, I might just que fix that. Question. So I have never had an issue with like my salt water tank around carpet. Mm -hmm. I always hear people be like, oh, it's the worst thing ever. It'll destroy your carpet. I've personally never had an issue. Have you ever had an issue? No. No. Uh, yeah. When my 280 leaked, which was right where this 400 is, mm -hmm. the carpet got wet and it'd been getting wet for a while, like a few days. It was this constant drip and the carpet got mm -hmm. wet, which meant the padding yep. got wet. Yeah. And then when we broke down the tank to get everything out of it before the tank just let go, we, mm -hmm. had, we didn't get water on the floor at all. We were really proud of ourselves. And someone had brought over a pond liner which is just a black tub looking thing. One end's higher and then it kind of goes to a deep end, like a little tiny pond yeah. you throw in the yard. And mm -hmm. so we thought we'd put all the live rock in the pond liner. And so we did, we handed the rock down. It was under a table. We stood on the table to work in the tank and we hand the rock to the person he put it in the pond liner and the pond liner was sitting there on top of the carpet. And then we pumped some yeah. water out of the tank to cover the rock to keep it wet so it wouldn't uh, cycle. And the end of the pond liner that was the floaty part once the yeah. water hit it, it folded it down and all that water just poured into the room. Oh. And I was like, no! And I was like, I was lifting the liner with my arms. You're like, oh. put something under it to hold it up, you know? It just never occurred to us. It was just you know, stupid, right? Mm -hmm. So that was pretty much when I decided to replace the carpet because now we had really flooded it. It wasn't just a little issue over here with drips. Now we had significantly dropped five, 10, 15 gallons of salt water across the zone. And so I had the company come out and they replaced, you know, the living room and the hallway. And and matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, my, <laughs> this is nothing to be proud of. I mean, you know, we all do what is best for us, right? But mm -hmm. when I replaced the carpet in my living room and hallway, that was the easiest area to get to. So yeah. all the bedrooms have a different color carpet. It's sort of like in a hotel when you have one color in the hallway and then the rooms are a different color. All the mm -hmm. rooms have the other color carpet because that's where the furniture is. And I refused yeah. to empty my house so they could put carpet everywhere. And I would love <laughs> to have all matching carpet in the whole house, but to rip everything out of here and put it outside sounds like a logistical mm -hmm. nightmare that I would not overcome anytime soon. I would be so upset. So I am more prone to just replace the living room in the hallway again. <laughs> yeah, fair. And not have the other rooms match, which is weird. Well, no one would like that, but it's just it was easier than ripping apart my house. Now think if you ever had to do it where your tank is of what's underneath it. You'd never yeah. get to it. Yeah. You'd have and to you know like... what? That's the thing. Carpet, tanks sitting on carpet, they're not going to hurt the carpet either other than they leave a depression. And it can leave a, yeah. a permanent dent, just like any furniture can. You can take a bookcase and move it. And there's this weird flat spot. And you can try things like ice cubes and stuff to kind of fluff it up and you know try to steam clean it. And, but it's always a different color and all that where the tank sat it puts a dent but the problem is if you have a major flood or a leak or something like that mm -hmm. it gets under it can actually rot out that area and it'll be mm -hmm. moldy damaged stained yeah or the stain of the wood actually stains mm -hmm. the carpet itself so there I, are times where your carpet does get ruined but it comes down to how much water hit the floor yeah that's fair i put a chunk of plywood under my tank like mm -hmm. the same size as the stand mainly because uh -huh. there's like eight thousand leveling feet i'm like there's no way i can level this on carpet or even see yeah. the difference so yeah i put a huge chunk of wood and leveled it to the wood yeah but yeah i mean that's the, there was a guy he had a a hardwood floor house a nice house with like real hardwood not the floaty crap and it was you know real dense stuff and he put his tank on it and he had a mountain of towels around the, mm -hmm. the tank at all times and he apparently spilled all the time and he just grab it with his foot and just rub it back and forth in front of the tank to mop up whatever he just spilled and that was his method but i do feel like no matter what you put under your tank plywood uh foam uh you know just the carpet itself invariably mm -hmm. water will get between that and the surface and there will be some kind of damage you just have to deal with it later on and just yeah no fair enough because it, it can't air out it can't dry out yeah no that's true especially if you airflow is key right it's the only thing that's yeah. gonna help it dry so if you ever do spill yeah. having fans blasting at it is yeah. key well you know when they come in to fix a house after a flooding they pull up the carpets they usually throw away the padding put brand new padding down and they have air fans blowing air everywhere to try and dry out the room um mm -hmm. and if you've ever spilled water under your tank like under the sump 
you could look mm -hmm. at the sump six months from now and you can still see water between the sump and the stand. It, it just never goes away completely because there's no <laughs> way for air to get there to get the moisture out. You actually have to mm -hmm. remove the sump, dry it all, put it back. No one does that. It's too much work. No. Wipe around it and it's all you get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, um, we've talked for how long? An hour and a half. Maybe yeah, we should answer some questions. Should we answer some questions? Should we make you answer all the questions sure. today and I just sit sure. here and smile pretty? Sure. You ask, I answer. What do you got? <laughs> all right. Let me, I'm going to start at the top and work my way down. There's a lot of hellos. Right. <laughs> I'm I expect you to smile and look pretty, though. That was part of the agreement. I'm going to make you guys look at Devin because he's got a pretty tank in the background. Mine oh, you just didn't want to smile and look pretty. I see your <laughs> tactics. Not yet. You're like, you're holding up your end. Boom, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, said you'd come help with the show, so now... <laughs> All the pressure's on you. Let's see. Okay, that's fair. If any questions are, I, I haven't said this yet because we haven't done a stream in months. Um, if you have any questions, please do at Mila's Reef or at Reef Dude so I can find them in the chat. But in the meantime, I'm just going to see what all you guys typed over the last hour and a half that we could maybe address. I think Devin's kind of answering some of you guys anyway because that's what he does on his own channel. <laughs> you do. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, Let's Jake, I cut four RO lines and two Cat 5s through PVC during construction for dose water changes. Thanks to Reef 2's advice. You are welcome, and I'm happy that helped, because if you can do that ahead of time and plan ahead, it makes your life so much easier. All right, here's a question I, from Courtney, which you answered earlier, but now you yeah. can go into more depth. Reef Dudes, right. I want to get a controller. Which is better, Apex or Coral View? I always have a hard time being which is better, because they all have pros and cons. Um, Neptune has been around the longest, longest. They have a bazillion atoms, add-ons, a bazillion modules. Um, you can get a little more advanced with like the coding if, if you go it that way. Um, I have the Apex on my big tank, and it works very well. Um, I also have the Hydros on my frag tank beside me, and again, this worked very well. I have get a, a little fancier with the Apex because I have more add-ons to it. A um, couple of advantages of the Hydros is because a lot of it is wireless. Like I could have a power bar down my mixing station and tie it into the control. Like not having to run wires for certain things is definitely a plus for it. So it's it's a trade off to be honest. But for basic tank stuff, they'll either one will definitely do the job for you. All right. The next question is for me. So I got you off the screen oh, there. Oh, oh. Uh, Kyle says, "Was your house not engineered right originally, or did the ground change and wash out?" Uh, this house is 50 years old. And it has never had foundation work done because if there had been any, they would have discovered it with what they did. Uh, the interesting thing that I found was that the end of the house that's higher, they didn't do anything over there. You would think that they, I don't know, <laughs> I guess you can't dig enough to lower it. <laughs> and they didn't try to bring the whole house up to match that end of the house, you know, to bring it up to those two bedrooms. But that part has never shifted. It's never had a problem. None of those rooms ever had any issues or sheetrock or windows or anything. Everything was completely normal in that end of the house. So I wasn't surprised when they found no problems. The irony was all the hard work that had to be done was everywhere else. And all those areas have stuff in the way everywhere. That end of the house, there's nothing. That would have been the easiest part of the job for them. And they didn't have to do anything over there because that was all done. Now, why my house has been moving, this entire neighborhood moves to some degree. It has to do with Texas being on limestone. We don't have um, uh, basements. And so our houses, whether they're pier and beam or they're on slab foundations, they still can move or adjust. And it has to do with how wet it is or how dry it is based on the summer and the spring, you know, the rain versus the droughts. And all that makes the house move. And my house has been moving and doing weird stuff for a long time. And I got a quote many, many years ago where, because I was like, this is ridiculous, fix it. And a guy came out and he told me it was going to be $14,000 to fix it. And I told him, get out of my house. I said, you're out of your mind. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, nope. You're, that's insane. What, I mean, this was like 16, 17 years ago. I was told 14000 That's a lot of money back then, 14000 Now, maybe 14000 today. It doesn't feel like that much, but back then that seems like 25,000 to me today or something. Um, I don't know. It's just me, my own imp interpretation of <laughs> what the economy's like. But uh, so this how much guy was came it today? in. Uh, this one was better. Um, this was oh, better than the perfect. 14. I ended up paying him 10, well, you're on the wrong side again, $10,300. <laughs> and uh, oh, I, had to pay five, I had to pay 500 to the engineer too. That mm -hmm. was depressing. 
the uh, the foundation guy came in and he's looking around at everything and he says, I think you need an engineer. And I was like, okay, why? He says, because he needs to tell us where the piers need to go. So that guy came through and he looked at everything and that's the guy that says we should put a, a pier under my aquarium. I was like, don't you touch my tank, you know? I mean, I really was like, you're insane to even consider this concept. But um, mm -hmm. fortunately, we didn't have to do that. And then when it was all said and done, then the engineer sent out someone to remeasure to you know verify that the house has been lifted and uh mm -hmm. i haven't got that report yet because you know he was just here a few days ago but uh then i'll get to see i was at like 1.75 inches and now i'm like at 0.5 or something you know it's, but it yeah. was quite a difference and not only did they when they lift the house and they uh you know the, they try to lift it in sections like they don't just like lift one corner and then go to the next corner. You know, they, they work their way across and they might have three guys yep. at the same time kind of like lifting one group area of the house. Yeah. Um, and when they did it, the brick at the top of my house was like letting go. And I'm like, uh, do you see that? Like, <laughs> yeah, that happens. And I was like, okay. And then, you know, when he's done and he lets the pressure off, you see the house go wham. I mean, you can watch the, the, the foundation line drop. And you're just that's like, sketchy. holy crap, right? And they're like, that's how it works. That's very normal. Like, okay. So when they were all done, that weekend, I had a brick guy here who went and fixed all the brick and fixed cracks. And, you know, it's all, everything's in, you know, I'm literally like buttoning up everything. We're just from the outside working my way in. I'm just going to make it really great. But I'm glad to finally get it done. It desperately needed it. My driveway, mm -hmm. which is also concrete, it's got these big cracks in it, which happens because of mm -hmm. the earth moving or whatever yep. and the the slab of the house has like a line that you see at the driveway and then the driveway goes down and mm -hmm. that line used to be kind of the same height <laughs> and now the slab's like here and the driveway is like that <laughs> i'm like wow oh, so God, that's crazy perspective he's, he said that's okay and just shows we went up two inches I'm like yeah i can see that but when I finally pay someone more money to replace the driveway, they can pour a new driveway and actually line it up with that slab of the house so it's all the same height. And that'll look really nice too to have a, a replacement driveway. And you know, the now, more money I spend on the house, the more mm -hmm. it justifies the taxes they're charging me for my house every year. <laughs> <laughs> Way to make yourself feel better about it. Okay, uh, question. It's going up every year, it's terrible. Yes. After all of this, can you open and close the doors in your house now? Yes, yes, every door works <laughs> except the bathroom door, the guest bathroom door, that one wouldn't work anymore, which is really funny because that door's never been a problem. Um, yeah. So I just took some really long screws and I removed one from the hinge and basically pulled the frame over. Now the door works properly and it's resolved. And uh, I want to replace the patio doors and the front door. That was part of our plan. And I already know what I want to buy. I just haven't spent the money. Um, but mm -hmm. they said you have to let the house sit for six to eight weeks first. So there's yep. no rush getting those doors. All right, let me nice. go find another question. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Cow go. What's the topic? Someone else. Mark's carpet. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about carpet, peoples. Let's yeah. See. Reef tank oh. surviving renos is, was the overarching. Yeah banner above our rabbit hole maze today yeah. <laughs> a lot of topics here let's see i'm trying to find a question da, da, da. here's a company answered. here they go by the name flooded aquatics i just like that name that just tells me right mm -hmm. there everything i need to know <laughs> i don't know it seems kind of negative i don't know maybe i'm reading it wrong how do you interpret the word flooded aquatics i don't know it just makes me nervous but um yeah it's uh, better the, than bone dry aquatics <laughs> the uh i don't know why they were talking about split ac units but um on my new building i will have some kind of a, i will have an ac unit on that new building and it'll be split and it'll have a heater in it so i can keep that room exactly right all the time because that's where i want to glue things I need that mm -hmm. um, humidity to be perfect for the acrylic seams. Hmm. Does it need a certain level to like not have bubbles and like perfect seams when doing acrylic? Or like, is there a certain you range of happiness? Need I'm a assuming? very smooth table, very stable. It has to be very mm -hmm. straight. You know, you can't just go buy a, a kitchen table because you know Old those tables table. are not. It's got to be perfect. Uh -huh. It's got to be like an MDF perfect sheet. 
And then I put a piece of carpet on top, and that kind of puts like little yeah. fingers all under everything to evenly lift it up. And that helps mm -hmm. immensely. But having all your edges prepped perfectly is very important. And then gluing it properly, letting it sit long enough, that all works out really well. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite the thing. You know, I've been working with acrylic now for a long time. And I want that new building specifically for uh, having more work tables so I can have multiple mm -hmm. projects going at once. Because usually if I've got one or two or three things on the table, that's it. I can't do anything until yeah. they're off my table and the new thing comes on. And, uh, you know, it's fine when I'm working on little things, but when i got some bigger stuff going on, I lose the table to, like, a big sum for a while. And I've got to work mm -hmm. on that project. So I want to have this new building to where I can actually do multiple projects at once. Uh, I'd like to move all the things I sell into it. You know, I'd like to put an employee in there that's working on things or packing yep. orders. That would be awesome. This is another physical building or expanding yeah. your garage or what's the plan? No, no, it's going to be a physical building. I, I'm allowed a certain amount of space um, mm -hmm. from what I understand based on my property. I can have mm -hmm. a 20 by 20 building, which mm, nice. it's, it's a decent size. I like that idea. Yep. And I have a spot that it would go in beautifully and I still mm -hmm. have a ton of yard left, which is great. It's not like it just took away the yard and now there's no room. So that'd be nice. Outside your house, next door opens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it'd be really oh, nice to awesome. have that. And, you know, like I have one room. It's kind of my junk room. It's like a lot of aquarium mm -hmm. stuff. And then a million cardboard boxes for all the orders. Yeah. And I buy oh, them yeah. by the bundle. And I buy mm -hmm. all these sizes. When they were working on the website, they said to me, well, what size boxes do you use? And I started rattling off like 20 different box sizes. I'm like, uh, what do we do with that? I'm like, I don't know. Why do you want to know? And they said, well, we have to do the shipping module. And I'm like, I don't know how you're going to tell what size box you need for that item versus this item. You know, I don't know how, how granular it is. But mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to have to kind of do some small tweaks in the near future just based on how yeah. some things are being computed. But the, uh, the different size box sizes are for different size products. And yep. while, yeah, I can send a little tiny box out with, you know, two little tiny things like Prodibio and a vacuum attachment. Mm. But, uh, you know, if somebody wants an RO unit, it's a big box like you'd want to get under the Christmas tree, you know? Yep. <laughs> so all that stuff's in that room, and I'd love to have that outside. And then a lot mm -hmm. of the products I sell, you know, all the, all the gear and all that, um, I'd love to have it out there all organized. And I'd like it to be behind a wall with a window so it's pretty. Yeah. And you go into the room really and you nah. get your gear and everything stays dust free. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. Huh. Well, that would be good. Okay, yeah, question really, for you in the nice chat. Transition. Yeah, Mark, I'm looking, have you, know, you considered making a sump design that can support integration with filter rollers from the market? Um, I haven't considered doing that. There are some companies doing it already, and they're, they're making beautiful ones. Geo Reef does one, for example. Um, there's that company that makes a dream box. I always forget their name. Roll Exclusive. Royal, they actually yeah. have their own uh, roller mm -hmm. system. It's a giant roll. And uh, I haven't done that. What I have been doing is making it where the sump can tie into like a clearacy. And mm -hmm. I have a stand to put the clearacy at the right height. But yep. I have not tried to create like an acrylic bracket where you drop in your roller and your motor and you have mm -hmm. your switches in there. It's, it's not hasn't been on my thing. I guess the reason I haven't is because the, if for some reason you decide not to use it anymore, that section mm -hmm. of your sump becomes pointless and it's there forever. Mm -hmm. And you, you can't suddenly make it a refugium because it's too darn narrow. You know? <laughs> it's yeah. this wide and it's got this weird plastic coming up. You can't like put cooling fans on it or something. Nothing logical can go in there. So mm -hmm. if you had some spot, I would almost like it to be a modular thing you drop in Mm -hmm. that you could like lift out and now you have room for a nice big fat skimmer or something like that down the road. Yep. Um, so I have not. Um, but I am looking at new ideas and I, I try to keep my mind open to other ideas. I, I try also very hard not to copy other companies. You know, I don't mm -hmm. go and, oh, that's really pretty. How can I make that? That never happens. I never once do that. I'm like, oh, they made something really nice. I, mm -hmm. I think I kind of like the sumps I build because they're simplistic. They yep. allow you to have the ability to work in it, to put things you want in it, to clean it, where a mm -hmm. lot of the sumps have like a million really cool compartments, but they're really hard to do anything in. Once you've got it all filled in, it's like you have to take three mm -hmm. things out to get to that one thing you have to address. And yep. that, that's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I personally love the filter rollers. Like I don't think mm -hmm. I would go back to socks ever again because it's too much effort. Uh, <laughs> 
would have filtered a little easy. But yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. I mean, I really do appreciate a simple sump where it's flexible. And yeah. if you change your equipment, you're not buggered, right? Because every right. chamber is precisely made for this certain piece of gear. So yeah. I definitely see that argument with it. Um, Pop Reef asked, would you ever start from scratch with a new tank with frags again? Well, if this one behind me lets go, you might get to see some version of that. Uh, it's very rare I start with frags. Uh, I always try to keep my colonies alive as much as I can, even if I have to break it down or put them in a temporary tank. And then they get put in the big tank and they're kind of big already. And you're like, ah, okay, you get this area and you get this area and a couple little frags go here and there. But it, it's never been like an aquascape with like 46 little tiny buttons. I just never seem to do that ever. And if I get this frag tank reset like I've been talking about for over two years, I actually looked that up, um, I will probably set it up to grow frags and it will be kind of that what you typically see people do, even though I hate that look. I like it to look more like a tank with some frags in it, but mm -hmm. clearly having a frag tank with like a tray and a million plugs is the way to do it properly and I just, I'm not a coral seller, so it's not like my list of things I want to do. I want to enjoy that tank and I've had people say, mm -hmm. Man, your frag tank looks better than my display tank. You know, that was back then when it was pretty. It's garbage now. Um, <laughs> but I would I would like to, for example, like have a tray in the front. Maybe it'll be acrylic with a bunch of holes and I'd make it on minion. And then I can put rock behind it so it's kind of pretty and has an aquascape in the background. You know, so it, it doesn't just have that uh, sterile look that a frag tank so often does to me. Yep. And I'd put yeah, sand in the bottom, even though most frag tanks are bare bottom, so they can have maximum flow. I just like to have the look. I like fish swimming around in it, you know? It's, eh, it's all this mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Another question good. that was asked was by Emmanuel, said, do you think SPS deaths go back to your power outage mark? I don't think so. I think I was already losing some hammer corals before the power outage, and the tank was only without power for a few hours. It wasn't uh, days like so many people suffer through. I got really lucky in being able to uh, get a generator when my generator blew up. I, I did not think I would. I thought I was going to watch the reef die. And I put out a Hail Mary on Facebook and said, I need a generator. And 2.5 million people needed a generator at the exact same time. And I thought, who am I? I mean, it's never going to happen. And I got really lucky. And someone two miles away from me had one new in the box at 1 in the morning, and I could go pick it up. And I, at, by 3.30, yeah. I had the tank running again because I had to build it and uh, get it all hooked up. And then I was able to get power in the tank, and I had power throughout that whole week. But there's, and you know, like I said, all the water in the ICP test came back with pretty much normal, other than my nitrates were ridiculously high. Oh, hi. So my friend Dwayne, who I talk about and has been on this channel before, mm -hmm. he said, I think this is a bacterial problem. I think you just have something in there, and it's just crawling mm -hmm. across your reef. And he's like, yeah. and there's no clean way of getting rid of it. You know, it's you kind of have to let it burn its way through or burn its way out, or you have to start ripping things out to contain it from like the Drew's Acro. That whole thing went up like in a day, dang, and like in eight Thanks. hours or less. And I turned down the flow in the abyss pump to barely come out so it wouldn't blow the RTN onto the other corals, and that worked. And then I lifted it out and took it out of the reef, and it seemed to stop it, but I was still losing hammer corals at the other end of the tank. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Now, do you think RTN can, like, blow from one coral or, like, whatever oh, yeah. that is, right? Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, when this coral died and it was heading toward the Milka, I expected the Milka to go, that acro to go, that acro to go, that Pacillopore to go. I just thought it was going to really? work its way across because the flow pushes that way, and so it's all just mm -hmm. going to go, go, go. And the weird thing that it didn't just keep going that direction was impressive to me. <laughs> and yeah. I thought, all right, well... And I you know, said to Dwayne, what do you normally do in situations like this when you've got RTN or you got dinos or whatever? And, you know, he'll, he'll either go in and cut like a surgeon or he'll take a turkey buster and blow it off. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I, I might siphon it out, but I just kind of mm. watched it happen. And I was just, I, I didn't really have it in me to fight it. You know, I just had too much going on in my life to, it was just mm -hmm. like one more thing. I was like, all right. And I just kind of let it do its thing. And... I mentioned this on the stream I did for Neptune uh, a week and a half ago. I said to him how my reef is kind of forgiving. It's so big and there's so much in it that when I lose a couple of things, no one can tell. You know, it's not like half the tank is empty and bone white. That just doesn't happen. I'll just lose mm -hmm. some big thing that's huge in my hands. But when you look at the tank, you're like, where was that before? Because it's yeah. all so layered within itself. 
So I kind of mm -hmm. have a little bit of flexibility there. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. Big big chunks gone, you don't even notice. Well, that's why you should pull out pull out the skeletons from your tank, because then you won't be focusing yes. on this chunk of white skeleton, and then the oh, tank right. will look good, and you'll probably not even notice. Yeah, no, I'll need to go in there. I'll probably have to use a giant, uh, what'd you say, 41 millimeter flat head screwdriver to pry it 42. out. <laughs> 42. 42 millimeter flathead. <laughs> Adam asks, are you still running the skies? The re that reveal was awesome. Yes, actually the tank behind me is being lit by LED technology. Um, <laughs> that switch was changed out two weeks ago. And uh, there will be more information about that coming in the near future. So in the meantime, I've got the tank basically in white mode for the live stream. Um, instead of being blue, because blue would just look like nothing. But then again, this camera never does it justice anyway. I, I'm really, I mean, I keep talking about spending money. I really want to buy a new DSLR, and when I do that with a much better lens, maybe I can actually have a tank in focus behind me that looks nice and the camera can cooperate with whatever's going on. But this little uh, Logitech thing just hates my reef. It just never looks good. It doesn't appreciate the blue. No, I it doesn't matter what color I do. Yeah. Yeah. What do you use for, do you have like a DSLR or do you use your webcam? I have, the, I use a webcam. Um, I own a mm -hmm. Nikon D90, but uh, when mm -hmm. Michael Vargas came over, he was uh, taking some pictures and he had a really nice Nikon and I was just almost drooling all over him, even though COVID, you had to stay apart. And it was the D500, I think he said. And I was like, man, I think I need that camera in my life. And I, of course I Googled it. It's like 1600 bucks for the body. And I'm like, but if I can use my camera lenses with that body, it's not yep. a horrible expense. If I have no, to buy that camera and all the lenses, now we're talking 3,500, I don't want to do that. So yep. I'm kind of on the fence about that one. No, I feel um, you. Pop Reef asked you a question. Will you try the new Ion Director? Um, I would try it, but I don't know if I would actually get one just because I have the Mastertronic. I mean, it would be nice to have, but it's probably a good chunk of change when I already have a tester that tests those items. So, I don't know. If I got a sweet deal on one eventually, maybe. Uh, another one for Pop Reef. Would, do any of you have Aptasia? How do you manage or get rid of them? If so, how? <laughs> yeah. Now, speaking of, does your mm -hmm. copper band eat them in your tank? Yes. Yeah, uh, okay. it's funny. She won't eat the Mahanos, but she must be yeah. doing something to them because they don't look like Mahanos. They look like Recordia. They have pulled yeah. all their tentacles in like little fists, and they're just super <laughs> tight. And I actually have a bigger problem with these other anemones that snuck in from the anemone cube, all my little nano nims. Mm -hmm. And there's like mm -hmm. 30 of them in the tank, so I've got to go and rip them all out too because um, they're just luck. prolific. Um, but Haptasia, yeah, I actually have a great story about this. Um, mm -hmm. I've used everything. I've used lasers, and I've used, you know, caulk wasser paste and i've used yep. lemon juice i've used muriatic acid i've used vinegar i've i've used uh aptasia x um a lot of stuff f aptasia came out from frank's tanks um mm -hmm. i don't know a year year and a half ago and that stuff is different and it's amazing and it blew up and everyone i mean brs is selling it um and uh, it got a write-up in Reef Builders, and it's mm -hmm. really neat. So basically, you've got something that's caustic that will kill the Aptasia, yep. but it makes a hard shell. And so you mm -hmm. have to turn off the flow in your tank. In my tank, I had to keep the flow off for more than an hour, because if yeah, I turned on so. the flow too soon, that white stuff went blowing everywhere. So I turned mm -hmm. off the pumps again, I waited longer. It was probably an hour, might have been an hour and a half, I can't remember, but it was a long time. And mm -hmm. then it stayed hard. And after three days, you can just peel off that little calcified shell and there's nothing mm -hmm. underneath. And people are using it for more than just Aptasia. They're also using it to kill green star polyps or, you know, Mahanos or some kind of coral warfare between corals. They just put it right there. And uh, so my anemone cube, which is full of anemones, including glass uh, anemones, which are Aptasia, mm -hmm. I had at least 100 Aptasia in that tank. And I said, no, that's enough. I'm, I'm just going to get the f out and get my arm wet, which you guys know I don't like to get my arm wet. And I killed the flow in the tank, and you have to mm -hmm. really, 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 really stir it. There's a wooden stick, and you have to really mix it so the hard, dense mud at the bottom becomes liquid and viscous, and you just mm -hmm. keep stirring until it is perfectly, uh, evenly, like, uh, 
like a milk right. solution. Yep. And when it's completely, and I think there's even beads in there. So after you've done all that stirring, yep. then you shake it and you can hear the beads ricocheting around in there. Mm -hmm. And that will then make the stuff perfect. And then you just fill your syringe. And I only sell the big bottle, which is the two ounce bottle. Good. I used the entire bottle in one <laughs> session. Did the whole tank. Yep. I just did everything I could reach. And I killed mm -hmm. 100, 150 of them. And I got everything I could see, I covered. And I covered mm -hmm. a ton. And I made sure not to hit anything I cared about, like the walking dendros or um, <clears throat> my fungias or anything else that mattered. Mm -hmm. And after a few days, I'm supposed to go in there and remove it. Well, I didn't want to get my arm wet, so I kind of ignored it. And I had this white, mm -hmm. like, crusty shell stuff on the bottom. And it just broke up of its own accord. And there's actually just a couple little yeah. pieces blowing around in there at this point. But for the most part, it's all gone. Them. And in the back of the tank that I didn't reach at the time, there's still some Aptasia. But in the front, there's like three. So mm -hmm. it's not like where I have, and I'm sorry, Red Sea, but Aptasia X, I do them, and I'd end up with like 15 new ones. This yep. run right here does not happen. It actually gets rid of them. And if you stay on top of it and you mm -hmm. hit some more, which I'm planning to do, you can actually eradicate and eliminate and be done until yeah. you see one and then get it before it becomes more again. And, I th and that's the thing. I have to go in that tank again. And I did mine probably three weeks ago. And I've been mm -hmm. watching the front. And there's, I don't know, three or five in the front. And very small to one that's kind of a decent size, you can, you'd notice. And I'm going to get them. But I want to get the ones in the back because they're big and brown and ugly. But they're just hard yep. to reach. And I just want to get all of them and just be done with it. But that, that F Aptasia works great. That's probably one of the better ones that I've used too. Um, in the past, I used to go with a good old calc paste. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I started using super glue, which also works pretty well if you don't have anything else <laughs> because you basically make it a super glue tomb so yeah. it can't spread. So it kind of right. dies off and it's in its own little area. But yeah, F Aptasia for the commercial ones, that's worked the best of the ones I've tried. Yeah. Um, I, about a month ago, I went through and did a whole slew of attacks in my tank. And now, a bunch are coming back again. So I finally added my copper band, so I'm hoping he'll mm -hmm. actually do something useful. He's been in my frag tank for about two months to make sure he wasn't going to like destroy any coral first. And yeah, I didn't see him do anything, so he passed the phase one test. So I moved him to the big tank yesterday, nice. actually. So he's been hiding by the overflow wall and hasn't really moved around too much yet. So I'm hoping he'll get comfy in the next few days and cruise around. Did you, you know, see the pepper. news that released this week that the copper band has Ooh. been captive bred? Oh, I actually heard that. Yep. That's, that's huge. Awesome. That's awesome. That is amazing. Yeah. And I'll tell you, those fish, when they're little, don't look anything like a copper band. And even when mm -hmm. they're medium sized, they don't look anything like a copper band. They look like a completely different fish. Their whole shape, I'm like, that's not a copper band. But, you know, of yeah. course, they, they show from the eggs all the way down to this weird settlement size, and then they show a real one in the middle. And mm -hmm. that is so exciting. And, you know, that doesn't mean, okay, we can all buy copper bands, no big deal. But someone cracked the code. Someone figured yeah. out how to get a couple of copper bands to get together and make eggs that will actually be fertilized that will actually turn into baby fish, which is fantastic. And it's something that uh, you know, until right now was not possible. And that is mm -hmm. massively exciting. I know, of course, the first comment someone said, does it need adaptation? I'm like, I don't know. All I know is someone found a way to grow them from eggs, which is amazing. And you know, mm -hmm. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I would think it does. I don't know that it needs to go out in the ocean and learn Aptasias are bad, and then finally we catch one and throw it in our tank, and it's like, oh, I remember these. I, I think it's probably something in their DNA, and they just know these things need to be devoured, like candy. I don't know. This has little nibbles. Mm, that's tasty. Yeah, have some more. <laughs> I think it's got to get a taste for it, really, right? Yeah. So... Now, if you do not have wrasses in your tank, um, Aptasia eating nudibranchs are amazing. Oh, However, yes. However, if, if you have wrasses, they become expensive snacks. Um, I had a bunch in just like a little five gallon tank for ages, and I would actually take my frags with Aptasia and I'd put in that tank with them and let them devour it. And I just keep yeah. swapping frags out through it just because I knew I have like three or four wrasses in my tank and they would just turn into really expensive dinners. Because they're like 20 bucks each for those little buggers. Devin but had some well. great videos about them eating Aptasia. He did the time lapse thing. I loved that. I'm telling you guys, he has a great channel. If you're not following him, you need to follow him. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, another one Kevin just mentioned in the chat, but actually peppermint shrimp are supposed to work pretty well. I uh -huh. Same thing. I bugged my buddy in LFS to order me in like 10 and just like let the army go in and just eradicate those little buggers for good. Yeah. But I have a hawkfish though. So again, they might just turn to expensive snacks over time. So hopefully not, but possibly. 
Um, Big Puff Bubbles asked me if I could build an anaerobic filter um, in a discrete area where I can have two large four or five inch pipes next to each other to create some slow flow and help devour my nitrate. Um, something has to happen. <laughs> uh, you know, when I had someone, oh, I guess it's not a secret. Uh, when Terrence was visiting, he said, wow, you feed a lot. And I was thinking, no, I really don't. He watched me feed the tank that night. And what mm -hmm. I throw in the tank is gone in two to three minutes. Mm -hmm. That's what I feed. That's it. I haven't been putting in food during the day. My auto feeders are all bone dry. I haven't been putting nori on the clip. I mean, today was the first time I put food on the clip for Spock in months. Um, mm -hmm. I literally just feed frozen every single night. And I take like four or five different things out of the freezer, thaw them out. And I feed about 50 fish a night. Uh, yep. The anemone cube has 20, the main reef probably has 25, and then the frag tank has like six, I think. So it's somewhere around 50 fish. And mm -hmm. uh, it's all gone in mere minutes. So I don't really feel like I'm overfeeding. I think my nitrate thing is, I don't even know what it is. I mean, it's probably just because I didn't do water changes for so long. And it's probably that lovely sand bed under my coral graveyard in the back, my, my coral living yard in the back that... It's just so dense that I can't even get to, I have to like remove everything to clean that sand and I can't, you know, it's a tank seven and a half years old. Yeah, you so can't I'm call it a have... coral graveyard if it's full of like mini colors. Yeah, they're alive. It's actually a really pretty area and there's a lot, there's a lot of nice stuff. And people are like, oh my God, why is this down here in the back? You should have this in the front. It's like, well, it's, it's where it's alive. It shows that spot, it likes it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, do that. Uh, another it's question. Alien says, how do you remove cyano? Cyanobacteria is always existing in your tank. It's sometimes invisible and sometimes it's visible. When you see the red or green or blue mat that gets on the sand bed or on the rocks or even on a coral, that's when we don't like it. But when it's invisible, we don't care. And the simplest solution is to just sure. use ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX. Both of these products kill the cyano in three to five days. And then you do a giant water change and you're done. And everyone will tell you, I see this all the time, and it's a big, big pet peeve of mine. They will say, you need to fix the underlying cause. The under, and they say, you're feeding too much. You don't have enough flow. You this, you that, you those. And I just feel like ChemiClean will solve it in three to five days. Done. It works. If you have to do that once or twice a year, that's not cheating. Now, if you have to do this every single month, Yes, there's an underlying cause. <laughs> but basically, cyano blooms in our tanks. It's almost seasonal, and it happens to everybody. New hobbyists, old hobbyists. You know, I've seen it appear in my tank a little bit here and there. There's a little bit in the sand down here at the bottom between the glass. You can see it's red. But it's not. there's no like cyano in the reef tank or on the dead skeleton or in the mm -hmm. corals or across my sand bed. I just don't have that issue. The frag tank had some. I treated the tank. I did a giant water change. And I refilled the tank, and the cyano basically went away. And now I've got dinos. Yep. So <laughs> I've killed one problem to solve a new problem. But the point is, you can get rid of it in a matter of days, or you can do the slow process of increasing the flow and feeding less and turning off your lights. And then in six months or nine months, you're still looking at cyano, and then you finally use ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX, and you get rid of it in three to five days. So it's really a matter yep. of when do you want to solve it? Do you want to deal with it now and get rid of it? Or do you want to try all the natural approaches that don't work, and then eventually you just give up and, and use the medicine anyway? And then you say, why did I wait six months to do this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, people do that. Say, Mark told me what to do six months ago, nine months ago. Why didn't I just listen? And yeah. if, if I felt like treating the tank for cyano was bad or dangerous or risky, I would tell you don't do it. It's the one thing I've been recommending forever. I have no... Uh, shares in the market when it comes to ChemiClean or Red Sign RX. I sell Red Sign RX because I sell Blue Life products, but I don't like get rich and have people buying those off the shelf left and right. You know, I, I sell two or three boxes every couple of weeks. So <laughs> when I'm recommending it's because I know it works and I have a really good write up on my website where you're going to buy it, where I show exactly how I recommend you use it. It won't even match what it says on the box. I say, this is how I recommend you use it and it will get rid of the problem. I will tell you this, if your tank is really overrun and it's super dense, like you have tons of it, then you need to siphon out as much of it first before you treat the tank. Don't just say, mm -hmm. oh my God, my tank is wall to wall red. Mark says use ChemiClean, I'm just gonna pour it in and magic it'll go away. You'll actually, this has happened to like three or five people that I know personally, their water turned pink 
and their stuff started dying because they had a monster amount and they put in the chemical and it all died and it was too much of a bad thing and it could not be filtered out because the skimmer's off and there's, you know, it's, it's a bad thing. So you have to remove the bulk of it for the ideal um, way of using it. Mm -hmm. Devin, thoughts? Uh, other big note on that one is it does suck up a lot of oxygen from your water when you're using it. Um, so I also take the cup off my skimmer and I put like a bowl or something on it. So it's just going to overflow just to keep lots of oxygenation in your water because you don't want to starve your tank for oxygen, which can cause other issues. But yeah, if you have yeah. a big mat of it, do a water change, suck out physically that mat first and then treat yeah. the tank. And yeah, I've... I Keep going. I've also, yeah, I've also, like, I think I said, wait 48 hours if you do a water change. I think I waited three or four days first. Mm -hmm. I waited longer just to make sure I had more time to seal the deal, and I've always felt that worked better for me. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, if you uh, treat the tank and you wait three days and you still see cyano, I say treat the tank again. Don't do water change yet. Just put in more of the stuff and wait two more days, and then it'll be mm -hmm. gone. And the thing is, I think people are tricked. They look at their tank in the morning when they get up to get ready for work or school or whatever they're doing, and they don't see any cyanide. Like, oh, it's gone. I put the stuff in yesterday and it's gone. It's amazing. But while you're gone all day and the lights were on, it all comes back because that's what cyanide does. Mm -hmm. It appears in the light and it goes away in the dark. And that's why at night, when you look at your tank late at night, your sand probably looks nice and decent. But, mm -hmm. or early in the morning, it looks decent. And then during the daytime, it becomes hideous. So you need to actually let the medicine work its magic and you have to do a really big water change. And when we say big, a minimum of 25%. So if you have mm -hmm. a 100 gallon tank, you've got to change at least 25 gallons, maybe even more. And if you just change the water, then your protein skimmer will operate properly. And if you don't change enough water, if you're like, well, I only can do five gallons, then your protein skimmer is gonna be volcanoing nonstop. And then people will tell them, oh yeah, you shouldn't have used ChemiClean. That skimmer's not going to work for the next two months. Again, not true. If you are weeks. running a protein skimmer, you just need to let the protein skimmer export everything it can export. So if the cup mm -hmm. fills up in one minute flat, take the cup off, throw it in a bucket, put it back on, and let it fill for another minute. And keep doing that a few times until it's four minutes between it's full. And then finally, it's 15 minutes. And then it's 45 minutes. And then it's an hour. And then finally, it just operates like a normal skimmer again. So you might actually lose five, six, 10 gallons of water to the protein skimmer in that first six hours of turning it on. That's why I recommend you do this when you're gonna be with the tank. But if you'll just keep dumping the cup or let the cup drain into a bucket, that way you can have it export all the evil that's in the water and it'll settle down and you'll be right back in business. And during that mm -hmm. period while this is happening, turn off your top off. Don't let it automatically add fresh water or use your top off to automatically add it. salt water yeah exactly because if you're mm -hmm. let's say you took out a gallon of salt water through the collection cup Ooh, put in a gallon idea, of salt actually. water back in the tank but yeah you could top off a of salt water for that duration hmm. and let the skimmer that's drain a into a bucket or two or three buckets or whatever I, when yeah. my 280 had a bad cyano outbreak back in whatever it was 2009 i uh had the uh the collection cup draining into a bucket or no, I think I had to just carry the cup and dump it. And so I kept doing that and I was like, I wonder how much I'm gonna actually get rid of. So I didn't pour the buckets out. I lined them up by the sump and I just kept going and I filled a whole five gallon bucket. I filled a second five gallon bucket. I filled a third five gallon bucket to four gallons. So I had 14 gallons of skim made. And mm -hmm. then my skimmer settled down and operated right. And all I did while I was taking that water out was pouring in more salt water to replace. So the skimmer yep. was always at the same height. You don't want to like mm -hmm. wait for it to get low and dump in water. You just kind of, you need to kind of keep up with what's happening. So if it's exporting yeah. five gallons, you dump in five and keep going. Mm -hmm. And when it settles down, you're good to go, but you'll have the skimmer running the same day. You don't have to wait mm -hmm. weeks or your skimmer has to break in or <laughs> the stuff has to evaporate. None of that's true. You just need to let no. the skimmer remove it. No, that's fair. Or time will work it out eventually, but it will freak out for usually a good week unless you do something to export it quicker, like you're saying. Yeah. The bigger the water change, the less the skimmer will go nuts. Like when I did yeah. the uh, frag tank, that's a 60 gallon tank with a sump. And mm -hmm. I treated the tank and I had you know a fixed amount of salt water and I just started pumping out water. I was like, whatever. I pumped out the sump, I cleaned out the refugium, it was disgusting. I mean, like the whole tank needs a reset so badly. And uh, I ended up changing 40 gallons on a 60 gallon tank. And the cyan was gone the skimmer operated mm. perfectly for the moment I turned it on. I didn't have to do anything because <laughs> I changed I changed two thirds of my water. 
but yeah. uh, you know, I know not everyone can do that. Um, but if you're preparing, for, I mean, think about it. If you are treating a tank for cyano and the tank has to be without a protein skimmer for three days, because it's got to mm -hmm. work its magic, or even five, that means you have yep. three to five days to make plenty of salt water for this giant That's water true. change. It's not like, well, I don't have the room, or I don't have the time, or I don't have the, you know, I needed that water. It's like, that's not on the tank's fault. That's going to be up to you. You've got three to five days to amass a decent amount of salt water. I like the idea of putting an ATO in the salt water bucket, and then just yeah. have like a five gallon bucket for the skimmer, and just empty that, and it'll just keep on topping it off as it goes. Yeah. Keep it stable. And if you get really yeah. fancy, you put something in the bucket that warns you it's about to overflow with skimmate. <laughs> Yeah, this is <laughs> another true. sensor because if it maxes out at five and now it's overflowing, I mean, still your sump will be getting more salt water because you have that unlimited mm -hmm. supply, but you'll have yep. a wet floor. So you want to make sure you don't let that happen. This is true. I All like right, it. Let's go find another cool question. That was a good one. All right. That was a good one. That was a solid rabbit hole. I like it. Um. Manual, I use Microbacter 7 for my cyano issue, not for carbon dosing, just dumping in X mils close to my skimmer for four hours every day, and cyano is normal after a month. Good to know. I know so many people that dose Microbacter 7 like daily or weekly, and I haven't, but I'm going to try it on my frag tank because I still have some weird bacteria in there, and I'm curious if it will fix it or not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I only think of Microbacter 7 when someone mentions it. I, it's, mm -hmm. it's just one of those things I don't think about, just like Acropower. I just yep. don't think about it. And do I need a dose of amino acids? Would that have stopped all this death? I have no idea. I just don't know the answer to that. I was like, all right, you know, I have a gallon. I should hook it up to something. I just haven't done it. Throw it on a doser. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, I'm still scrolling through. There was a lot of questions, or I mean, a lot of talk earlier. And I always start at the top mm -hmm. working my way down. That's why we're always, I mean, with your show, you're like answering people instantly as it's happening, and I'm like always 20, 30 minutes behind. Those people have already left the show. They're off, you know, riding bicycles, and I'm like, oh, Steve, well, let me tell you the answer to your question. Steve's gone. I feel bad, but that's just Where's how Steve? this channel works. Uh, Anton, I heard Jake Adams, ammonia is not toxic to corals. Is this true? What do you think? I don't think they're very susceptible or a big issue at lower concentrations. I'm sure high enough that it's going to be an issue for anything. But in terms of like cycling a brand new tank, you could absolutely throw corals in right away. And a little bit of ammonia is not a big deal. Where fish, it, until your tank's cycled, it can actually burn their gills. So they're a lot more of an issue with cycling a brand new tank. But you can absolutely have corals in a brand new tank issue for you as long as your elk and everything else is stable. I do know somewhat about corals. Um... Not, I mean, I've got friends like uh, Eric who wrote an entire book about them, and he explains mm -hmm. their whole gastrointestinal system, which you know you never think about corals with digestion and all that. I would Hotel, think that ammonia could be risky for corals. That's why we tend to always make sure the tank is completely cycled. Mm -hmm. There will always be some ammonia in your tank because everything in your tank is peeing. It's always happening. Yeah, you know, your fish are peeing. But you're it, putting in food. It's just a mm -hmm. constant thing. There's always a. a a constant conversion of ammonia nitrite nitrate and we just don't really see the ammonia nitrite or nitrite is always zero after the mm. initial few weeks but uh like Devin was saying if the ammonia gets too high fish will definitely suffer first but i would not think that a tank that has a bunch of ammonia and it will have a bunch of happy corals i think that the corals would also show some misery as well so we want to make sure that we keep ammonia under control and one of the easiest ways is to use prime which is a product from seachem and it's completely mm -hmm. reef safe, and you can use a capful per 50 gallons to lock up ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, uh, mm -hmm. chlorine, chloramine. I mean, it locks up everything. It's a magical elixir. And Prime yeah. also comes in a powder form where you can mix up your own batch as needed, which is kind of neat, and some people have purchased it. And I think Mike or somebody in this chat knows what it's called. I always forget. It's like, I don't know, there's a name for what it is, the, the powder form mm -hmm. of Prime. Okay. I guess freshwater people probably use it because they do it for yeah. ponds and stuff. I still have a bottle from many moons ago in my freshwater days. It's probably, I don't know if it expires or not, but... It expires. So, Always get a new bottle yeah. every year. Every year, no matter what. Uh, I should toss my 
eight-year-old bottle probably. Yes, you should. Uh, (laughs) Okay, now if you don't have fish in your tank, you're not going to have much of an ammonia source. So that's the other consideration, right? If you have a big tank with coral and like one little fish is a very low ammonia source. If you, you know, pack it full, you're going to have a ton to deal with. So it needs to be cycled. But if it's just coral in the tank, you don't really have an ammonia source to cause an issue. So it's all these little considerations that play into the fact to it all. Josh's question is, what's the best way to dial in flow on a reactor when running a manifold? It seems like I have to crank the return up all the way. Um, well, this is going to be very hard to answer that question because I don't even know what kind of reactor you're talking about. We're talking about GFO, bio pellets, calcium no. reactor. It could yeah. be so many different kinds of media or even just carbon. Uh, carbon reactors can be very slow. It could be as slow as one gallon an hour, which is insane. But yes, that was actually written about and it's an excellent... It was an excellent article, it's on my website. I didn't write it. I got permission to republish it because the, what he wrote made so much sense to me. A calcium reactor, mine typically gets about 60 milliliters a minute because I use a Versa mm-hmm. dosing pump, so I know. Yep. GFO should be just enough to move the media slightly. I call it a moon quake. So it just tumbles, barely. it should not be doing this. So it should just I barely have, move. I have mm-hmm. a question. Yeah. I have. They say that GFO should tumble so it doesn't solidify. I've never, ever had it solidify on me, like ever. Is GFO that can solidify thing? based on alkalinity in the water. If the alkalinity gets too high, like if you run a low DKH, like 7 or something, you probably won't see it. But if you run a tank that's like 9, 10, 11, you might actually have it turn solid. And Julian Sprung <laughs> years ago said the simplest solution to keeping your GFO from turning solid like that is once a week, open the valve to put a puff of water through it and then reset it back. But Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone that does that because no one wants to put a puff through any kind of GFO because we don't want to send it flying into the system because it'll burn the gills of your fish. So the idea is that you dial it into that moon quake where it's barely moving and then you measure the output. And when the output coming out of a reactor no longer measures zero phosphate, it's time to replace the media. And that's Mm. something I don't think enough people do. I think they just put media in, they watch their phosphates come down, they're like, okay, mm-hmm. and then their faucets go up, like, oh, I need to replace the media, and they just put it in. Mm-hmm. But you could actually still have media that works by just slowing mm-hmm. the flow even slower through the media and measure again. And if it comes out zero, it's still good. And then, you know, mm-hmm. when it's coming out the same as what's going in, it's no longer good, and you have to replace it. And, you know, you guys know you have to rinse it really well. you got to make sure you don't send it yeah. into the tank. Some people drop it into floss so you can catch any of those fines so it doesn't get into mm-hmm. the system. But yeah, you never said I, which kind of reactor, so I can't really answer your question. But yes, you may, I, personally, I like to have two pumps. One's a return pump mm-hmm. and the other's a manifold pump. And the manifold pump runs at basically 100%, probably. I don't know, I haven't looked at my, my uh, mm-hmm. Eco Smart Live in a long time, but whatever the L1 is running at, it's pushing out water and then I have valves that go to the different things and I just twist them to what makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. Rather than it's this many gallons per hour. But if you run the apex and you hook up all the flow meters, you could actually say, I want this many gallons per hour moving through a pipe. And you could actually set mm-hmm. it that way. So, okay, 100% agree. Um, I originally split out reactors onto a different pump, mainly because as a reactor clogs, it will change the flow to your tank. And then your drains may not be silent. And it annoyed me tweaking my drains every few weeks. So I always had on a separate one. That being said, I have it all running off the L2 now on my water box tank. Um, now, ideally, you should have you know ha- a valve for basically every chunk of your manifold, right? So you're adjusting how much comes off of your teeter tear pump, since I think you said it was off one pump. And then, again, each little tap has its own little valve, so you can tweak each one. And that's yeah. the only proper way to do it. Otherwise, if you're trying to control your whole manifold just from your one-off return pump, you're changing the flow with everything, which yeah. doesn't always scale properly. No, I agree with you completely. Mm-hmm. Uh, he asked some more questions. It's all kind of the same topic. Um, I'm just going to throw mm-hmm. them on the screen. Is it ideal to slow down the main return pump uh, just to slow down the reactor? Um, it's the yeah, reverse. It's need lo- more flow through the reactor and we're restricting the main return to the tank. As long uh, as you have a pan full of power heads in your tank, those are providing the main flow to your tank. So you don't yeah. need high turnover from your tank to your sump. Right. So if that's the only way you can get more flow to your reactors, I mean, just turn down the tank flow a bit and you'll be fine. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I uh, On mine, like I said, I have one pump just for the return that just, it's always the same rate all the time. Yeah. Matter of fact, mine is plugged into power monitoring on the Apex and it sends me a mm-hmm. notification if it's less than the wattage it normally gets. So like, yeah. you know, whatever, my, my tank's always fine, but if for some reason the pump's not running 
where it should be, I get notifications saying it's not using as many watts or it's using too mm -hmm. many. It's a, it's a really weird alert, and I only get it during ice storms and generator moments, you know, and I can just yeah. make an adjustment. But it's nice to actually have that in place, and I can also do it for the Vortex. If the Vortex yeah. are not within range, it'll tell me, and I, that would like, oh, I forgot to turn the Vortex back on, and I hit a button and give it power again, and boom, I have you know flow in the tank. So power You're monitoring actually, can be nice and useful in those situations. I'm actually looking at my trends of mine. No, mm -hmm. oh, MP60 doesn't help. It goes up and down as they ramp yeah. up and down. Yeah, that's you have to find that sweet spot. That's the thing, because if you do a lot of different yeah. flow rates and you do, media, uh, what is it called, uh, nutrient export mode, and then yeah. you do pulse mode and you do all these things, your numbers jump around. And I keep my abyss pump at 80% all the time, mm -hmm. which I think I said was like 165 watts. So I told the, the uh, Apex to notify me if it gets below like 120 watts. And so when the generator was falling apart and breaking on me oh. during the storm, it kept saying, oh my God, the Abyss isn't getting enough power. And it was beeping. And I was like, what is that sound? And the Abyss actually said on the screen, danger, low voltage. I'm like, huh? And that's when I started reading the 832 information from the Apex, which is their, mm -hmm. their power brick. And it told me, you know, you're using 87 watts. You're using 83 watts. You're using 81 watts. You're using 78 watts. I'm like... I'm not going to make it through the night. It was literally going down, down, down. And I kept slowing the pump down to keep away from the alarm. But yeah. it was getting worse. And that's why I ended up having to borrow another generator in an emergency. So. Yeah. Well, hey, you lucked out that someone like two miles away from you had a generator. For yes. You. Like that is like. No, that's insane. Amazing. And it was yeah. a miracle. Literally. I mean, I sat on my chair. I'd done everything I could to keep the tank alive. And mm. my generator, which is my backup, blew up. And then people are like, oh, just get an inverter to your truck and put a power head and a heater in your tank. I'm like, that will not work for 450 gallons. There's just, I need power. I need juice. It's just not going to cut it. And I mean, all my battery backups, all my Ecotech battery backups had all failed. Everything had failed and the generator blew up. And I just thought, that's it. I'm going to lose my reef too. I mean, that's, this week has been, you know, it started with Caitlin's death and then it was right into that storm and then power outage with who knows how long it'll take to get power again, which is guesstimated four to five days and i was like i'm just gonna watch my reef die too mm -hmm. and i put that post out and my friends were sharing my post and got word out to everyone and through phone calls and texts and and uh, making new friends with people i didn't even know i started lining up possibilities like i said at 12 30 at night and i just was thinking and i mean my house was pitch dark i'm mm -hmm. operating on battery on my phone you know <laughs> this this was the end you know and uh it was remarkable that that person two miles away had it. And mm -hmm. it was zero degrees outside, which is for you mm -hmm. guys like minus 18. So it was Cold. completely frozen, ice, snow, and people that were volunteering me a generator were an hour and a half away by car on a good day. And there's yeah. no way I could drive all night on that icy snow and get back any time before the reef would be dead. There's no way. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I if they're an hour and a half away or two hours away on a good day, in that storm, it probably would have been three hours each direction, plus loading the generator, unloading the generator, getting the generator to start and get the tank going. So my tank would have been without power for another six hours, and it was already out of power for an hour or two when I put mm -hmm. out a post on Facebook asking for help. And that's just yeah. too long for this size system with the sand bed and that many fish and... Mm -hmm. Dave had a generator, which is a miracle. And, uh, that is. And when, you know, someone, you know, someone came out of the woodwork on Facebook and said, I just want to buy that person dinner for helping Mark with his tank. And he showed up on that thread. And he goes, it's not necessary. Mark actually lent me his generator years ago. I was merely returning the favor. It was so long ago, I didn't remember helping him. <laughs> so he actually helped me back, and he was two miles away, which means I yeah. could be at his house in 10 minutes and back, mm -hmm. you know, in 10, 15 and then, of course, once I got the generator running, then I had to go drive out on that frozen stuff again to go get gasoline. Gas. And the gas stations mm -hmm. had no power, so they couldn't pump gas, or they couldn't run a credit card because there was no power. Yeah. So I had to find a gas station that was open, and I was exhausted. I was mentally, emotionally exhausted and dealing with all this stupidity, and it was really aggravating. And, of course, you had people saying, well, why don't you have a backup generator for your generator? Who does that? Who buys no two kidding. generators in case one fails? So... Ugh.
Anyway, oh, I don't even have one. I I've <laughs> contemplated is that Costco like a week ago and I saw one and after like talk with you so much I was like one day I'll have to get one. It's so nice to have it. I mean, I when agree. the power goes I mean the problem is where I live across the street all those houses have power always because their houses are in front of or behind them is a business. And I mm. guess businesses get power no matter what where houses don't. And so our side of the street would always be dead and they'd always have power. They're out there having a party and I'm over here with a flashlight trying to find a candle. And I'm just like, God, it's so unfair. And, you know, yes, we could run just, an extension cord across the street. I was going to say, I had to see you yeah. with like a 200-foot extension cord from your You name. could. <laughs> <laughs> you could. But I just Desperate like times. owning a generator. And I actually bought yeah. the generator, my first generator I bought, three weeks after I bought the 280. I got the 280 yeah. and I bought a generator because I want to keep the 280 alive. And yep. I went years of that one, and then finally it broke during a storm, and I replaced it with a, a new one. And that one was in great shape, but then I guess something finally happened. I don't even know what. It, like, threw a drive shaft or something. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it took blew a up. Photo of mm-hmm. Costco one to look at. That's up the one I got. Good. Furman, right? Yeah. Fireman? Furman? Yeah. Is it good? It was 200 bucks off. I don't know if the sale's over yet. Probably. Dang, it is. Too mm-hmm. late now. Well, Back to expensive. I'll tell you this. <laughs> uh... Terrence keeps telling us about a brand that Harbor Freight sells. And it's mm-hmm. inexpensive, and it's an inverter generator. And he mm-hmm. says it's much better than a regular generator because it won't mm-hmm. burn up your low-voltage DC-powered pumps. And he keeps yeah. pushing that on me, like, Mark, you need to get the inverter generator, where I just bought this giant one. And I'm like, you know what? I only use a generator in an emergency, and I've mm-hmm. never, ever lost gear to a generator. Mm-hmm. I mean... When this thing happened and my generator basically exploded next to the house, I mean, it went bang, bang. There was like lightning over my tank with the lights going crazy. And then everything went dark. Even then, I didn't have to replace ballast. I didn't have to replace lights. I didn't have to replace anything. I got lucky. I might have, mm-hmm. but I haven't even verified it. I might have burned up an EB-8, you know, the energy bar. I don't even know. Yeah. I need to plug it in and put an Aquabus cable in and see if maybe it works. Because mm-hmm. I thought it was that, it ended up that whole circuit, the breaker had been destroyed, and I replaced that, and the whole that circuit came back on the fish room. So maybe the EB8 <laughs> works. Maybe. But test yeah, that was out. that was a very dramatic night. <laughs> and yeah. when I went out there and pulled on the rope, it just went spinning, and it had the sound <laughs> of metal rubbing metal, like. Uh. I was like, no, bringing that back to life. It was done. That hurts. Okay, yeah. question, Jim Stickles. Question to mm-hmm. both of you. How long can you stay away from your tank before you get a tank sitter? I am very bad about this. I tell my tank sitter I'm leaving town and I expect him to show up the same day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if I'm gone two days, I expect him to visit for two days. Uh, that's how I've mm-hmm. always been. There mm-hmm. has been the rare occasion where I will go out of town for a day and not tell him. But mm-hmm. usually I'd rather he have stopped by, fed the fish, just put eyeballs on it. It's just, yep. it's a, it's a, I'm fortunate to have that relationship with this person. Uh, I mm-hmm. always tell everyone, you need a Bobby. He's awesome. <laughs> and I was like, if you don't have a Bobby, you need a Bobby. I mean, Bobby's great. And uh, everyone wants Bobby. Bobby has a lot of friends because he's so smart and he can fix <laughs> anything. And he's mm-hmm. helped me with a lot of stuff over the years. And he has always been a great tank sitter to me. And I, I'm very lucky nice. that I've had him as long as I've had. You know, hopefully it'll never end. Who knows? Yeah. But, uh, no, it's really important to have a tank sitter, someone that knows mm-hmm. your system intimately and can take over when you're not available. And just, like, he one time texted me when I was at Macna and said, yeah, I had to fix your calcium reactor. And I was like, what do you mean fix it? He goes, well, I had to take it completely apart and fix it. <laughs> and I Thank was you. just like, you don't even <laughs> own a calcium reactor. He goes, yeah, I know. I was like, how did you know how mine works? He goes, I figured Learning it out. on the job. And First. I'm just like, wow. But, I mean, this is what he does for a living. He goes into a hospital and fixes the AC, or he fixes an MRI, or he fixes a whatever. He's really mechanically inclined, and he'll take a car apart and then fix whatever's wrong. And he's got a garage full of tools. I mean, he's really smart. And, uh, yeah, I, I was blown away when he told me he took apart and rebuilt my calcium reactor from scratch and got it running. Wow. Well, I'm out of town, you know, 1,500 miles away, oblivious that there's even anything going on. Yeah, that's crazy. That's yeah. that's impressive. That's a good friend to have for a tank yeah. sitter. Everyone needs a bomb. Um, what about you? What yes. do you do? Just make your wife do uh, it? 
Well, yeah, if I'm just gone, she'll look after it. If we're both gone, usually, like, my dad will come stay at the house because we have the dog, too, right? So he needs a little more attention. Yeah. If it was just the tank, like, if it was, like, two days for the weekend, I'd probably say the tank's fine. I mean, realistically, I have went away and put the auto feeder on it, but I normally mm-hmm. feed Frozen and Noreen. That's, like, literally all I ask the tanks yeah. are to do. The rest of it's automated. So I just make sure the skimmer cup's empty, make sure the RODI is full and all that jazz. But Yeah. Yeah. Usually I have a tank sitter if it's anything more than like a day or two. The beauty of having an auto top off and having mm-hmm. an auto feeder and having an apex controller to where you can check on your tank remotely is yep. wonderful. And that mm-hmm. helps immensely. But having someone walk in the door and say, that sounds weird, or they see your aquascape just fell over, you know, and just say, oh, yeah. something happened. I think your, your sea hair knocked over these corals or whatever, you know. They can mm-hmm. handle that moment. They can kind of get things like I had a, I had this really big tiger cowrie, the size of an avocado, just a big yep. huge snail. It would just push the hammer coral into the sea bay anemone, and the anemone's yep. like, Ugh. and then I pull the hammer out, and half the heads are dead. You know, because it got stung to death yep. by an anemone. I mean, that's that's oh. exactly what it is, and that was so annoying. And eventually, and you know, but it was my sea hair. I mean, my uh, mm-hmm. tiger tail. What I call it, my. Oh. Uh, Cowry. Money carry? Leopard cowry. Is that what it is? I'm trying to remember yeah. what it is. Tiger spot. Tiger cowry. Well, it's a huge cowry with spots. Okay. And uh, that thing would do this from time to time. And he went everywhere mm-hmm. and he was beautiful and he was gorgeous. And one day he was gone. He just died overnight and kind of solved the problem for me. But while he lived, I let him do what he does. Just like Jack is going to do what she wants in this house. And if she tears something up, I just deal with it because she's a dog. She doesn't know better. You know, obviously, I don't want her to destroy things, but if she does get into something, so be it. And the same thing with something that's in my reef. If it knocks something over, I'll do what I can to secure that item. But, you know, mm-hmm. there's a big, giant, strong snail in your tank that pushes things over. <laughs> you just have to accept you own a bulldozer. I <laughs> have, have lost many up. corals to freaking snails knocking yeah. something over, and then the coral just takes up the one beside us. like, ah. Right. Thanks, snail. Thanks. So that happens. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Odiles, thank you so much yep. for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Let's see, does this show up? Why is it showing up? There we go. Ah, there we go. Nice. And then Lamont did so as well. Thank you so much. Look at that. Whoop, whoop. 1999. I like that. Nice. It's like the guy told me about the UV for my AC system. Mm-hmm. 695. I'm like, can't you just say $700? <laughs> Six nine 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 nine. nine. <laughs> ah. Man, but it makes it you. sound that smidge cheaper. It's just ridiculous. It's only a, it starts with a six, not a seven. Come on now. Think my web developer six. told me to change all the pricing on my website. You know, everything is five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, forty-five dollars. Yeah. He says it looks sketchy. It needs to say thirty-nine ninety-nine. Like I hate that. I said, you know what? People understand that thing is forty bucks. I made an extra penny. You know, it's like, <laughs> I just can't stand it. Because, oh, it just, it's just a whole thing. I'm like, I know, I've hated it my whole life. I really don't want it on my website. So, mm-hmm. I, uh, that's just what that's it is. That's funny. And well, Paul, it's the, thing. It makes no difference. the old reefer, he also did a super chat. Look at all these super chats whoop, just whoop. sliding into my messenger. Pounds, too. It's in oh, pounds. Oh, oh. I know, I have to go to the bank and convert it now. <laughs> I walk in, <laughs> I've got 10 pounds. <laughs> Can I please cash in my super chat? <laughs> That'd be great. That would be What's funny. the conversion rate for a Bitcoin? Oh my gosh, Let's like 70 see. grand or something crazy. All right, Glenn asks the question, I have a green plate coral, which was vibrant green, but slowly losing its bright green to a dull color. It's not turning white. It's placed in a low area, and the other corals are growing fine with color. Plate corals, which is typically Montipura, Capricornus, um, needs magnesium. And I recommend you keep your magnesium at 1400 ppm. If your magnesium is like 1260, 1280, it's usually not enough and that coral would lose color. It also could be your lights are too intense or they're on too long and it's kind of fading the coral, but you said it's down low, right? Didn't I read that here? Let's see. Slowly, isn't it right? I think so. Placed low area. Yeah, it's down low in the tank. So it probably isn't getting hit with a ton of light unless there's some crazy, I don't know, you might be running LEDs and you might have some crazy diode that's just nuking that one core and you can move it over six inches and it might be happy. But 
I would look at magnesium first, and then I would look at your lights and make sure you're not running the lights too long and just exhausting that coral. You said the other corals mm -hmm. are colorful, so I kind of feel like it's to one thing, and I kind of feel like this is gonna be a magnesium thing, but you'll have to double check. Mm -hmm. Yep, that or too much light. I concur. Yeah. I concur against that. All right, let's see. Robert Porman, $20 super chat. Woo, love you guys. Thanks for the love, Robert. Gao Gao says, I have to cut two inch and a half holes in my acrylic top, 25 millimeter thick, any tips? I'm getting spare piece to test. Spare um, chunk of acrylic to test drill. What, what? Spare chunk of acrylic to test drill. Oh, Any tips on drilling piece. a hole in the tank? See, I saw piece, I'm thinking piece. Um, yeah. See, I believe it when you use the word piece. <laughs> Give piece a chance. Uh, 25 <laughs> millimeters might be an inch thick, right? I feel like that's right. Isn't it 2.5 centimeters per inch? 25 so, millimeters is 0 0.98. Yeah, it's basically an inch. Yeah, it's an inch. So you're cutting yep. two inch and a half holes in the acrylic that's one inch thick. You're going to want to use a hole saw. And you can either use a cordless drill or a powered drill with a cord. You don't need to use water. You don't have to do anything to cool it off necessarily. You don't have to put oil on it or anything like that. And you don't put a lot of pressure on it, but you don't do it like you do when you're cutting glass. So you are gonna push on it, but you're not gonna like ram on it. And you are just gonna drill right through and it, it's an inch thick. So that might take you a minute to go through. What I like to do is I drill, guys, I drill like quarter inch and three eighths. I don't, you know, what you're doing is three times the thickness. When I drill through, with a hole saw, it has to be a brand new one because you want it to be nice and sharp. This is the same hole saw they used to put holes in do for doorknobs on doors, okay? And it doesn't have to be made for plastics, it doesn't have to be made for wood, it just is that type. And I like the kind with a nice big arbor, you know, that's you know, something I can use a million times for the rest of my life. You might want to buy one that you can use once. The problem is the once kind, they're very hard to get the acrylic out of because it's all one piece. Where the That's one with the arbor, difference. you can take the blade off, you can knock the piece mm -hmm. of acrylic out, put the, ar the blade back onto the arbor, connect it to your drill again. But I drill it, and then I remove it and kind of clean out the channel a little bit or chip out some little bits, or, or even run the blade backwards a little bit. It, those are some tricks I do. But you really should be able to put that hole through the acrylic in about a minute and a half. Um, probably going in and out a few times, kind of like, when you're pulling the bit back out slightly as you're drilling, some shavings will kind of fly out. That's how I clean out the channel and then I go back in and I just kind of do this repetitive in and out motion to remove acrylic and not let it heat and melt. Because if you just keep spinning and pushing, it's gonna melt and congeal on the blade and the blade will, the teeth will be all embedded with this melted plastic and it can't cut. So. You, the other choice is to drill from both sides because that hole saw will have a drill bit through the middle, that's the starting point, and it will come through before the hole saw does. You know, it penetrates. So now that the hole has gone through, you could actually go from the inside and go straight through that hole and come from the other side and meet. And then one of the things mm -hmm. I like to do when I'm all done, I like to put the drill, you know, I take the, the acrylic out of the, the hole saw so it's empty. Um, I might let it cool off for a little bit first, and then I put it in the hole and I turn it on in reverse and I just back the drill out and it kind of basically sands it smooth as it's coming out. And I might work that in and out a couple times in reverse to kind of just clean that hole. Or you can hand sand with some sandpaper. Nice, beautiful. So take one your time. Inch. Yeah. One inch, basically. Nice yeah. sharp blade, take your time. Don't melt the acrylic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, you, uh, if it gets too hot and it's melting, you should back off and give it a minute. But, you know, it's not like you have to run the drill to slow speed, like a variable speed drill or something like that, and you don't have to be at a slow rate. It, like, it's just not like drilling glass. It's just completely different. And I just basically drill. <laughs> I go out, I pull the trigger full strength, and I just go. But I, I, like I said, I pull back on it to let some shavings fly out, and I keep going. Um, mm -hmm. That's how I've done it, and it seems to work really well. Nice. Um, Emmanuel asked me, did you move the blue hippo tang to the anemone tank again? No, I did not. Uh, the blue tang was moved to the frag system. And then mysteriously one day it was dead. So after all those years of everyone saying, how dare you have it in a tank full of tentacles, it died in a tank with no tentacles. So I don't know what happened. It was just in a giant blob of gel. Some kind of clear gelatinous, yeah. crazy bacterial balloon which I removed in its entirety and threw Dory away. 
Poor Dory. Yeah, that was weird. Yep. What coral or fish have you cared for that showed the largest growth over the time you've cared for it? What's your oldest fish or coral from Keith or Kenneth? Me? Yeah, um, you. I guess both of us, but you first. Well, I've had this hammer coral since 2003. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you can't see it. It's off the camera. Solo. That hammer coral, that's, I've been losing heads on, but I've had this coral since 2003. It's about half of what it was. A lot of heads have died. Um, but there's mm -hmm. a lot, I mean, this brown polyp, button polyps, they're the kind that actually are toxic that could kill people, right? Those have been with me since 2003 as well. Um, and, you know, you talk about largest, I mean, this thing here is a uh, cactus pavona that I grew from a little tiny piece, one of these little chips, and it grew in this giant colony. Now I just, every time I use a cleaning magnet, I break off pieces and there's like 10 pieces on the sand. And I've been growing that for like eight or nine years. There's actually a lot of things in my tank that have been around for a very long time. I have some Blue Ridge coral as well that, again, came from that tank from 2003. A lot of stuff came from that tank. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's kind of cool when you can have stuff that goes on and on and on. Swap size. Uh, my, old, <laughs> my oldest fish, actually, my second saltwater fish I ever bought was a clownfish, which I still have now. And it's actually in the tank beside me. So I've had that guy for seven, eight years now. Mm-hmm. And oldest coral, I don't know. I definitely have some coral that were from my original tank. So, yeah, I've had a bunch. But clownfish is by far the oldest one I've had. I have two starfish I... from 2002. Mm -hmm. I have the Nassau tang, Spock. She's from 2004. And the purple tang is from 2004. So these are all my oldest uh, reeflings. Mm -hmm. Nice. And Martin then someone Jackman. asked me here... How is Spock doing since the checkup? Well, the checkup was done a long time ago, actually. It was done a year ago. And COVID happened, and the vet stopped visiting. Actually, I, I sent her the video when it was released, and she loved it. She's like, ah, I'm going to put it on my website. She was really happy with it. And she said she stopped doing house calls during COVID, and the only appointment she would do would be ponds, where she'd go in a backyard by herself with no other humans to check on mm -hmm. those fish. She would not even go there if there was another person there. And now yeah. she's starting to get back to visiting homes, and she asked if I'd like her to come check Spock again. Uh, mm -hmm. I really want her to. Um, Spock's eye has continued to get worse, but it doesn't look inflamed. It doesn't look... Uh, it's not itching her. She's not scratching it. It's just super glaucoma, basically, you know, for lack of a better dis uh, description. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other eye has a little bit of a haze to it, unfortunately. See, the thing is, I think she wants to get a melon baller and scoop it out. And I'm not happy with that. I'm if there's if the fish is not suffering, if it's just blind and still mm -hmm. eating and swimming and content, then I don't want to touch yeah. it. But if yeah. she was like, if it was like, like something out of uh, Halloween, you know, the bloodshot eyeball or yeah. something tearing across the face, I'm like all right, fair enough, we have to have you know some kind of vet intercede. But basically, she just sees with one side and doesn't see out the other. I can I watch when I put food in. She kind of doesn't notice it, and then she turns around and says, "Go!" Oh! And she sees the food and she goes crazy. So it's yeah. clearly it's obscured her vision. And you know, I would have loved it if they could have done LASIK and peel it back, mm -hmm. clean it out, and put it back down. And boom, she's back. That would be awesome. But I don't even know mm -hmm. if that's even a thing. That might be a I thing don't. in my head. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we have fish LASIK machines yet. Right. One day, maybe. I know. Especially maybe, like maybe. you saw in the video, the fish can only be out of water for one minute at a time. Now, LASIK mm -hmm. is quick. They go in, sure. they go, and then they, you know, so you've got 20 20 vision. But, yeah. you know, they're used to human eyeballs, and fish eyeballs are a little bit different. A little so, smaller. Yeah. Miniaturized versions. Raul, $50 super chat. Woohoo. Wow. Awesome for let's talk about reef. Need to go ahead and see the found how the foundation repair looks. <laughs> foundation well, fund, maybe buddy. what I could probably do in some f future video I roll out is append to the end of it, like some of the foundation mm -hmm. stuff. And that way you yep. guys can hit stop if you can't stand it. Or if you're curious, you could see the insanity that it was. But for me to mm -hmm. just put a video up about foundation work <laughs> probably will get me a lot of thumbs down on the Mila's Reef channel. Even though you know, it was being done under a reef tank, but it wasn't, that wasn't the focal point. The focal point was mm -hmm. fixing the house, and the reef just had that, to survive it. So Mark's tank is so big and heavy, his house was sinking, so he had to reinforce it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, people keep saying that. 
they keep the saying, did your tank do it? I'm like, no. Matter of fact, I had to tell them, look, this tank weighs this much. This stand weighs this much. This much water weighs this much. Then you've got the frag tank, which is nothing. And then you've got the mm -hmm. 2,500 pounds of salt water in the 265 poly tank. All yeah. in one room. But that room is on the foundation that's concrete that I put four more inches on top of. So it's eight inches of concrete for that whole room. Yep. So in theory, it shouldn't be going anywhere. And they mm -hmm. pretty much lifted everything everywhere except where the tank was. Like I said, it was ground zero. I'm kind of glad that was their center point. And it wasn't yep. like, wow, we got to lift all the, the sides of the tank or something insane. That'd have been crazy. Yeah, that'd be a little sketchier. No, yeah. It's a good thing it's in the middle of your house. Yeah. The, the center of the pendulum, right? So, I mean, minimal exactly. impact to it, considering. Yeah. Uh, Kevin says to you, Devin, FFTasia works amazingly well for me. Took out all the big suckers and added peppermint shrimp and took out the little ones. Beauty. Yeah. Uh, I asked peppermint my... shrimp do work, but they may start working on things you care about, too. It's just something to keep in yeah. mind. You know, they'll go eat the aptasias, yes, but they might like to pick the food right out of your fungias or your acans or, you know, scolies or whatever it is you got. So you kind of have to decide how much you want peppermint uh, shrimp in your tank. Well, long term. The thing is, I have a hawkfish, and I know eventually the peppermint shrimp will disappear. Yes. So will they eat all my Aptasia before they come long-term expensive snacks? Yeah. I kind of feel bad, though, knowing that. But at the same time, I mean, it is nature. I don't know. It's always these mixed mixed feelings on this all. Yeah. I'm hoping the copper band does puts a useful dent in it, so we'll see. He's uh, a pretty Pop fish, Reef. so see the way. Pop Reef asked this question. Do you guys listen to the podcast Reef Therapy? You might have touched on this earlier, Devin, but I don't remember hearing you say it. It says, quite a lot of controversial opinions on what and what do you say. Corals in the tank in one day or don't ever feed frozen, just flakes. No, I have not followed that one. Um, and as you guys know me after all this time, I tend to stick to the basics. I definitely am not into, into controversy and debate. And I oftentimes will tell you, unplug all the extra things and get down to the most simple system to get it back on track rather than add one more tool, add one more thing to fix a problem. So mm -hmm. if someone said, put corals in a tank after one day, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't recommend it. If someone said, never use frozen, just use flake, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I, I like to change it up. In my early days, yep. before I knew anything, when I knew nothing, I even then, flake one day, pellet another day, and it was different flavor pellets. So they Mix got some up. vegetarian on Tuesday, and they got some omnivore on Wednesday, and then there was flake, and then maybe some frozen uh, brine shrimp or something, because I knew nothing at that point. But I knew... I don't have the same food every single day, so why wouldn't I change it up mm -hmm. for my fish? Variety is a spice of life. Um, yeah. Pellets are my lazy food. Like, if I'm in a rush or I don't have time to, like, do frozen, I just throw a handful of pellets in the tank. Mm -hmm. And then, but most days I do frozen at night and nori in the morning is kind of my general staple. Like, 90% yeah. of the time, I'd say. But variety is good, right? Everyone has different diets. It's good to mix up once in a while. Different food items have different nutrition to it. So, I personally like frozen. Um, and I feed it a lot uh the other what was the other half of the question around adding corals right away uh the other um, one's I flake food and the other one's yeah or, and corals after one day i think i have had okay i've told the story a few times at one point when i still had a 30 gallon tank and i was waiting for my custom tank i bought a couple like big green slimer and something else a couple of these big acros off somebody and they were physically too big to fit in my little 30 gallon tank so they survived for over a month in a five gallon bucket with water, a power head, and a heater. And I had a little XR15 above that bucket. And you know, every few days I'll do a little water change on it just to get those elements in there and they're fine. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely think corals are fine in just water because you don't have ammonia and all the toxic stuff that fish poop and stuff adds in there because it's just sterile water in the coral. So the only waste would be what the coral gives off, which is minimal. Mm -hmm. So personally, I think, yes, you can 100% do it if it's just coral, if you're adding a bunch of fish and stuff, in a very large water volume with a little bit of fish, you're probably fine, but just don't add too many fish because you're adding too many, too much ammonia before that bacteria population builds up. So for a new person, I mean, just don't do it. But if you've done it for a while, I'd <laughs> say you can get away with it. I mean, think about the tanks they set up instantly for trade shows. Yeah. It was a dry tank. They set it up, they threw the corals in it, and then they sold them as fast as they humanly could. I wonder why. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, and you know stuff doesn't sell. They take it back and they put it back in the tank at home. Mm -hmm. But you know, 
what is normal for life. That's like, I want flowers in my garden for a party on Saturday. I can go buy a bunch of stuff in pots and put it everywhere and I'll have this beautiful garden, but will those flowers live long term? Will they be okay? You know, do I have to go transplant them all? I mean, see, that's the thing. With the corals, can they handle day one and just be fine? It's possible some will hang in there. It's possible some won't. And it depends what you're talking about too, what they're talking about. Are they talking about mushrooms? Mm -hmm. Are they talking about home wrecker acro? You know, that's a completely yeah. different thing and one's gonna live and one's probably gonna die really fast because it costs more. So <laughs> Caveat, I, I wouldn't hesitate to do it with a $20 coral, but a $20 <laughs> coral would be yeah. a little more cautious. Yeah, exactly. Now, All right, so alive and thrive are also different things, right? Yes. It's not, in my opinion, it's not going to die, but it's not going to thrive and take off right. right away until the tank stabilizes. So that's, that's another yeah. chunk of it. Yeah, and it really takes months. You talked about your tank that's been running now, what did you say, for a year? Yeah. And you said the words in, earlier in the stream that it has stabilized. And that's after yeah. a year. You know, those corals yeah. that are in there right now, they wouldn't have gone in on day one, even if there was no fish in that tank. You would take your time. Oh, oh many of them. No, many of them did go in right away. But, but, but they were little. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, the corals mm -hmm. were in there, mm -hmm. but they weren't, like, taking off. Like, right. they very slowly puddled and grew. Right now, yeah. I can go look at it week to week, and I'll see the little nubs changing. Like, I can see a visible right. difference week yeah. to week, where you barely notice anything for the first, like, year, right? It takes... Right time for a tank to settle and stabilize and if i don't average it's you know eight months 12 months you know yeah. somewhere around that year point where a tank yeah. just kind of gets in its groove yeah all right we got a question here christian coral says can you help my skimmer pump broke today so i don't have a skimmer connected and now i don't have my co2 scrubber and i have caulk washer in my top off container will my tank suffer until i can get a new pump uh, i wouldn't say it would suffer i think that you can get the skimmer running whenever you can get it running preferably mm -hmm. sooner than later. Uh, you don't need to worry about you running a CO2 scrubber every single day of your life. You probably didn't have one initially and your tank was okay. Um, mm -hmm. I run a reef without a CO2 scrubber and I won't even bring fresh air in my house. So I say Steam that your tank, your tank will be okay. <sighs> <laughs> I also am here alone with a dog. I don't have 50 people breathing around my tank. But mm -hmm. uh, no, your tank should be okay. Caulk washer will help to buffer up your pH um, it also is being added automated-wise. It's being added based on evaporation. So your evaporation could be higher or lower depending on what's going on in your area weather-wise, barometric pressure-wise, storm-wise. You know, when things are really humid, we evaporate less. When things are really dry, we evaporate a lot. When we evaporate a lot, your top-off runs more frequently. You're dumping more caulk washer in your tank, which could spike your pH. So it's really good to know how much is being added per day or be able to limit how much is being added per day and maybe like if it's a super dry time of year and your top off needs to come on a lot maybe pour in some ro water in conjunction mm -hmm. with letting it top off some caulk washer too so it like for example let's say your tank needs two gallons of water a day but you know two gallons of caulk washer is too much for your tank so you dump in one gallon of ro water and you let it top off the other gallon and that way you're not spiking your tank and then yes, you'll get your skimmer running again, you'll get your CO2 scrubber running again, and everything should be fine, and your livestock should be, they probably won't even know what happened. You're probably more yeah, worried so than they are. How I read that is you're more worried about your pH than anything. Um, if your pH is 7.9 instead of 8.2 for a few days, it's not the end of the world. Your curls will right. still be fine. Um, now, just make sure your elk and all your other stuff is stable, right? Because I'm assuming you're dosing or you're supplementing some other method. Now, with Adding kelk wasser is also going to add calcium alkalinity to your water, so just make sure you're not spiking your levels up. That's the biggest thing I'd say while you're in your temporary setup mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you don't open doors and windows, I bet you have 800 to 1200 ppm CO2, possibly higher in your house when it's three to 400 outside. Yeah. Do you have a CO2 meter? Have you ever checked what your house levels I don't. are? I no? I like not knowing. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. That's yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really true. It's true. Um, I don't know what it is. I just, you know, I just believe my pH probe. I don't even care what the tank pH is. It always says it's like 8.0 to 8.3 or 8.1 to 8.3. Mm -hmm. I haven't calibrated that probe in forever. It's sort of like my new nitrate kit that says my nitrates are nice and low. It's nice to hear a nice number. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Um, I probably should double check <laughs> that one and just kind of verify. 
the feel good series of test kits that just yeah. gives you t- like 10 to 20 percent lower volume. these are the ones i use on camera no i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> there was a guy that did a test years ago on his cha- on his his uh youtube and it, this was not a live stream this was a edited video and he said this is how you use the kit and he did his test and the test was terrible the water was really bad and then he mm. just looks at the camera and says we're good <laughs> <laughs> and everyone called him out on it. I was like, dang. I mean, I wouldn't have used tank water if I really wanted a were good test. I would have tested brand new salt water or something and said, it's good. Or I would have said, like, in my, one of my test kit videos that I did, mm-hmm. I said, well, there's my nitrates or my alkaline is too low. I just said, so, yeah, now I know. You know, I mean, without a is. test kit, you wouldn't know. So just like you asked about the CO2 level in my house, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, by the way, the generator I got has mm-hmm. some kind of failsafe built in if the CO2 levels get too high, it turns itself off. I'm not sure if I'm happy about that because if I want a generator to run, <laughs> I don't want well, it to turn itself off. I don't want and, that kind of AI for my reef tank. <laughs> and that's why they say run it outside and not inside your tiny shed because yeah. it will turn itself off. <laughs> I know. It's like... Just leave the door open. Yeah. Whew. I agree. Yeah, that would suck. You just By the way, we the have 190 is. people on here with this live stream right now. It's pretty good. It's a long one, nice, too. Nice little crowd. Yeah, I know. You're like, can't Three we hours. stop, Mark? I got things to do. <laughs> I never it's told you video. we'd end it. I just okay. said we're going to do one, and you <laughs> didn't know. You did not ask the one question, so when does it end? <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as these, uh, what do you call it, the uh, super chats come in, we can keep going all day. No, I'm, joking, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm How joking. much reef tank can you handle? <laughs> Let's see. I'm looking for anything else in here. I'm scrolling down. I hate missing questions. This is true. Uh, uh, Chris Noves okay. says, I started using Red Sea AB+. Devin, do you use AB+. Randomly. I have some. Okay. And Good. I probably remember to use it maybe once a week. Maybe says, once every few weeks. Some weeks. A couple times a week. Very random. Not consistent at all. <laughs> he says, <laughs> worked really well with improved coral growth and health. Any experience with it? So this is completely your question because I have zero experience with it. So talk ah, to us about your random dosing and random growth. <laughs> so I, I do have some amino acids on a doser. It is the Restore, I think it's called, or no, or re, the Brightwell one that's for helping like frags. For whatever reason, I decided that would be a fun one to dose. So I dose, I think, three or four mils of that per day, and it's supposed mm-hmm. to help corals recover. So interestingly enough, I have that one dosing to my return pump chamber. So I dose a few mils of that a day. Um, I do have AB plus as well, chilling in my little mini fridge, but I don't dose it consistently. It's very random. Um, amino acid dosing, I do have some people that like swear by it. I have, you know, some buddies that's absolutely, he would dose like 15 mils a day of AcroPower. And he could mm-hmm. say he can instantly, know, within a week, he'll notice the difference of, in colors in his coral. So I've still been kind of on the fence. I think there's benefit to it, but I don't know if you need tons of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I dose the Brightwell one a couple mils a day on the doser, and then the AB plus just randomly I add it for fun to watch the tank go green. Yeah, green. I know that's the crazy. <laughs> those videos I saw on Facebook and they're pouring in. It's like, all right, I don't know what that is, but it's kind of cool to watch. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Do you know what else is fun? I love feeding the uh, Reef Nutrition oyster eggs. They're like little balls. And when you yeah. dump them in by like the Vortec power head and then your whole tank looks like a snow globe and it's like little right. flow beads. I, I love feeding that stuff because it just goes everywhere. Yeah. Makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me happy. Does make me happy. Let's see. Happy Reef $10 super chat. Whoop whoop. P guy, $5 super chat. Enjoy both of your content. Thanks for the collaboration. Aww. Thanks for hanging out with us. Well, thank you, Devin, for joining me so I don't have to do this all alone. Um, of course. I'm- you Marcus realize I'm going to bribe you on one day, too. <laughs> nope. Sorry, this is a one-way trip. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, Marcus said, I don't... The thing I don't like about my old Apex Classic is that the original app doesn't work with my phone anymore. That's probably Fusion true. Fusion does, though. But Fusion works in a browser. So whatever yep. phone you've got, you if you can open a browser, you should be able to still access your Apex as long as it's connected properly. Um, yep. I'll tell you, I ran the Classic for a long time. And I never ran right. it through Wi-Fi. I always hardwired it with Ethernet. Mm-hmm. So that helped with 90% of any kind of problems people talk about. Like, I can't connect or I can't this. If you're hardwired to your router, then it's just a matter of getting your browser to talk to it. And people at Neptune can help you with that, even with the classic. But at some point, you should upgrade because the newer one really does have some really nice features compared to the original one. 
But can't you still use the classic with fusion? I feel like you can. Like I yeah, think, I think I'm so. pretty sure I had. Yeah. So yeah. You, so it should be fine. Yeah, I think uh, he's just saying he couldn't use the app anymore. The app oh, might no phone. longer talk to the classic, possibly. Mm. I don't know if they did something to deprecate that or not. I don't know. I just remember when I had a classic, I was fairly certain I had Fusion working with it. But that yeah. was been a few years now, so. Uh, Joshua Baker says, has anyone heard of anything about a new temperature controller? Um, I saw Maybe I should some... read Coral Magazine. I don't know. <laughs> I saw something from Bulk Resupply about some new super fancy one, but I haven't read much into it yet. I just remember seeing some email about it. Hmm. It wasn't cheap, though. It was like a couple hundred bucks, but it had some like microprocessor controller, something, something or other. So no reviews Robert, on it yet. Still early. Robert Poorman, thank you very much for the super chat. I don't want to ignore these. I know you, you tackled some of them earlier, too. Mm. I just get to them when I get to them. <laughs> Let's see. Here's a question. Nope, we did answer that one. See, I'm catching up with you, Devin. Oh, ho, ho. Uh, Marcus says, have you ever used a diamond hole saw on acrylic? I've done it a few times. It makes really nice, smooth holes. No, I have not. I've never even considered <laughs> trying it because there's no teeth. So I guess maybe one day I'll have to try it because I do have some. It'd be fun just to see what happens. But I know that a common hole saw works. I have done it forever. Now, Minion just cuts the holes for me with a router bit, and it, it's even easier. It's like, bzzz, and I just have a mm -hmm. perfect hole on every single project I build. So that's super Good nice. Good old Minion. It's a fine companion. Minion is a wonderful machine, and uh, she was having issues too. And Bobby helped me resolve that as well. It was the strangest thing. I mean, I've had this machine now for four years, and I've talked about how finicky she can be, and she'll work fine one day, and then the next she absolutely won't cooperate. And the thing mm -hmm. was, right in the middle of a cut, she would just stop. It would just, uh, just stop. The bit just stops right there, turns itself off. And I'm like, what? And so I'd have to reset. I'd have to lift the bit manually with a, a controller in my hand, set everything to home, go into the software, delete everything that's already been accomplished, and tell it to start over oh. from that point. And I That's couldn't tricky. find any rhyme or reason to when it would fail because it wasn't like as it was making a corner or as it mm -hmm. was going deeper. It was just like going along, just turned off. And I would, a project that should take 45 minutes to cut out would take five, six hours because I had to keep restarting, Oof. reprogramming. And I was That's so painful. frustrated. And I talked with uh, the original owner and he said you should look at the e-stops, which are the emergency stops, and see if maybe one's got a loose wire or if something is mm -hmm. you know, just a little bit off. So I opened up the sides of Minion and I looked and everything looked normal to me. And it's like, that's not it. And I was looking at everything else. I'm looking at the code. I'm thinking, what has changed? Why? I didn't have this problem for years and now it's just been a whole thing. So anyway, um, I told Bobby what was going on and he's so smart. And he said, you know, send me a picture of this metal plate that has all this information about amps and stuff. And I did. And then he said, all right, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you a 30 amp on off switch and a 30 amp power cord and a 30 amp this and a 30 amp that. And we're going to replace the breaker with a 30 amp. And so we went mm -hmm. from the power panel all the way to the inside of the machine. And he mm -hmm. hooked it all up. He did everything. And as he's inside the machine, he's taken off the cover, and that's where all the components are for the computer, where his new wires have to connect, where the old wires are coming off, it's mm -hmm. 30 amps. But all those wires that were on there were 15. He says, why would you have 15 amps coming into a 30 amp receiver? I mean, this is, yeah. this is supposed to be all 30. So he replaced everything, brand new everything, to that point. And now I can turn her on and turn her off. She never messes up. It was all like a lack of power, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. just not enough. It was enough to get going, but it was also just on the cusp of losing the signal or the juice, which would put in emergency mode and shut itself off. So huh. here I've had this machine for four years and we replaced a couple of parts and my life became exponentially nicer. And it was because nice. I have a Bobby. So I'm like, everyone needs a Bobby in their life. So where does one find a Bobby? That's the hard part. I got really lucky. <laughs> I did not go to the Bobby store and find a Bobby. That's just, oh, he was a club member Bobby. and uh, we became friends. It's been incredible. He's on my website nice. too. If you uh, yeah. look under the about, 
he's listed there under tank sitter and he's doing the salt down the arm. Oh, nice. <laughs> Perfect. Because <laughs> salt, you know, yeah, salt water. Your site looks really good. Thank you. I've actually been perusing it a bit earlier. I like it. Yeah, it's coming along nicely. I've, I, like I said, I still find flaws, which drives me crazy. I want everything to be perfect, but that's oh, me. Time. All right, let's see. Uh, yeah, Marcos Reef says, is Mark the other dude? Who is dudes <laughs> in Reef Dudes? I have asked you this for at least three years, and you refuse to answer the question. Tell us. I Tell like us leaving today. it open-ended. Tell us today. I like leaving it open-ended. So Who it's, was it's the a, other dude that you had a huge fight with <laughs> the day you started your channel? <laughs> do, you, do you want the legit justification? Yes! I was actually going to start this channel with a buddy, and we were going to tag team and both do it. Mm -hmm. And then he had, like, kids and everything. He's like, oh, I don't have time to do it, blah, blah, blah. And I already bought the domain name. I was like, okay, whatever. I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to roll with it. And I just kept on doing it, and I just kept the name. But then so there I was joke, no I'm Reef like, Dude domain that was available? <laughs> <laughs> I already bought the other one. I was committed. There's no going back. So it's stuck. But now it's open-ended. What if I have someone, a guest, or come on with me? Or mm -hmm. you can be honorary Reef Dude when you come join my live stream. Who knows? It's open-ended. So I don't know. I That's still want to do, like, some funny, yeah. entertaining video where I, like, clone myself in it. And I don't know. We'll see. So on my to-do list one day. You should do that. That would be fun. And you should yeah. have... And one should be, like, a total jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one's you. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> that way you could play the bad guy for once. You'd enjoy that. Natal asks, <laughs> how long after using Live Rock Enhanced do you see a difference? I would say four weeks. Um, I do know that at first I just put it in the tank, and I was putting it in, like, I guess twice a week for a few weeks, and I just kind of was just doing it in the frag system to see what would happen. And it was a post on Facebook where someone else was using it and said, wow, my tank looks amazing. And I was like, huh. So I got out of my chair and I walked over and I looked at my tank. I was like, oh my God, my tank looks amazing too. The coralline was fantastic. It was beautiful. There was nothing on it. It was just the rock looked so clean. And I was like, wow, it actually does work because I just was oblivious to it. And I was using mm -hmm. my reef as well. And I had parts of the rock you could still see. And so someone came over and he was looking at my tank and I said, I'm using Live Rock Enhance. And he was looking at my rock and he goes, wow, your rock actually does look really clean. Now my corals have gotten so big now you can't even find Live Rock anymore to actually look at it. But uh, when I clean out some of the dead stuff, maybe I'll get a chance to take a peek at some things. But no, the product works really, really well, but it does take about four weeks to notice. Yeah. I've never tried that, but you've talked about it many times that you've piqued my interest yeah. and now I'm tempted. It's neat stuff. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, ba a bacteria that consumes waste. And so yep. you can, and the thing is, you like pouring in those, um, not oyster feast, but um, the the row oyster from Reef eggs. Nutrition, the yeah. eggs. And yeah. when you pour that stuff in, it looks like beads going everywhere. And your fish yeah. can eat it, and it's good for their gut too. So it doesn't even and hurt the, the coral fish. too. And the corals and the coral. can snack on it, and it blows around everywhere. And then it, it's just gonna your tank gets cloudy for a couple hours. So you don't use Live Rock Enhance before you do a stream, unless you have a background video that you can use instead, because your tank will look a little opaque. But after about three, four hours, it goes back to normal again, and it looks good. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's a good way to do it. You know, I probably would try in front of my tank, but it's like on the, in, in the middle of the house on the way to the kitchen, and people be walking by constantly, and yeah, it'd be too much distraction. Yeah. This way it's safer. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Plus, you yeah. can completely control which fish show up on your video. No, well, not that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> this this like blurry patch comes across the screen. That was, that guy censored. Can't see him. I don't want you guys to see Spock's eye. Let me block it. <laughs> yeah. My speaking of eyes, my um cell phone has like something funky on his one eye, which mm -hmm. kind of comes and goes, and I got to figure out what to do that one day. Well, you got to talk to Humblefish. I have. He is the <laughs> wizard when it comes to fish disease. I know nothing. Yeah. He, Jeff he gave K me some stuff. says. What would you recommend for a downstairs mixing station from a basement to the floor above for water delivery and drain? And should I use schedule 40 or 80? You could definitely use schedule 40. Um, that's not want. a problem. And the larger the pipe, the less resistance to push water up. But I wouldn't say, you know, use a three inch pipe, that's crazy. But you know, if you have a pump that's pushing up water and you want to use an inch and a half pipe going vertical, that there's nothing wrong with that. I actually use inch and a half pipe on my M2 to go up seven feet into the top of the frag. The uh, I think it's saltwater mixing vat. Isn't it like inch and a quarter or something like that? I just made it bigger. I went larger. Okay, so <laughs> generally use 
in general, use whatever the largest size that's like built into your pump. Like that's kind of the easier way with it. Because again, yeah, you get more, you smaller pipe, you'll get more pressure, but mm -hmm. a larger pipe, you'll get more volume. Right. So. so if you can go up a little bit larger than whatever it is on the thread of the, the pump, that'd be great. Like you said, the mm -hmm. M2 might be inch and a quarter, so I went inch and a half. I feel like it is. Yeah. I went up. And uh, I, I know in the old days, people would like, they'd get a mag pump and it'd be three quarter thread. So you put three quarter pipe and then they complain the pump doesn't work or the pump's running too hot. And like, it's because you didn't read the instructions. The instructions say to double the thread size. So with a three quarter mm -hmm. inch thread, you should be inch and a half pipe. And no one did it but me because I read the manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you definitely want to be large enough because you're pushing upstairs. And uh, mm -hmm. you can always reduce it down to something smaller as it's entering the tank or the sump or however you're doing that. But yeah, having a little bit larger is smart. It doesn't have to be hugely large because if you go too large, then you're creating a lot of resistance and it becomes a whole other thing you're trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. yep, and Devin, exactly. you have a basement. So are you doing any basement to upstairs stuff? What did you use? Just for my mixing bins and down there. So if my okay, auto so water change comes out from below. Yeah, but you're using dose tank. pumps with quarter inch tubing or something, right? Yeah, so I have the the PMUP, which is for my ATO, mm -hmm. and then I have the Versas for the auto water change. So, but yeah, yeah, I have no problem going up the floor in a bit. So, all is good there for my tiny quarter inch lines. Uh, Jim says I have some live rock that was from a tank that was retired many years ago. It's been covered in covered buckets in salt water, but not circulating. Half the rock is dry now. Should I toss it or keep it? I'd like to use it again. I would put it in some salt water and I'd get some flow on it and I would just kind of let it ferment for three months or so and see what comes of it. You know, you don't have to put lights over it or anything like that. Just for now, circulation, maybe some water changes once a month and then test the water and see what kind of results you get. Anything, the, the thing is about rock. The outside can be dry, but the inside, if you were to bust it in half, there's a wet spot and there's bacteria in there. And usually when we take that dry rock that's been in the backyard for 10 months and you put it in your tank, your tank has all these horrible issues. And you're like, what is happening? It's because whatever vile thing was still alive deep down in that rock, it has been released into the water column. So by putting it in a barrel of salt water, doing some water changes, whatever that was, mm -hmm. it's wet again. It's had a chance to get out. You've done water changes or you ran a skimmer on that barrel or something and you can kind mm -hmm. of just make it nice and clean. In three to four months, you can use that rock in your tank and you'll be happy. And it didn't cost you anything. Yep. Um, no, I, I agree. I would give it a big water change because the water in there is probably funky. It probably does have its own good bacteria on it. Um, so yeah, big water change. I'd add a heater and some flow. And I mean, it wouldn't hurt to dump in some bottle bacteria, but you probably already have bacteria in there, but you need to feed that bacteria. Yeah. So I would feed it an ammonia source, like even just like I always have just bought pure ammonia from like a hardware store for cleaning or something, make sure there's no additives, but just add, you know, a few mils of that every few weeks or so. But you basically want to rebuild up that population of bacteria so that it can be used again in a tank. You can even use that live rock enhance for that there exact purpose. It says it right on the jar, <laughs> which I didn't even think of at first. Cause yeah, I've, there you go. I've always had rock left over from tanks. At this point, I have none, everything is in a tank, but if I redo the frag system, now I'm gonna have some new rock and I like to have it in a barrel of a circulation in the corner for years. And when I need a rock, I just reach in and grab it and it's ready to go. And usually has some yellow sponge on it or something, but that's about it. There's no Aptasia, there's no Mahanos, there's nothing because I never feed the barrel. It's just like mm -hmm. that level of bacteria that's in there, it doesn't drop off, it doesn't grow. It's just a fixed amount because it's hit, it's hit equilibrium. But if you're trying to grow something on it, you're gonna have to throw yeah. in bacteria and throw some food, like you said, or in your case, you're uh, Devin was talking about mm -hmm. adding ammonia and stuff to kind of move things along and increase it. You could go crazy and add prodibio or something. But that that's more if you plan on starting up a tank from it, is mm -hmm. to build up a strong because there will be a bacteria on it, but it's probably like a weak bacteria, right? Because it's not really eating; it's just kind of like this like stasis of life on it. Where yeah. if you plan on adding a bunch of fish, you want to basically pre-cycle it in a way and build up that bacteria that way you can add a couple of fish and it's not going to have any impact so that's the whole point of doing ammonia is like adding a fake fish in there to feed the bacteria and let it build its numbers i want to quote you on that someday add a fake fish to your tank aka <laughs> ammonia well that. it's <laughs> that's great you're going to see people's little remote control ones is it cycling <laughs> driving around <laughs> is your fake fish dead or alive Dun, dun, dun. with 
I want to measure my CO2 in the house now. So what did you use, Devin? Did you build some DIY thing, or is this something I can just get from Amazon and stick on the wall, or what is it? You can you can buy it. One second. Okay. In the meantime, while he's gone, thank you very much for the super chat, Pappy. That was very nice of you. And P Guy also gave us a super chat. Thank you so much. Sweet. And I'm thinking all the super chats while you were gone for a second. And Kyle, thank you for the super chat. So you have a little CO2 meter. What did it cost? Where'd I you do. get it? Uh, off Amazon, it was like 100 bucks ish. And it's plugged into a PS5 controller? <laughs> yes. No, this one is, well, it has a U2, so I just, ah, USB cord, so I was just stealing it. But you plug it in for power, and it takes a minute to initialize, but then tells you the PPM of CO2 in your house. Okay. So, bloop, let's plug it in. You have from Amazon, you said? Maybe I should just buy one today. Yeah, they're, they're super handy, right? And it's five I'm pretty... in your house? Oh, my God. No, no, no it's not. It's, it's... Four. Give it, thing. Give it a second. <laughs> ah, it's initiating. It's a countdown. Three. Oh, it's a countdown. Two. <laughs> You're one. about to die. <laughs> you have zero CO2. That, that, that's, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> no, out, outside is three to 400. Okay. So we'll see. That's what that one person put in here that I was reading as I was scrolling through the comments. Yeah. <laughs> it says hi, probably because I was sitting here streaming with the door closed. Because you're smoke, breathing. That's crazy high. What does yeah. it say? You don't want to know. I'm going to die. Yes, I do. <laughs> What's it say? 2,900. <laughs> wow. You need to kick the dog out of the room before you die. <laughs> no, it's just me. This is how much we've been talking with the door closed in this little room. I actually opened the window about 10 minutes ago, so it'll probably drop soon. <laughs> I bet I, I have way needs. better nervous than you do. I don't know. We yeah, have better no, air in the U.S. than you do in Canada. <laughs> I don't believe you. Um, seven. Yeah, it's usually 700 to 900 on average in the house, right. I'd say. Let yeah. me put it by the window for a minute. It's <laughs> You're freaking out. <laughs> I was like peeping at me. It's like, hi, warning. My oh. head. I feel so lightheaded. I think I'm sleepy. <laughs> I know. It's passed out in the middle of the stream. Just like... <laughs> the fish in the back are just lying down in the video. All right, so yeah. um, 1988 said, how do you like your Neptune skylights so far? I actually do like them a lot. Uh, they are in the blue mode a lot of the day because of the way I programmed it, and I need to mess with it. I, su I switched it to uh, 10K lighting for this webcam just because I can actually just change it on a dime. We can change it and make it hideous for you guys mm -hmm. if you want. Let me see, I'll change this. Way to sell off. it. Turn this on. So now, see, it's blue. It's pointless. You can't see anything. That's why I had it off. <laughs> why? Go get, like, a little filter and just put it on top of your web camera. I bet you that'll work. If I put the filter on the webcam, then I'll look the wrong color. Well, so. you'll just have a tan. You'll be fine. I'll have a tan. <laughs> Actually, let me grab my little clip here. I'll yeah, try it'll just work. Just for funsies. Let's see what it'll it totally does. work. Okay, so we'll do this. Okay, that didn't help. Let's try the, the orange. Yeah, that one was yellow. See, look at how red I am. Oh, my goodness. So you you have a sunburn, but it's fine. <laughs> a major sunburn, but yeah, so that's a... Uh, but you can see the tank. Good. Yeah, you can see the tank. Yeah. yeah just but it's like still out of focus because this webcam move. just can't handle it. So anyway, yeah, um, it's just pointless to have blue lights on a tank when you're streaming on a Logitech webcam. So we'll switch yeah. this okay, back. Okay, so I, I opened the window, and I set the yeah. CO2 meter on it, and on yeah. my window cell, it is... 366 ppm so that's with the fresh air flowing by it so 366 my... but in your room you're at 2200 <laughs> well it, it might be lower now i opened the window it's been ridiculous because we've been talking for three hours in my office i don't know your purple tang big. looks a little sick now to me yeah okay let's <laughs> see what video. it says now that i moved it in in my video that's what i'm saying the purple tang in your video ago. is looking sick now <laughs> yeah it's like co2 <laughs> Oh, 365. I don't know. I'm going to leave it on my desk for a few minutes. We'll see what it is with the window open. But opening a window makes like a huge difference. Like it's crazy how I don't like your that open stuff out there. I, matter of fact, if you open a door or window, that's how insects get in the house. I don't like that part. So I Free just close the food. door. <laughs> Man, when I find a June bug in my reef tank, I am not happy. These things are little beetles. Spock, you look at that Spock crunch. Oh. I know, right? <laughs> yep. 
Well, it's now four oh eight, so it's getting better now. See, so literally opening hey, the window for like a minute. Hey, Kyle, minutes. I want to thank you for that sketchy even number you gave me in that super chat. That was awesome. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to miss that. That was really funny. I had I was waiting to share that. All right, let's see. It's awesome. Um. Oh, 472. Yeah, that's not too bad yet. Jeff K says, is it critical where in the wall the PVC is in relation to the tank? Up high or lower to the floor? Um, oh, you're talking about pumping from downstairs to upstairs? No, it's not really going to matter where you have it. Um, it really comes down to how you want to connect it all together. If you're trying to run a pipe upstairs, you're probably going to put a valve on the top and maybe some kind of flexible hose or maybe rigid pipe that comes down into your sump. So whatever makes it clean and easy to work, just remember if things go haywire and you forget to turn a valve or something, it could siphon that water out. So if it was me and I was coming up the wall behind the tank and then going in and over the edge of the sump, I'd probably just go over the edge and let it gush into the sump with the noise, knowing it's filling my sump. And maybe you're remotely using something on your phone to turn the pump on and off or whatever, but when you turn the pump off, it would probably reverse siphon just the water out of the pipe back down into the barrel below. You don't need a check valve to keep water in the pipe. You don't want water sitting in that pipe. You want it to be empty until it's time to refill. Mm -hmm. But we definitely don't want to accidentally some, suck some of your dirty tank water with clean water back into your barrel of clean water and ruining it. True that. Uh, Christian Kroll says, are you going to watch the new documentary, The Dark Hobby? I've not heard of it, so I don't know if I have an answer for you. But yeah, uh, I, I know today. several people have told me to watch The Octopus Teacher. And I haven't seen that, that yet. Cool. It's on my list watch of things that. I want to see. And then Disney had this crazy video. I think it was called Dolphin Reef. And I started mm -hmm. it. And the water was so perfect that I thought, this is some CGI movie. Is There's no way any water looks like this on any part of the planet. I mean, there wasn't an air bubble in it. It was just perfect. I told my friend, I said, can you like look at this documentary and see it? And, oh yeah, that's real. And I'm thinking, eh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I gotta watch it again. I only got in about 20 minutes in, but I was just so taken aback by the perfection that they had. I mean, it was like glycerin. <laughs> there, there was just no, no surf, just pure pristine water, pristine corals. I felt like it was all CGI. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I'd like to know if it's real or not. Of course, that was one of the things Caitlin would always do for me. She would Google mm -hmm. and get me an answer to any question under the sun. She was the queen of Google, and she was like, hang on, and she's like, yep, or no. And she had an answer, and she could explain why. And she was really good about that, and it's something that I am trying to work on more myself. i got to up your Google skills. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I Google when I have to, but I don't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I Google and I have to. Yeah, I don't yep. want to. I don't want to just live in Google. Let's see. Marcus Reef. I know Mark didn't get rid of the halides. Are the halides gone? Are you all LED now? Well, the tank behind me is all LEDs. Really? No more and halides. And the big uh, step. metal halides are in the back room as a backup. <laughs> <laughs> just in case. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. Why would I throw them away? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they take up a lot of space, so I don't know. It's true. Uh, uh, I'll tell you this. Just... My light rack lost 70 pounds of weight on it when I took down Ooh, all those just... pendants and, and electronic ballasts. I believe it. Is your yeah. house a little cooler now without all those halides? Baking okay, so place? that's an interesting question. And actually, I've been, in, I've been living in Fusion, looking at graphs, trying to understand how it all works. And I'm looking at how much power consumption I'm using and how much I'm not using and how often my heaters are on and how long my heaters are on now. Because we all know mm -hmm. the rule, if you get rid of the metal halides that added heat to your tank and you're using LEDs that add no heat to your tank, then your heaters have to run longer to make up for the lack of heat because a watt is a watt is a watt. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm running LED lighting over my reef. My tank is literally a solid degree lower than it used to be. My yeah. swing per day, my low to my high per day is 1.1 degrees every day now, which is pretty tight. That's pretty good. That is and pretty tight. And my heaters seem to be on roughly four to five hours a day out of 24. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because I keep my house at 71 because that's comfortable for me. And anything yeah. warmer and I get uncomfortable and I'm sweating, I'm like, ah. And so I lower the temperature in the house. Like right now, the thermostat is set to 68 for the live stream because I want to be comfortable mm -hmm. during the stream. I got lights hitting me and you know, I just, I'm thinking yeah. on my feet and I sweat. So I like to be as cool as I possibly can be. 
Got to keep her cool, buddy. So much nicer since you open the window with the breeze. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That'll be weird. And yeah, like I said, right now it's 88 outside. I'm not opening any windows. You guys are crazy. Wow. Um, Jim says, nice. I've got live. Oh, this is the same question about the live rock covered for years and half the water evaporated. So the rock got dry. Yeah, you can still use it. You just got to get it back yeah. in salt water again. Like I talked about everything I said before still applies. So you're good, Jim. You should use your rock. Just let it ferment for a few months in a barrel with some good salt water. Change the water once a month in that barrel. And like I said, I would throw in some live rock and hands in there. I'm going to try that one day. I can ship you one. Maybe I'll take you up on that. Hmm? I, have to go, I have to go peruse your new store now. <laughs> You're like, what else can I get? Exactly. What else you got? <laughs> I'm still scrolling. I'm trying to find the last question. That's how the stream usually ends, Devin. And see, that as long as they keep typing, the stream never ends. That's just, it's so much <laughs> nicer than a scheduled ending. That's very weird. <laughs> Pop Reef, what got you curious about reef tanks from the very beginning? He must be talking to you. No, both of us. D dual tags. Dual Dang it. Tags. All right. Well, I, um, I. My dad had saltwater tanks when I was a kid, and he had a, a hex tank in the living room that had an octopus and a clownfish and an anemone and uh, I can't remember what, uh, three spotted damselfish. Uh, that was about it. And then he had a predator tank in his bedroom that had a panther grouper and it had a lionfish and it had, I think, like a long-nosed butterfly or something that couldn't get in the mouth of either one of those fish. And that mm -hmm. was um, his two tanks and, you know, it was fine. But when he took me to the fish store with him one day, I learned that you could put in as many invertebrates in a tank as you wanted. There was no rule of how much you could have in there. So you could mm -hmm. literally fill a 20 gallon tank with like 2000 hermit crabs and have the best day ever. Where if you want to fish, you're only allowed one inch of fish per gallon. And I did not like to being told I can only have so much of anything. So I set up an invertebrate tank and I filled it with coral banded shrimp, hermit crabs, cleaner shrimp. I mean, anything mm -hmm. that, was, that had legs, I got it and threw it in there. And they crawled all over the place and had the best time. And then, <laughs> it wasn't long after that, I got to go on a trip to Tahiti. And I went to the island of Morea, which is a lagoon. It has a lagoon wrapped around this island. And then there's rock after the lagoon, and then it's ocean where the, the sharks are. And I was in that mm -hmm. lagoon every single day for, I think, five days snorkeling. Nice. And I remember nice. one day specifically, as I was just snorkeling along, I followed a lionfish for 45 minutes. He just drifted <laughs> along, and I just followed him, like his shadow, nice. and wanted to see what he was doing. Because, you know, in my dad's tank, I had to hold the net to keep the lionfish away from my dad's hand while he cleaned the glass. And if I messed up and the lionfish got past the net, I got yelled at. So mm -hmm. seeing this lionfish in the ocean in a lagoon was amazing to me, and I enjoyed seeing that. But... And I've told but. the story before. But the people on the island had no idea what's out there. They, they did not appreciate what surrounded them. So I grabbed a one liter bottle, which was just these clear water bottles they had. They didn't even have labels on it, or maybe they didn't, I peeled it off. So I had this clear bottle, and I cut open the, t the side of it so it was like, a, like an aquarium, and I grabbed some of their gravel from the lagoon, and I grabbed some mm -hmm. hermit crabs, and I put in probably a couple of plants or something in there. And I just walk around and tell people, did you know this stuff was in there? In that lagoon that you're not even looking at? They're, it's <laughs> full of life. And they're just like, wow, that's really neat. They were being nice to the little kid, you know, 11 years old or whatever, that's going gaga over this fake aquarium I'm carrying around, showing people what they're missing while they're sitting there drinking their drinks and enjoying Club Med. So <laughs> I, uh, that was my indoctrination in critters and invertebrates and stuff mm -hmm. not the fish store the fish store was more like you got to hear a horror story about how a guy got stung by the lionfish and his hand became five times its normal size or or we're here to buy goldfish to feed the anemone and the octopus you know that kind of thing that i didn't gain anything mm -hmm. from that and uh so that's where it all started and then later on in life when i got divorced i walked out of the, the, the courthouse with my papers in my hand and went straight to a fish store and bought an aquarium and that's how <laughs> i got started what about you, Devin? Yeah. Uh, for the salt side, so I was into like freshwater prior, and then I got pretty deep and hardcore into the whole planted tank thing for a number of years. And then I was breeding those little like fancy crystal shrimp, and then I got into like high tech planted tanks where I'm like injecting CO2, and I didn't even know about dosers or any dosers were a thing at the time, but I built my own doser. 
huh. using little cool. dosing pumps and Arduino. <laughs> so I built my own. Yeah. And then so I was doing that to dose fertilizers to the tank. And then it was like a ton of work because I was literally pulling out like a five gallon bucket of plants every week because it grew too well now after mm -hmm. fertilizers and T5 HOs and fresh water and all this jazz. And then eventually I, I kind of like reef tanks and I always looked at them and I was like, yeah, how hard can it be? So then I converted one of my planted tanks over to a saltwater tank. And then I just started neglecting the planted tanks and giving all my attention to saltwater tanks. And eventually they all turned into salt. So that's kind of my, the short version of it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I hope that got your answer to you. Jim WN says, I'm transferring a fish from quarantine that been treating with copper. A pinch of the sand from the quarantine tank fell into the display tank. Uh, when I drop the fish in with a net, is that going to be a problem? No, that little tiny speck of a crumb will not hurt your tank, but it'd be best to not do that twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Let's see, I'm looking for the next one. Um, Kevin says, I own a 150 gallon a day BRS seven stage RODI system. When should I change the sediment filter? You can change that as frequently as you want. Uh, minimum is every six months. But if for some reason it were to turn brown or rusty after a mere weeks, so you could change it monthly. The sediment filter right. is literally the very first filter. It's typically a five micron or something along those lines, 10 micron, and it's trapping sediment. So it will be the ugliest one first. And as it clogs up, everything after that is starved. So you just change it as needed. Uh, for me, uh, my water, city water, my water's not bad. My filter never, and barely changes to tan colored. And I can go six months and I change that and the carbons at the same time. Sediment nice. filters are like $5. So they're, they don't even hurt when you have to change them. It's like, all right, whatever. Fish food yeah, costs they're, more. They're cheap and easy. Now, if you want the technical side, if you have a pressure gauge on your RODI, whenever it starts to drop, right? Because if it's dropping, it generally means your filter is getting clogged and yeah. you start, yeah, like you said, you're starting it out. So I have a little PSI gauge on mine and I know roughly where it is. And when I just start to see it fall, I'm like, okay, time for new filters. Yeah. But I've seen people that would like take one out that is chocolate rust. I mean, oh, it yeah, is it's like nasty. insane. And then, you know, the carbons are pretty bad too. And I'm like, how did you wait this long? I mean, how? I can't even understand that mentality. It just blows me away. And like, well, it happened really quick. I'm like, well, I'm sure it did, but it got worse <laughs> every day thereafter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, if you're in an area where you have like really bad water, maybe it's well water, or there's a lot of rust in the pipes or whatever in your home, and you have to change your sediment filter monthly, or I don't know, <laughs> I've never heard of anyone having to change like every two weeks. But mm -hmm. if you're in a situation where it's turning brown rapidly, you just change it. And maybe yeah. it's just initially, maybe there was something going on in your neighborhood that time and it totally flooded your first filter. It caught it all and you just left it there for six months. And now any ones you put on there, they stay white. You know, it could just be mm -hmm. a, a thing that happened from a storm or they worked on the sewer or in the, the city pipes or, you know, they flushed something through or whatever, broke something loose. Or they had foundation work done on your home. I don't know. But uh, those filters should be white all the time. They should never turn hideous and you know yeah, yeah using a gauge would be a good way but I, visually i would just immediately change it if that was a thing but i have also had times where it didn't look that nasty and i still lost pressure so mm. it, I, it i guess it depends what's clogging and there's certain times of the year where i feel like i'm going through them every few weeks then other times i don't touch it for six months right so yeah. it just depends if you've got like runoff in your area or there's something that's affecting it Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. i agree with you let's see um tom says i tried let's see i've been wanting to join the club for a long time i know you've been busy so i've been excited to join and learn more from club Milo's reef yes club Milo's reef has been kind of on autopilot the moderators have been running it for me while i kind of did nothing i mean i've shared a few things in there and there are about 100 people right now waiting to be added i will see about getting you guys added tomorrow and that way you don't have to wait any longer it is me that approves people i actually go through each person's individual persona to kind of get an idea if they are a good fit. I know that sounds really specific, but uh, actually I just try to make sure they're not like a brand new account. Um, I like to see mm -hmm. if they've had some history with Facebook. Um, I like to see if they have an aquarium and it's not like some model that wants to join us so she can sell us Ray-Ban glasses or something <laughs> random like that. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, for the most part, 
that's not been a problem, but still I do like to look and approve before anything happens. And so my moderators all know just leave it alone until I get to it. Yeah. Da, da, da. All right, scrolling down, Devin, I'm trying to get to the bottom. It's all good, just quickly telling someone I can't answer that call. <laughs> Your job is like, we're not paying you if you don't show up. Dun, dun, dun. There you go. <laughs> I missed a call to my room now, so. So I'm like, I'm live. <laughs> mm, would you both Sometimes I have construction in New York. I have to change my filter monthly. Yeah, I definitely believe it. There's so many things around it can impact it, so. That's why I like to go off pressure. Or if it looks nasty, then let's do. Filters are cheap. Uh, Big Puff Bubbles says, uh, what would you recommend for someone? You know, I, base, I think your question is, how big a tank can I have? Or how you know can I go really big? You can do what you can afford. <laughs> um, I, when you say really big, I don't know if really big to you is 120 gallons. Or if really big is 20,000 gallons. You know, because is it something where you have to wear a wetsuit to get in and plant the corals? Yes. Or are you just talking about something you'll stand on a ladder and lean in and put a few frags in your tank? So it comes mm -hmm. down to what is ideal for you. I came across a really cool opportunity, but I had nowhere for it. It was an acrylic round aquarium. It was a circle and it was mm -hmm. six feet across. And nice. I think it was 30 inches tall or 24 inches tall. And I kept looking at my living room like, what if that was the middle of the living room and you just walked around it and just enjoyed the reef from above every single minute of your life? And I mean, it, the price was really good. They just wanted it gone. I had no idea how to hook a filtration to it. I mean, there was just it was just a circle that could hold water. And I was like, wow. And that was okay. considered a really big tank. I don't even know what the gallons were because it's a round circle. And I only know math for rectangles and squares. <laughs> you need one of those like 70s circular like moon couches, like two of them all around it. Yeah. And yeah. then that in the middle. And you can just hang yeah. out with your center and tank. And a basement. So I get a filtration underneath. Well, get the Jack Pammer people over and you put your sump <laughs> under your floor. I want a deeper <laughs> hole than three feet this time. Yeah, just tell me you need a deeper hole so you can hide your sump underneath. You'll be good. Yeah. A, a couple Christian tiles Corals, like lift up in the floor. <laughs> Christian Corals asks, what's your favorite coral and why? Um, I love a living coral more than a dead one because the living one will continue to grow and get bigger and prettier. Uh, specifically, you know, I've got a few that I lean toward. I really like acans, um, and I don't do well with them. <laughs> But uh, I've got a few little frags over there that are dying because my fungias keep touching them every day and I don't get my arm wet to move the fungia back where it belongs and it's my fault. So <laughs> Devin can grow a whole group and it's amazing. Um, no, they haven't been doing as well. You've, I've seen some of the stuff you've shown in the past and they were so pretty. I just, I don't know. I, I think I need an A-can tank rather than a full-blown <laughs> mixed reef. That way I can focus on them and feed the heck out of them and turn them into something awesome. Or maybe just like yeah. create a really cool section in the frag tank where I have all these AKs mm -hmm. just doing their thing. That would be cool. nice. And again, it wouldn't look like a frag tank. Yeah, they're pretty when they're all fluffy and in their glory. Uh, Intercontinental Cruiser says, I have heard re comments that opening windows in the spring can cause a cyano outbreak. I've never heard that before. And I don't know that fresh air will cause cyano to bloom, but... The People do get yeah. cyano blooms in spring, windows open or windows closed. So that's yeah, an interesting one. I've never heard that. There's, pro there's probably some seasonal aspect to it, but honestly, other than like pollen in the air, it's the only correlation I could even come up with that would be mm -hmm. half relevant. But my frag tank is right beside, like two feet away from my window and there's no cyano in it. So I don't think it's a, a big problem. Sherry asks, any recommendations or suggestions for raising calcium when the alkalinity is good and magnesium is good? Yeah, dose calcium. I, yeah, directly. That's it. Just mix up a batch of calcium uh, chloride, hook it up to a dosing pump, put in the right amount every day, get to the number you need to be, back off on that dosing so you don't overdose and go too high. You don't want to suddenly be at 500 when you're currently at uh, 290. We want to get it back up to the healthy range of between 375 and 450. So uh, you can use the reef chemistry calculator. Just type that into Google, reef chemistry calculator, and click it. And it will take you there, and then you will put in your gallons 
Uh, you will put in what your calcium level is now, what your calcium level you desire, and what product you're going to use, which could be a DIY calcium chloride mix. And it will then tell you you need 37 teaspoons or whatever it is says you need. And you just do what it says and you put that in over a period of days. You don't do it all in the same day. You kind of let it, you know, like let's say, you oh, let's just use an easy number. Like let's say it said you needed 100 milliliters of calcium chloride, which is a liquid mixture. Then instead of putting in 100 today, maybe put in 10 for the next 10 days and measure your calcium and see where you're at. And once you get to that point where it belongs, it tends to stay, which is the really nice thing about calcium. Calcium kind of goes there and stays there forever. Alkalinity goes up and down. Magnesium tends to stay up for a super long time and then kind of collapses. But calcium is kind of forever. So if you're down now, I would just get it up where it needs to be over like a one or two week period. And then you won't have to think about it much. But if it gets down again, you still have calcium chloride. You can dose a little bit more. There you go. The other one fun thing I did, I got some like the one or two gallon like water jugs and I mixed them all up. So when I need some, I'm just going bloop, bloop, bloop. I can just fill it up and dump it in. Yeah, just to put in what you need. Yeah. No, but like, I have these on my little cube shelf. So I'm like, ooh, whatever, whatever I need. Yeah. So I got all the main ones mixed up just for the odd top off, because I don't dose anymore, right? The calcium That's cool. Just for the odd tweak. Works yeah. Well. No, I like that. Nice and clean. You always find the prettiest bottles at Target. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was from Walmart, that one, actually. But yeah, um, like, to whatever, yeah. just find this water dispenser. Super duper easy. On tap when you need it. Big puff bubbles is determined to have a big tank. 5,000 to 10,000 gallons. And where That's can I tank. source the materials? Well, what do you want? Do you want a concrete tank with a glass window in the front? Are you wanting a plywood tank? Are you wanting a tank made of glass with silicone? I mean, that's huge. Normally, giant tanks like this are gonna be concrete with an acrylic window. That's almost yeah. always what I've seen. Um, the 20,000 gallon reef is, um, I think it's, 60 gallons long, uh, 60 feet long, and I think it's 14 feet front to back, and I believe it's 11 feet tall. So you're asking for half of that, so you're looking at a tank that's about 30 feet long by 14 feet front to back, and you'll need to wear a wetsuit to work in it. There are a couple of people that are running big tanks like that in their homes because they're mm -hmm. super wealthy. Um, Bill yep. Wan is one of them. Um, there's a guy over in the UK who I've seen YouTube videos of. You could find these guys on YouTube and check out their systems mm -hmm. and look at their equipment and start comp the compiling what it's going to cost you. It's going to add lots, up. Yeah. Lots. The D&D &D guy, I'm blanking on his name, but he has oh, an amazing uh, giant LG David board. Saxby. Yeah, his is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got Andrew's, some really large tanks out there, but yeah. they are not cheap to run. And they, there's that guy, Andrew Sandler in Sandler. Long Island. His is cool. Yeah. And he's got this huge, beautiful tank in his house. And then... His insane basement is like a power plant unto itself. I have, a, I mean, he lives in this mansion. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I've only seen mm -hmm. pictures and I just, just from what I've seen, like a picture of the garden from the back door and you see all the balusters and everything. You're like, oh, yeah. it's like what you think the queen would have, right? And <laughs> in his basement, he's got like these giant metal things that I think are generators and He's got these sand filters and he, all this massive gear. And he's got a whole like laboratory just for quarantine. And he, okay, he was offering mm -hmm. to hire someone to work full time to take care of his fish, take care of his tank, handle all the fish disease. You know, I mean, literally that's their job. And yeah. I was curious what that was paying. And I believe it was $100,000 a year to take care of his tank. And Dang. I was like, do you in. get to live at that house or do you have to pay some of that money to live somewhere else? Because I feel like you have to be on site since you're taking care of everything. But well, so, I mean, that's just I a guy a with a big house, tank and a I'd lot of in. money. <laughs> so if you're looking at a big tank, you're going to need someone that can help you full time. I'll tell yep. you, a big tank, like a thousand gallons, five thousand gallons, ten thousand gallons. It's a ton of effort. And I have mm -hmm. a 400 gallon tank here behind me with a 60 gallon cube and it's a lot more work than my 280 was. It's way more work than my 29 gallon was. My 29 gallon was autopilot. It was pretty, it made tank of the month, you know, no big deal. But mm -hmm. this one's a lot more work and when things go wrong, it costs a lot more to fix it. The bigger your mm -hmm. tank, the more it costs to fix things. So, you know, yeah. it's fun to dream about big stuff, but when it comes down to actually breaking out the calculator and seeing how much money you have to spend, that might well, dictate what size will fit in your environment and in your home or your backyard or whatever you're going to do. Yeah, you're probably a couple hundred bucks in salt every water change, like, you know, all your yeah. expenses scale up. So, but if you got the cash, I mean, it'd be pretty sweet. 
You know, it's funny you said time. that, Devin. And I remember <laughs> I remember on one video I was figuring out how much it cost me in salt for a water change. Yeah. Just the salt. Not even making the water. And I think I was mm. spending forty five dollars in salt. Which yeah. you know, you always hear water change is the cheapest solution. I'm like, well wait, that was forty five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> on a small tank on a for small one tank. water change on this size tank you know so yeah anyway it adds yeah up. it all adds up <laughs> this isn't uh, a cheap hobby we all know that <laughs> uh vicky has one of our final questions a few of my fish are showing signs of a bacterial infection any reef safe meds i could get in the uk the tank is a reef for 350. uh vicky i would suggest you go to humble.fish and hit enter and mm -hmm. get some help from him and he's got a whole forum and he answers everything and he's going to tell you yep. take the fish out of the tank and put him in a quarantine put him in a hospital tank and treat him mm -hmm. there there's nothing we put in our tanks that specifically handles fish disease and people that are safe. throwing things in there yeah they just throw things in there and hope it works out or, or they raise the temperature or they fed more heavily or whatever they're kind of just living in a dream world of it's okay and you know mm -hmm. that stuff may even uh, go into recession for a while and then it appears later when the next crisis happens in the tank when the alkalinity plummets or the tank gets too warm or the oxygen drops because of a power outage and then all of a sudden the fish are suddenly crazily sick and you're like well what happened they were healthy when really they just had an immunity for it and they kind of resisted but to actually mm -hmm. get your fish where they're bulletproof you've got to follow humble.fish's website and that's i know it's the weirdest link humble period fish and hit enter on your keyboard. It's cool, it takes though. You there. I mean, good for him. I know, it's like, but it's like you wouldn't think it would work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you type in dot fish, enter, and boom, you're on a website. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs> We've lost, um, I think, seven people, Devin, so I think we should stop. <laughs> yeah, We're only rough. down to 186 people that are still tuned in. Or maybe these rough. are new people, and the other ones already abandoned us a long time ago because mm. they couldn't stand it. But we do appreciate that you came to join us on our live stream today. Um, I think it went well. We talked way too long. We've been at this now for three hours and 45 minutes. I know Devin thought this would be a quick one hour thing, but he forgot I'm Milev and this is what I do. I but, expected uh, two hours. We, we doubled that. <laughs> well, I had to make up. I mean, when you think about it, I haven't done it in 12 weeks. So really 12 weeks times two hours. Yeah, you're right, 24 hour live stream. Tell your I wife know. to get the coffee going because we are <laughs> going to be here a while, people. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Yeah. Please, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to remind you, I always do this at the end of the stream. Please do test your water today. Don't just say it's fine. Grab your kits. Use your kits. Verify. If your stuff's automated, that's great. Still grab your kits and verify <laughs> the automation to make sure that those things are telling you the truth because things do get out of whack from time to time. And the only other way to find out how they're doing is if your corals start dying. And as Caitlin always said, water tests save lives. So we do our water tests on Saturdays, we share our results in Club Meals Reef, <laughs> or we have uh, Devin's awesome little <laughs> graph right there. I mean, that's fine, that's fine. Whatever you're doing, at least you're looking yeah. at it. Some people don't even mm -hmm. check. They, they say, I haven't tested in nine months, everything's fine. It's like, oh, okay, that's good. But that won't be forever. Things will go wrong at some point. And if you know about it, you can handle it before it gets too big and too expensive to resolve. Thank you so sure. much for tuning in. Devin, thanks for coming on the stream this week. We'll see you again thanks next week, me. right? <laughs> Maybe. You never know. Oh, you're going to see you, Mark on my live stream one of these days. You're going to turn me overheads. down for like the next six months after this four-hour debacle that we had today. Now like, nope, good. never again. <laughs> nah, it was good. It was fun. Thank you for having me. No, it was fun. And thank you for coming on. That helped. That made it easier for me. I appreciate that. Yeah, so, anytime. Um, we will definitely I'll come visit you on your stream as well because it's fun <laughs> and we'll have a good official topic that way you can stay on topic and end on time because you guys oh. are so structured on reef dudes <laughs> eh, not always <laughs> all right guys I have just a good feel day bad for who i bring on <laughs> sounds good <laughs> thanks guys bye bye <laughs>